This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 30. Sir William stayed only a week at Hunsford, but his visit was long enough to convince him of his daughter's being most comfortably settled, and of her possessing such a husband and such a neighbour as were not often met with. While Sir William was with them, Mr. Collins devoted his morning to driving him out in his gig and showing him the country, but when he went away the whole family returned to their usual employments, and Elizabeth was thankful to find that they did not see more of her cousin by the alteration, for the chief of the time between breakfast and dinner was now passed by him either at work in the garden, or in reading and writing, and looking out of the window in his own book-room which fronted the road. The room in which the ladies sat was backwards. Elizabeth, at first, rather wondered that Charlotte should not prefer the dining-parlour for common use. It was a better-sized room, and had a more pleasant aspect. But she soon saw that her friend had an excellent reason for what she did, for Mr. Collins would undoubtedly have been much less in his own apartment had they sat in one equally lively, and she gave Charlotte credit for the arrangement. From the drawing-room they could distinguish nothing in the lane, and were indebted to Mr. Collins for the knowledge of what carriages went along, and how often, especially, Miss de Bourg drove by in her phaeton, which he never failed coming to inform them of, though it happened almost every day. She not unfrequently stopped at the parsonage, and had a few minutes' conversation with Charlotte, but was scarcely ever prevailed upon to get out. Very few days passed in which Mr. Collins did not walk to Rosings, and not many in which his wife did not think it necessary to go likewise, till Elizabeth recollected that there might be other family livings to be disposed of. She could not understand the sacrifice of so many hours. Now and then they were honoured with a call from her ladyship, and nothing escaped her observation that was passing in the room during these visits. She examined into their employments, looked at their work, and advised them to do it differently, found fault with the arrangement of the furniture or detected the housemaid in negligence, and if she accepted any refreshment, seemed to do it only for the sake of finding out that Mrs. Collins's joints of meat were too large for her family. Elizabeth soon perceived that, though this great lady was not in commission of the peace of the county, she was a most active magistrate in her own parish, the minutest concerns of which were carried to her by Mr. Collins, and whenever any of the cottagers were disposed to be quarrelsome, discontented, or too poor, she sallied forth into the village to settle their differences, silence their complaints, and scold them into harmony and plenty. The entertainment of dining at Rosings was repeated about twice a week, and, allowing for the loss of Sir William, and there being only one card-table in the evening, every such entertainment was the counterpart of the first. Their other engagements were few, as the style of living in the neighbourhood in general was beyond Mr. Collins's reach. This, however, was no evil to Elizabeth, and upon the whole she spent her time comfortably enough. There were half-hours of pleasant conversation with Charlotte, and the weather was so fine for the time of year that she had often great enjoyment out of doors. Her favourite walk, and where she frequently went while the others were calling on Lady Catherine, was along the open grove which edged that side of the park, where there was a nice sheltered path which no one seemed to value but herself, and where she felt beyond the reach of Lady Catherine's curiosity. In this quiet way, the first fortnight of her visit soon passed away. Easter was approaching, and the week preceding it was to bring an addition to the family at Rosings, which, in so small a circle, must be important. Elizabeth had heard soon after her arrival that Mr. Darcy was expected there in the course of a few weeks, and, though there were not many of her acquaintances whom she did not prefer, his coming would furnish one comparatively new to look at in their Rosings parties, and she might be amused in seeing how hopeless Miss Bingley's designs on him were by his behaviour to his cousin, for whom he was evidently destined by Lady Catherine, who talked of his coming with the greatest satisfaction, spoke of him in terms of the highest admiration, and seemed almost angry to find that he had already been frequently seen by Miss Lucas and herself. His arrival was soon known at the parsonage, for Mr. Collins was walking the whole morning within view of the lodges opening into Hunsford Lane, in order to have the earliest assurance of it, and after making his bow as the carriage turned into the park, hurried home with the great intelligence. On the following morning he hastened to Rosings to pay his respects. There were two nephews of Lady Catherine to require them, for Mr. Darcy had brought with him a Colonel Fitzwilliam, the younger son of his lord, and, to the great surprise of all the party, when Mr. Collins returned, the gentleman accompanied him. 
Charlotte had seen them from her husband's room crossing the road, and immediately, running into the other, told the girls what an honour they might expect, adding, "'I may thank you, Eliza, for this piece of civility. Mr. Darcy would never have come so soon to wait upon me.' Elizabeth had scarcely time to disclaim all right to the compliment, before their approach was announced by the door-bell, and shortly afterwards the three gentlemen entered the room. Colonel Fitzwilliam, who led the way, was about thirty, not handsome, but in person and address most truly the gentleman. Mr. Darcy looked just as he had been used to look in Hertfordshire, paid his compliments with the usual reserve to Mrs. Collins, and, whatever might be his feelings towards her friend, met her with every appearance of composure. Elizabeth merely curtsied to him, without saying a word. Colonel Fitzwilliam entered into a conversation directly with the readiness and ease of a well-bred man, and talked very pleasantly, but his cousin, after having addressed a slight observation on the house and garden to Mrs. Collins, sat for some time without speaking to anybody. At length, however, his civility was so far awakened as to inquire of Elizabeth after the health of her family. She answered him in the usual way, and after a moment's pause added, "'My eldest sister has been in town these three months. Have you never happened to see her there?' She was perfectly sensible that he never had, but she wished to see whether he would betray any consciousness of what had passed between the Bingleys and Jane, and she thought he looked a little confused as he answered that he had never been so fortunate as to meet Miss Bennet. The subject was pursued no farther, and the gentlemen soon afterwards went away. End of chapter 30 Read by Kristen McQuillan Tokyo, Japan November seventh, two 2005 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapter 31 Colonel Fitzwilliam's manners were very much admired at the parsonage, and the ladies all felt that he must add considerably to the pleasures of their engagements at Rosings. It was some days, however, before they received any invitation thither, for while there were visitors in the house, they could not be necessary, and it was not till Easter Day, almost a week after the gentlemen's arrival, that they were honoured by such an attention, and then they were merely asked on leaving church to come there in the evening. For the last week they had seen very little of Lady Catherine or her daughter. Colonel Fitzwilliam had called at the parsonage more than once during the time, but Mr. Darcy they had only seen at church. The invitation was accepted, of course, and at a proper hour they joined the party in Lady Catherine's drawing-room. Her ladyship received them civilly, but it was plain that their company was by no means so acceptable as when she could get nobody else, and she was, in fact, almost engrossed by her nephews, speaking to them, especially to Darcy, much more than to any other person in the room. Colonel Fitzwilliam seemed really glad to see them. Anything was a welcome relief to him at Rosings and Mrs. Collins's pretty friend had moreover caught his fancy very much. He now seated himself by her, and talked so agreeably of Kent and Hertfordshire, of travelling and staying at home, of new books and music, that Elizabeth had never been half so well entertained in that room before, and they conversed with so much spirit and flow as to draw the attention of Lady Catherine herself, as well as of Mr. Darcy. His eyes had been soon and repeatedly turned toward them, with a look of curiosity, and that her ladyship, after a while, shared the feeling, was more openly acknowledged, for she did not scruple to call out, "'What is that you are saying, Fitzwilliam? What is it you are talking of? What are you telling Miss Bennet? Let me hear what it is.' "'We are speaking of music, madam,' he said, when no longer able to avoid a reply. "'Of music? Then pray speak aloud. It is of all subjects my delight. I must have my share in the conversation if you are speaking of music.' There are few people in England, I suppose, who have more true enjoyment of music than myself, or a better natural taste. If I had ever learnt, I should have been a great proficient. And so would Anne, if her health had allowed her to apply. I am confident that she would have performed delightfully. How does Georgiana get on, Darcy? Mr. Darcy spoke with affectionate praise of his sister's proficiency. "'I am very glad to hear such a good account of her,' said Lady Catherine, "'and pray tell her from me that she cannot expect to excel "'if she does not practice a good deal.' "'I assure you, madam,' he replied, "'that she does not need such advice. "'She practices very constantly.' "'So much the better. "'It cannot be done too much, and when I next write to her "'I shall charge her not to neglect it on any account. 
I often tell young ladies that no excellent in music is to be acquired without constant practice. I have told Miss Bennet several times that she will never play really well unless she practices more, and though Mrs. Collins has no instrument, she is very welcome, as I have often told her, to come to Rosings every day and play on the pianoforte in Mrs. Jenkinson's room. She would be in nobody's way, you know, in that part of the house. Mr. Darcy looked a little ashamed of his aunt's ill-breeding, and made no answer. When coffee was over, Colonel Fitzwilliam reminded Elizabeth of having promised to play to him, and she sat down directly to the instrument. He drew a chair near her. Lady Catherine listened to half a song, and then talked, as before, to her other nephew, till the latter walked away from her, and, making with his usual deliberation towards the pianoforte, stationed himself so as to command a full view of the fair performer's countenance. Elizabeth saw what he was doing, and at the first convenient pause turned to him with an arch smile, and said, "'Do you mean to frighten me, Mr. Darcy, by coming all in this state to hear me? I will not be alarmed, though your sister does play so well. There is a stubbornness about me that never can bear to be frightened at the will of others.' My courage always rises at every attempt to intimidate me. "'I shall not say you are mistaken,' he replied, "'because you could not really believe me to entertain any design of alarming you. And I have had the pleasure of your acquaintance long enough to know that you find great enjoyment in occasionally professing opinions which are, in fact, not your own.' Elizabeth laughed heartily at this picture of herself, and said to Colonel Fitzwilliam, "'Your cousin will give you a very pretty notion of me, "'and teach you not to believe a word I say. "'I'm particularly unlucky in meeting with a person "'so able to expose my real character "'in a part of the world where I'd hoped to pass myself off "'with some degree of credit. "'Indeed, Mr. Darcy, it is very ungenerous in you "'to mention all that you knew to my disadvantage in Hertfordshire, "'and give me leave to say very impolitic, too, "'for it's provoking me to retaliate.' and such things may come out as will shock your relations to hear. "'I am not afraid of you,' he said, smilingly. "'Pray let me hear what you have to accuse him of,' cried Colonel Fitzwilliam. "'I should like to know how he behaves among strangers.' "'Oh, you shall hear, then. But prepare yourself for something very dreadful. The first time of my ever seeing him in Hertfordshire, you must know, was at a ball. And at this ball, what do you think he did?' He danced only four dances, though gentlemen were scarce, and to my certain knowledge more than one young lady was sitting down in want of a partner. Mr. Darcy, you cannot deny the fact. I had not at that time the honour of knowing any lady in the assembly beyond my own party. True, and nobody can ever be introduced in a ballroom. Well, Colonel Fitzwilliam, what do I play next? My fingers wait your orders. Perhaps said Darcy. I should have judged better had I sought an introduction, but I'm ill-qualified to recommend myself to strangers. "'Shall we ask your cousin the reason of this?' said Elizabeth, still addressing Colonel Fitzwilliam. "'Shall we ask him why a man of sense and education, who's lived in the world, is ill-qualified to recommend himself to strangers?' "'Oh, I can answer your question,' said Fitzwilliam, "'without applying to him. It's because he will not give himself the trouble.' "'I certainly have not the talent which some people possess,' said Darcy, "'of conversing easily with those I have never seen before. "'I cannot catch their tone of conversation, "'or appear interested in their concerns, as I often see done.' "'My fingers,' said Elizabeth, "'do not move over this instrument in the masterly manner "'which I see so many women's do. "'They have not the same force or rapidity "'and do not produce the same expression. "'But then I have always supposed it to be my own fault,' "'because I will not take the trouble of practicing. "'It is not that I do not believe my fingers "'as capable as any other woman's of superior execution.' "'Darcy smiled and said, "'You are perfectly right. "'You have employed your time much better. "'No one admitted to the privilege of hearing you "'can think anything wanting. "'We neither of us perform to strangers.' "'Here they were interrupted by Lady Catherine, "'who called out to know what they were talking of. "'Elizabeth immediately began playing again.' Lady Catherine approached, and after listening for a few minutes, said to Darcy, "'Miss Bennet would not play all amiss if she practised more, and could have the advantage of a London master. She has a very good notion of fingering, though her taste is not equal to Anne's. Anne would have been a delightful performer had her health allowed her to learn.' Elizabeth looked at Darcy to see how cordially he assented to his cousin's praise, 
but neither at that moment nor at any other could she discern any symptom of love, and from the whole of his behaviour to Miss de Bourg she derived this comfort from Miss Bingley, that he might have been just as likely to marry her had she been his relation. Lady Catherine continued her remarks on Elizabeth's performance, mixing them with many instructions on execution and taste. Elizabeth received them all with the forbearance of civility, and, at the request of the gentlemen, remained at the instrument till her ladyship's carriage was ready to take them all home. End of chapter 31 Read by Kristen McQuillan, Tokyo, Japan, November 7, 2005 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Chris Gorringe. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Chapter 32. Elizabeth was sitting by herself the next morning, and writing to Jane, while Mrs Collins and Maria were gone on business into the village, when she was startled by a ring at the door, the certain signal of a visitor. As she had heard no carriage, she thought it not unlikely to be Lady Catherine, and under that apprehension was putting away her half-finished letter, that she might escape all impertinent questions, when the door opened, and, to her very great surprise, Mr Darcy, and Mr Darcy only, entered the room. He seemed astonished, too, on finding her alone, and apologised for his intrusion by letting her know that he had understood all the ladies were to be within. They then sat down, and when her inquiries after Rosings were made, seemed in danger of sinking into total silence. It was absolutely necessary, therefore, to think of something and in this emergence, recollecting when she had seen him last in Hertfordshire, and feeling curious to know what he would say on the subject of their hasty departure, she observed, "'How very suddenly you were all quitted Netherfield last November, Mr Darcy. It must have been a most agreeable surprise to Mr Bingley to see you all after him so soon, for if I recollect right, he went but the day before. He and his sisters were well, I hope, when you left London?' "'Perfectly so. I thank you.' She found that she was to receive no other answer, and after a short pause added, I think I have understood that Mr Bingley has not much idea of ever returning to Netherfield again. I have never heard him say so, but it is probable that he may spend very little of his time there in the future. He has many friends, and is at a time of life when friends and engagements are continually increasing. If he means to be but little at Netherfield, it would be better for the neighbourhood that he should give up the place entirely, for then we might possibly get a settled family there. But perhaps Mr Bingley did not take the house so much for the convenience of the neighbourhood as for his own, and we must expect him to keep it or quit it on the same principle. I should not be surprised, said Darcy, if he were to give it up as soon as any eligible purchase offers. Elizabeth made no answer. She was afraid of talking longer of his friend, and having nothing else to say, was now determined to leave the trouble of finding a subject to him. He took the hint, and soon began with, This seems a very comfortable house. Lady Catherine, I believe, did a great deal to it when Mr Collins first came to Hunsford. I believe she did. I am sure she could not have bestowed her kindness on a more grateful object. Mr Collins appears to be very fortunate in his choice of a wife. Yes, indeed. His friends may well rejoice in his having met with one of the very few sensible women who would have accepted him, or have made him happy if they had. My friend has an excellent understanding, though I am not certain that I consider her marrying Mr Collins as the wisest thing she ever did. She seems perfectly happy, however, and in a prudential light it is certainly a very good match for her. It must be very agreeable for her to be settled within so easy a distance of her own family and friends. An easy distance, do you call it? It's nearly fifty miles. And what is fifty miles of good road? Little more than half a day's journey. Yes, I call it a very easy distance. I should never have considered the distance as one of the advantages of the match, cried Elizabeth. I should never have said Mrs Collins was settled near her family. It is proof of your own attachment to Hertfordshire. Anything beyond the neighbourhood of Longbourn, I suppose, would appear far... As he spoke, there was a sort of smile which Elizabeth fancied she understood. He must be supposing her to be thinking of Jane and Netherfield, and she blushed as she answered, I do not mean to say that a woman may not be settled too near her family. 
The far and the near must be relative, and depend on many varying circumstances. Where there is fortune to make the expenses of travelling unimportant, distance becomes no evil. But that is not the case here. Mr. and Mrs. Collins have a comfortable income, but not such a one as will allow frequent journeys, and I am persuaded my friend would not call herself near her family under less than half the present distance. Mr. Darcy drew his chair a little towards her, and said, You cannot have a right to such very strong local attachment. You cannot have always been at Longbourn. Elizabeth looked surprised. The gentleman experienced some change of feeling. He drew back his chair, took a newspaper from the table, and glancing over it said, in a colder voice, Are you pleased with Kent? A short dialogue on the subject of the country ensued, on either side calm and concise, and soon put an end to by the entrance of Charlotte and her sister, just returned from her walk. The tete-a-tete surprised them. Mr. Darcy related the mistake which had occasioned his intruding on Miss Bennet, and after sitting a few minutes longer without saying much to anybody, went away. "'What can be the meaning of this?' said Charlotte as soon as he was gone. "'My dear Eliza, he must be in love with you, or he would never have called us in this familiar way.' But when Elizabeth told of his silence, it did not seem very likely, even to Charlotte's wishes, to be the case. And after various conjectures, they could at last only suppose his visit to proceed from the difficulty of finding anything to do, which was the more probable from the time of year. All field sports were over. Within doors there was Lady Catherine, books and a billiard table, but gentlemen cannot always be within doors, and in the nearness of the parsonage, or the pleasantness of the walk to it, or of the people who lived in it, the two cousins found a temptation from this period of walking thither almost every day. They called at various times of the morning, sometimes separately, sometimes together, and now and then accompanied by their aunt. It was plain to them all that Colonel Fitzwilliam came because he had pleasure in their society, a persuasion which, of course, recommended him still more, and Elizabeth was reminded by her own satisfaction in being with him, as well as by her evident admiration of her, of her former favourite George Wickham, and though in comparing them she saw there was less captivating softness in Colonel Fitzwilliam's manners, she believed he might have the best informed mind. But why Mr. Darcy came so often to the parsonage, it was more difficult to understand. It could not be for society, as he frequently sat there ten minutes together without opening his lips, and when he did speak, it seemed the effort of necessity rather than of choice, a sacrifice to propriety, not a pleasure to himself. He seldom appeared really animated. Mrs. Collins knew not what to make of him, Colonel Fitzwilliam's occasionally laughing at his stupidity proved that he was generally different, which her own knowledge of him could not have told her. And as she would like to have believed that this changed the effect of love, and the object of that love her friend Eliza, she set herself seriously to work to find it out. She watched him whenever they were at Rosings, and whenever he came to Hunsford, but without much success. He certainly looked at her friend a great deal, but the expression of that look was disputable. It was an earnest, steadfast gaze, but she often doubted whether there were much admiration in it, and sometimes it seemed nothing but absence of mind. She had once or twice suggested to Elizabeth the possibility of his being partial to her, but Elizabeth always laughed at the idea, and Mrs Collins did not think it right to press the subject, from the danger of raising expectations which might only end in disappointment. For in her opinion, it admitted not a doubt that all her friend's dislike would vanish, if she could suppose him to be in her power. In her kind schemes for Elizabeth, she sometimes planned her marrying Colonel Fitzwilliam. He was beyond comparison the most pleasant man. He certainly admired her, and his situation in life was most eligible. But to counterbalance these advantages, Mr Darcy had considerable patronage in the church, and his cousin could have none at all. Chapter 33 more than once did Elizabeth, in her ramble within the park, unexpectedly meet Mr. Darcy. She felt all the perverseness of the mischance that should bring him where no one else was brought, and, to prevent its ever happening again, took care to inform him at first that it was a favourite haunt of hers. How it could occur a second time, therefore, was very odd. Yet it did, and even a third. It seemed like willful ill-nature, or a voluntary penance, 
for on those occasions it was not merely a few formal inquiries and an awkward pause and then away, but he actually thought it necessary to turn back and walk with her. He never said a great deal, nor did she give herself the trouble of talking or of listening much, but it struck her in the course of their third rencontre that he was asking some odd unconnected questions about her pleasure in being at Hunsford, her love of solitary walks, and her opinion of Mr. and Mrs. Collins's happiness, and that in speaking of Rosings and her not perfectly understanding the house, he seemed to expect that whenever she came into Kent again, she would be staying there too. His words seemed to imply it. Could he have Colonel Fitzwilliam in his thoughts? She supposed, if he meant anything, he must mean an allusion to what might arise in that quarter. It distressed her a little, and she was quite glad to find herself at the gate in the pales opposite the parsonage. She was engaged one day, she walked, in perusing Jane's last letter, and dwelling on some passages which proved that Jane had not written in spirits, when instead of being again surprised by Mr. Darcy, she saw one looking up that Colonel Fitzwilliam was meeting her. Putting away the letter immediately and forcing a smile, she said, I did not know before that you ever walked this way. I have been making a tour of the park, he replied, as I generally do every year, and intend to close it with a call at the parsonage. Are you going much farther? No, I should have turned in a moment. And accordingly she did turn, and they walked towards the parsonage together. Do you certainly leave Kent on Saturday? said she. Yes, if Darcy does not put it off again, but I am at his disposal. He arranges the business just as he pleases. And if not able to please himself in the arrangement, he has at least pleasure in the great power of choice. I do not know anybody who seems to enjoy the power of doing what he likes more than Mr. Darcy. He likes to have his own way very well, replied Colonel Fitzwilliam, but so we all do. It is only that he has better means of having it than many others, because he is rich and many others are poor. I speak feelingly. A younger son, you know, must be inured to self-denial and dependence. In my opinion, the younger son of an earl can know very little of either. Now, seriously, what have you ever known of self-denial and dependence? When have you been prevented by want of money from going wherever you choose, or procuring anything you had a fancy for? These are home questions, and perhaps I cannot say that I have experienced many hardships of that nature. But in matters of greater weight, I may suffer from want of money. Younger sons cannot marry where they like, unless where they like women of fortune, which I think they very often do. Our habits of expense make us too dependent, and there are too many in my rank of life who can afford to marry without some attention to money. Is this, thought Elizabeth, meant for me? And she coloured at the idea, but recovering herself, said in a lively tone, And pray, what is it the usual price of an earl's younger son? Unless the elder brother is very sickly, I suppose you would not ask above fifty thousand pounds? He answered her in the same style, and the subject dropped. To interrupt a silence which might make him fancy her affected with what had passed, she soon afterwards said, I imagine your cousin brought you down with him chiefly for the sake of having someone at his disposal. I wonder he does not marry to secure a lasting convenience of that kind. But perhaps his sister does as well for the present, and as she is under his sole care, he may do what he likes with her. No, said Colonel Fitzwilliam, that is an advantage which he must divide with me. I am joined with him in the guardianship of Miss Darcy. Are you indeed? And pray, what sort of guardians do you make? Does your charge give you much trouble? Young ladies of her age are sometimes a little difficult to manage, and if she has the true Darcy spirit, she may like to have her own way. As she spoke, she observed him looking at her earnestly, and the manner in which he immediately asked her why she supposed Miss Darcy likely to give them any uneasiness convinced her that she had somehow or other got pretty near the truth. She directly replied, You need not be frightened. I never heard any harm of her, and I dare say she is one of the most tractable creatures in the world. She is a very great favourite with some ladies of my acquaintance, Mrs Hurst and Miss Bingley. I think I've heard you say that you know them. I know them a little. Their brother is a pleasant, gentleman-like man. He is a great friend of Darcy's. Oh, yes, said Elizabeth dryly. Mr. Darcy is uncommonly kind to Mr. Bingley, and takes a prodigious deal of care of him. Care of him? 
yes, I really believe Darcy does take care of him in those points where he most wants care. From something that he told me in our journey hither, I have reason to think Bingley very much indebted to him. But I ought to beg his pardon, for I have no right to suppose that Bingley was the person meant. It was all conjecture. What is it that you mean? It's a circumstance which Darcy would not wish to be generally known, because if it were to get round to the lady's family, it would be an unpleasant thing. You may depend on my not mentioning it. And remember that I have not much reason for supposing it to be Bingley. What he told me was merely this, that he congratulated himself on having lately saved a friend from the inconveniences of a most imprudent marriage, but without mentioning names or any other particulars. And I only suspected it to be Bingley, from believing him the kind of young man to get into a scrape of that sort, and from knowing them to have been together the whole of last summer. Did Mr Darcy give you reasons for this interference? I understand there were some very strong objections against the lady. And what art did he use to separate them? He did not talk to me of his own arts, said Fitzwilliam, smiling. He only told me what I have now told you. Elizabeth made no answer and walked on, her heart swelling with indignation. After watching her a little, Fitzwilliam asked her why she was so thoughtful. I am thinking of what you have been telling me, said she. Your cousin's conduct does not suit my feelings. Why was he to be the judge? You are rather disposed to call his interference officious? I do not see what right Mr Darcy had to decide on the propriety of his friend's inclination, or why, upon his judgment alone, he was to determine and direct in what manner his friend was to be happy. But, she continued, recollecting herself, as we know none of the particulars, it is not fair to condemn him. It is not to be supposed that there was much affection in the case. That is not an unnatural surmise, said Fitzwilliam, but it is a lessening of the honour of my cousin's triumph very sadly. This was spoken jestingly, but it appeared to her so just a picture of Mr Darcy that she would not trust herself with an answer, and therefore, abruptly changing the conversation, talked on indifferent matters until they reached the parsonage. There, shut into her own room, as soon as their visitor left them, she could think without interruption of all that she had heard. It was not to be supposed that any other people could be men than those with whom she was connected. There could not exist in the world two men over whom Mr Darcy could have such boundless influence. That he had been concerned in the measures taken to separate Bingley and Jane she had never doubted, but she had always attributed to Miss Bingley the principal design and arrangement of them. If his own vanity, however, did not mislead him, he was the cause, his pride and caprice were the cause of all that Jane had suffered and still continued to suffer. He had ruined for a while every hope of happiness for the most affectionate, most generous heart in the world, and no one could say how lasting an evil he might have inflicted. There were some very strong objections against the lady, were Colonel Fitzwilliam's words, and those strong objections probably were her having one uncle who was a country attorney and another who was in business in London. To Jane herself, she exclaimed, there could be no possibility of objection, all loveliness and goodness as she is, her understanding excellent, her mind improved, and her manners captivating. Neither could anything be urged against my father, who, though with some peculiarities, has abilities Mr Darcy himself need not disdain, and respectability which he will probably never each. When he thought of her mother, her confidence gave way a little, but she would not allow that any objections there had material weight with Mr Darcy whose pride, she was convinced, would receive a deeper wound from the want of importance in his friend's connections than from their want of sense. And she was quite decided at last that he had been partly governed by this worst kind of pride, and partly by the wish of retaining Mr Bingley for his sister. The agitation and tears which the subject occasioned brought on a headache, and it grew so much worse towards the evening that, added to her unwillingness to see Mr Darcy, it determined her not to attend her cousins to Rosings, where they were engaged to drink tea. Mrs Collins, seeing that she was really unwell, did not press her to go, and as much as possible prevented her husband from pressing her. But Mr Collins could not conceal his apprehension at Lady Catherine's being rather displeased by her staying at home. End of chapter 33
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapters 34 and 35. Chapter 34 When they were gone, Elizabeth, as if intending to exasperate herself as much as possible against Mr. Darcy, chose for her employment the examination of all the letters which Jane had written to her since being in Kent. They contained no actual complaint, nor was there any revival of past occurrences, or any communication of present suffering. But, in all, and in almost every line of each, there was a want of that cheerfulness which had been used to characterize her style, and which, proceeding from the serenity of a mind at ease with itself, and kindly disposed towards every one, had been scarcely ever clouded. Elizabeth noticed every sentence conveying the idea of uneasiness, with an attention which it had hardly received on the first perusal. Mr. Darcy's shameful boast of what misery he had been able to inflict gave her a keener sense of her sister's sufferings. It was some consolation to think that his visit to Rosings was to end on the day after the next, and, a still greater, that in less than a fortnight she should herself be with Jane again, and enabled to contribute to the recovery of her spirits by all that affection could do. She could not think of Darcy's leaving Kent without remembering that his cousin was to go with him, but Colonel Fitzwilliam had made it clear that he had no intentions at all, and, agreeable as he was, she did not mean to be unhappy about him. While settling this point she was suddenly roused by the sound of the door-bell, and her spirits were a little fluttered by the idea of its being Colonel Fitzwilliam himself, who had once before called late in the evening, and might now come to inquire particularly after her. But this idea was soon banished, and her spirits were very differently affected, when, to her utter amazement, she saw Mr. Darcy walk into the room. In an hurried manner he immediately began an inquiry after her health, imputing his visit to a wish of hearing that she were better. She answered him with cold civility. He sat down for a few moments, and then getting up walked about the room. Elizabeth was surprised, but said not a word. After a silence of several minutes he came towards her in an agitated manner, and thus began. "'In vain I have struggled. It will not do.' My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. Elizabeth's astonishment was beyond expression. She stared, coloured, doubted, and was silent. This he considered sufficient encouragement, and the avowal of all that he felt, and had long felt for her, immediately followed. He spoke well, but there were feelings besides those of the heart to be detailed, and he was not more eloquent on the subject of tenderness than of pride. His sense of her inferiority, of its being a degradation, of the family obstacles which had always opposed to inclination, were dwelt on with a warmth which seemed due to the consequence he was wounding, but was very unlikely to recommend his suit. In spite of her deeply rooted dislike, she could not be insensible to the compliment of such a man's affection, and though her intentions did not vary for an instant, she was at first sorry for the pain he was to receive, till, roused to resentment by his subsequent language, she lost all compassion in anger. She tried, however, to compose herself to answer him with patience, when he should have done. He concluded with representing to her the strength of that attachment which, in spite of all his endeavours, he had found impossible to conquer, and with expressing his hope that it would now be rewarded by her acceptance of his hand. As he said this, she could easily see that he had no doubt of a favourable answer. 
He spoke of apprehension and anxiety, but his countenance expressed real security. Such a circumstance could only exasperate farther, and, when he ceased, the colour rose into her cheeks, and she said, "'In such cases as this, it is, I believe, the established mode to express a sense of obligation for the sentiments avowed, however unequally they may be returned.' It is natural that obligation should be felt, and if I could feel gratitude, I would now thank you. But I cannot. I have never desired your good opinion, and you have certainly bestowed it most unwillingly. I am sorry to have occasioned pain to any one. It has been most unconsciously done, however, and I hope will be of short duration. The feelings which, you tell me, have long prevented the acknowledgment of your regard, can have little difficulty in overcoming it after this explanation. Mr. Darcy, who was leaning against the mantelpiece with his eyes fixed on her face, seemed to catch her words with no less resentment than surprise. His complexion became pale with anger, and the disturbance of his mind was visible in every feature. He was struggling for the appearance of composure, and would not open his lips till he believed himself to have attained it. The pause was to Elizabeth's feelings dreadful. At length, with a voice of forced calmness, he said, "'And this is all the reply which I am to have the honour of expecting. I might, perhaps, wish to be informed why, with so little endeavour at civility, I am thus rejected.' but it is of small importance. "'I might as well inquire,' replied she, "'why, with so evident a desire of offending and insulting me, you chose to tell me that you liked me against your will, against your reason, and even against your character. Was not this some excuse for incivility, if I was uncivil? But I have other provocations, you know I have. Had not my feelings decided against you, had they been indifferent, or had they even been favourable, do you think that any consideration would tempt me to accept the man who has been the means of ruining, perhaps for ever, the happiness of a most beloved sister? As she pronounced these words, Mr. Darcy changed colour, but the emotion was short, and he listened without attempting to interrupt her while she continued. I have every reason in the world to think ill of you, no motive can excuse the unjust and ungenerous part you acted there. You dare not, you cannot deny that you have been the principal, if not the only means, of dividing them from each other, of exposing one to the censure of the world for caprice and instability, and the other to its derision for disappointed hopes, and involving them both in misery of the acutest kind." She paused, and saw with no slight indignation that he was listening with an air which proved him wholly unmoved by any feeling of remorse. He even looked at her with a smile of affected incredulity. "'Can you deny that you have done it?' she repeated. With assumed tranquillity, he then replied, "'I have no wish of denying that I did everything in my power.' to separate my friend from your sister, or that I rejoice in my success. Towards him I have been kinder than towards myself. Elizabeth disdained the appearance of noticing this civil reflection, but its meaning did not escape, nor was it likely to conciliate her. "'But it is not merely this affair,' she continued, "'on which my dislike is founded.' Long before it had taken place, my opinion of you was decided. Your character was unfolded in the recital which I received many months ago from Mr. Wickham. On this subject, what can you have to say? In what imaginary act of friendship can you here defend yourself? Or under what misrepresentation can you here impose upon others? "'You take an eager interest in that gentleman's concerns,' said Darcy." in a less tranquil tone, and with a heightened colour. "'Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help feeling an interest in him?' "'His misfortunes,' repeated Darcy contemptuously. "'Yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed.' 
"'And of your infliction,' cried Elizabeth with energy. "'You have reduced him to his present state of poverty, comparative poverty. "'You have withheld the advantages which you must know to have been designed for him. "'You have deprived the best years of his life of that independence "'which was no less his due than his desert. "'You have done all this.' and yet you can treat the mention of his misfortune with contempt and ridicule. "'And this,' cried Darcy, as he walked with quick steps across the room, "'is your opinion of me. This is the estimation in which you hold me. I thank you for explaining it so fully. My faults, according to this calculation, are heavy indeed. But perhaps,' added he, stopping in his walk and turning towards her, "'These offences might have been overlooked, "'had not your pride been hurt by my honest confession of the scruples "'that had long prevented my forming any serious design. "'These bitter accusations might have been suppressed, "'had I, with greater policy, concealed my struggles, "'and flattered you into the belief of my being impelled "'by unqualified, unalloyed inclination, "'by reason, by reflection, by everything.' "'But disguise of every sort is my abhorrence, "'nor am I ashamed of the feelings I related. "'They were natural and just. "'Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections? "'To congratulate myself on the hope of relations "'whose condition in life is so decidedly beneath my own?' "'Elizabeth felt herself growing more angry every moment, "'yet she tried to the utmost to speak with composure when she said, "'You are mistaken, Mr. Darcy, if you suppose that the mode of your declaration affected me in any other way than as it spared the concern which I might have felt in refusing you had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner.' She saw him start at this, but he said nothing, and she continued. "'You could not have made the offer of your hand in any possible way that would have tempted me to accept it. Again his astonishment was obvious, and he looked at her with an expression of mingled incredulity and mortification. She went on. "'From the very beginning, from the first moment, I may almost say, of my acquaintance with you, your manners, impressing me with the fullest belief of your arrogance, your conceit, and your selfish disdain for the feelings of others, were such as to form the groundwork of disapprobation on which succeeding events have built so immovable a dislike. And I had not known you a month before I felt that you were the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed on to marry. You have said quite enough, madam. I perfectly comprehend your feelings, and have now only to be ashamed of what my own have been. Forgive me for having taken up so much of your time, "'and accept my best wishes for your health and happiness.' "'And with these words he hastily left the room, "'and Elizabeth heard him the next moment open the front door and quit the house. "'The tumult of her mind was now painfully great. "'She knew not how to support herself, "'and from actual weakness sat down and cried for half an hour. "'Her astonishment, as she reflected on what had passed, was increased by every review of it. That she should receive an offer of marriage from Mr. Darcy. That he should have been in love with her for so many months. So much in love as to wish to marry her in spite of all the objections which had made him prevent his friends marrying her sister, and which must appear at least with equal force in his own case, was almost incredible. It was gratifying to have inspired unconsciously so strong an affection. But his pride, his abominable pride, his shameless avowal of what he had done with respect to Jane, his unpardonable assurance in acknowledging, though he could not justify it, and the unfeeling manner in which he had mentioned Mr. Wickham, his cruelty towards whom he had not attempted to deny, soon overcame the pity which the consideration of his attachment had for a moment excited. She continued in very agitated reflections till the sound of Lady Catherine's carriage made her feel how unequal she was to encounter Charlotte's observation, 
and hurried her away to her room. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 Elizabeth awoke the next morning to the same thoughts and meditations which had at length closed her eyes. She could not yet recover from the surprise of what had happened. It was impossible to think of anything else, and, totally indisposed for employment, she resolved, soon after breakfast, to indulge herself in air and exercise. She was proceeding directly to her favourite walk, when the recollection of Mr. Darcy's sometimes coming there stopped her, and instead of entering the park she turned up the lane, which led farther from the turnpike road. The park paling was still the boundary on one side, and she soon passed one of the gates into the ground. After walking two or three times along that part of the lane she was tempted, by the pleasantness of the morning, to stop at the gates and look into the park. The five weeks which she had now passed in Kent had made a great difference in the country, and every day was adding to the verdure of the early trees. She was on the point of continuing her walk when she caught a glimpse of a gentleman within the sort of grove which edged the park. He was moving that way, and, fearful of its being Mr. Darcy, she was directly retreating. But the person who advanced was now near enough to see her, and, stepping forward with eagerness, pronounced her name. She had turned away, but on hearing herself called, though in a voice which proved it to be Mr. Darcy, she moved again towards the gate. He had by that time reached it also, and, holding out a letter, which she instinctively took, said, with a look of haughty composure, "'I have been walking in the grove some time, in the hope of meeting you. Will you do me the honour of reading that letter?' And then, with a slight bow, turned again into the plantation, and was soon out of sight." With no expectation of pleasure, but with the strongest curiosity, Elizabeth opened the letter, and to her still increasing wonder perceived an envelope containing two sheets of letter-paper, written quite through, in a very close hand. The envelope itself was likewise full. Pursuing her way along the lane, she then began it. It was dated from Rosings, at eight o'clock in the morning, and was as follows. Be not alarmed, madam, on receiving this letter, by the apprehension of its containing any repetition of those sentiments, or renewal of those offers, which were last night so disgusting to you. I write without any intention of paining you, or humbling myself, by dwelling on wishes which, for the happiness of both, cannot be too soon forgotten. And the effort which the formation and the perusal of this letter must occasion should have been spared, had not my character required it to be written and read. You must therefore pardon the freedom with which I demand your attention. Your feelings, I know, will bestow it unwillingly, but I demand it of your justice. Two offences of a very different nature, and by no means of equal magnitude, you last night laid to my charge. The first mentioned was that, regardless of the sentiments of either, I had detached Mr. Bingley from your sister, and the other that I had, in defiance of various claims, in defiance of honour and humanity, ruined the immediate prosperity, and blasted the prospects of Mr. Wickham. Willfully and wantonly to have thrown off the companion of my youth, the acknowledged favourite of my father, a young man who had scarcely any other dependence than on our patronage, and who had been brought up to expect its exertion, would be a depravity to which the separation of two young persons, whose affection could be the growth of only a few weeks, could bear no comparison. But from the severity of that blame which was last night so liberally bestowed, respecting each circumstance, I shall hope to be in the future secured, when the following account of my actions and their motives has been read. If, in the explanation of them, which is due to myself, I am under the necessity of relating feelings which may be offensive to yours, I can only say that I am sorry. 
the necessity must be obeyed, and further apology would be absurd. I had not been long in Hertfordshire before I saw, in common with others, that Bingley preferred your elder sister to any other young woman in the country. But it was not till the evening of the dance at Netherfield that I had any apprehension of his feeling a serious attachment. I had often seen him in love before. At that ball, while I had the honour of dancing with you, I was first made acquainted, by Sir William Lucas's accidental information, that Bingley's attentions to your sister had given rise to a general expectation of their marriage. He spoke of it as a certain event, of which the time alone could be undecided. From that moment I observed my friend's behaviour attentively, and I could then perceive that his partiality for Miss Bennet was beyond what I had ever witnessed in him. Your sister I also watched. Her look and manners were open, cheerful, and engaging as ever, but without any symptom of peculiar regard, and I remained convinced from the evening's scrutiny that though she received his attentions with pleasure, she did not invite them by any participation of sentiment. If you have not been mistaken here, I must have been in error. Your superior knowledge of your sister must make the latter probable. If it be so, if I have been misled by such error to inflict pain on her, your resentment has not been unreasonable. But I shall not scruple to assert that the serenity of your sister's countenance and air was such as might have given the most acute observer a conviction that, however amiable her temper, her heart was not likely to be easily touched. That I was desirous of believing her indifferent is certain, but I will venture to say that my investigation and decisions are not usually influenced by my hopes or fears. I did not believe her to be indifferent because I wished it. I believed it on impartial conviction, as truly as I wished it in reason. My objections to the marriage were not merely those which I last night acknowledged to have the utmost force of passion to put aside, in my own case. The want of connection could not be so great an evil to my friend as to me. But there were other causes of repugnance, causes which, though still existing, and existing to an equal degree in both instances, I had myself endeavoured to forget, because they were not immediately before me. These causes must be stated, though briefly. The situation of your mother's family, though objectionable, was nothing in comparison to that total want of propriety so frequently, so almost uniformly betrayed by herself, by your three younger sisters, and occasionally even by your father. Pardon me, it pains me to offend you, but amidst your concern for the defects of your nearest relations, and your displeasure at this representation of them, let it give you consolation to consider that, to have conducted yourselves so as to avoid any share of the like censure, is praise no less generally bestowed on you and your elder sister, than it is honourable to the sense and disposition of both. I will only say farther, that from what passed that evening, my opinion of all parties was confirmed, and every inducement heightened which could have led me before to preserve my friend from what I esteemed a most unhappy connection. He left Netherfield for London on the day following, as you, I am certain, remember, with the design of soon returning. The part which I acted is now to be explained. His sister's uneasiness had been equally excited with my own. Our coincidence of feeling was soon discovered, and, alike sensible that no time was to be lost in detaching their brother, we shortly resolved on joining him directly in London. We accordingly went, and there I readily engaged in the office of pointing out to my friend the certain evils of such a choice. I described and enforced them earnestly. But, however this remonstrance might have staggered or delayed his determination, I do not suppose that it would ultimately have prevented the marriage, had it not been seconded by the assurance that I hesitated not in giving, of your sister's indifference. 
he had before believed her to return his affection with sincere, if not with equal regard. But Bingley has great natural modesty, with a stronger dependence on my judgment than on his own. To convince him, therefore, that he had deceived himself was no very difficult point. To persuade him against returning into Hertfordshire, when that conviction had been given, was scarcely the work of a moment. I cannot blame myself for having done thus much. There is but one part of my conduct in the whole affair on which I do not reflect with satisfaction. It is that I condescended to adopt the measures of art so far as to conceal from him your sister's being in town. I knew it myself, as it was known to Miss Bingley, but her brother is even yet ignorant of it. That they might have met without ill consequence is perhaps probable, but his regard did not appear to me enough extinguished for him to see her without some danger. Perhaps this concealment, this disguise, was beneath me. It is done, however, and it was done for the best. On this subject I have nothing more to say, no other apology to offer. If I have wounded your sister's feelings, it was unknowingly done, and though the motives which governed me may to you very naturally appear insufficient, I have not yet learnt to condemn them. With respect to that other, more weighty accusation, of having injured Mr. Wickham, I can only refute it by laying before you the whole of his connection with my family. Of what he has particularly accused me I am ignorant, but of the truth of what I shall relate, I can summon more than one witness of undoubted veracity. Mr. Wickham is the son of a very respectable man, who had for many years the management of all the Pemberley estates, and whose good conduct in the discharge of his trust naturally inclined my father to be of service to him. And on George Wickham, who was his godson, his kindness was therefore liberally bestowed. My father supported him at school, and afterwards at Cambridge. Most important assistance, as his own father, always poor from the extravagance of his wife, would have been unable to give him a gentleman's education. My father was not only fond of this young man's society, whose manners were always engaging. He had also the highest opinion of him, and, hoping the church would be his profession, intended to provide for him in it. As for myself, it is many, many years since I first began to think of him in a very different manner. The vicious propensities, the want of principle, which he was careful to guard from the knowledge of his best friend, could not escape the observation of a young man of nearly the same age with himself, and who had opportunities of seeing him in unguarded moments, which Mr. Darcy could not have. Here again I shall give you pain, to what degree you only can tell. But, whatever may be the sentiments which Mr. Wickham has created, a suspicion of their nature shall not prevent me from unfolding his real character. It adds even another motive. My excellent father died about five years ago, and his attachment to Mr. Wickham was to the last so steady that in his will he particularly recommended it to me, to promote his advancement in the best manner that his profession might allow. And if he took orders, desired that a valuable family living might be his as soon as it became vacant. There was also a legacy of one thousand pounds. His own father did not long survive mine, and within half a year from these events Mr. Wickham wrote to inform me that, having finally resolved against taking orders, he hoped I should not think it unreasonable for him to expect some more immediate pecuniary advantage in lieu of the preferment by which he could not be benefited. He had some intention, he added, of studying law, and I must be aware that the interest of one thousand pounds would be a very insufficient support therein. I rather wished than believed him to be sincere, but, at any rate, was perfectly ready to accede to his proposal. 
I knew that Mr. Wickham ought not to be a clergyman. The business was therefore soon settled. He resigned all claim to assistance in the church, were it possible that he could ever be in a situation to receive it, and accepted in return three thousand pounds. All connection between us seemed now dissolved. I thought too ill of him to invite him to Pemberley, or admit his society in town. In town I believe he chiefly lived, but his studying the law was a mere pretense, and being now free from all restraint, his life was a life of idleness and dissipation. For about three years I heard little of him, but on the decease of the incumbent of the living which had been designed for him, he applied to me again by letter for the presentation. His circumstances, he assured me, and I had no difficulty in believing it, were exceedingly bad. He had found the law a most unprofitable study, and was now absolutely resolved on being ordained, if I would present him to the living in question, of which he trusted there could be little doubt, as he was well assured that I had no other person to provide for, and I could not have forgotten my revered father's intentions. You will hardly blame me for refusing to comply with this entreaty, or for resisting every repetition to it. His resentment was in proportion to the distress of his circumstances. And he was doubtless as violent in his abuse of me to others, as in his reproaches to myself. After this period every appearance of acquaintance was dropped. How he lived I know not but last summer he was again most painfully obtruded on my notice. I must now mention a circumstance which I would wish to forget myself, and which no obligation less than the present should induce me to unfold to any human being. Having said thus much, I feel no doubt of your secrecy. My sister, who is more than ten years my junior, was left to the guardianship of my mother's nephew, Colonel Fitzwilliam, and myself. About a year ago she was taken from school, and an establishment formed for her in London, and last summer she went with the lady who presided over it to Ramsgate, and thither also went Mr. Wickham, undoubtedly by design, for there proved to have been a prior acquaintance between him and Mrs. Young, in whose character we were most unhappily deceived, and by her connivance and aid he so far recommended himself to Georgiana, whose affectionate heart retained a strong impression of his kindness to her as a child, that she was persuaded to believe herself in love, and to consent to an elopement. She was then but fifteen, which must be her excuse, and after stating her imprudence I am happy to add, that I owed the knowledge of it to herself. I joined them unexpectedly, a day or two before the intended elopement, and then Georgiana, unable to support the idea of grieving and offending a brother whom she almost looked up to as a father, acknowledged the whole to me. You may imagine what I felt, and how I acted. Regard for my sister's credit and feelings prevented any public exposure, but I wrote to Mr. Wickham, who left the place immediately, and Mrs. Young was of course removed from her charge. Mr. Wickham's chief object was unquestionably my sister's fortune, which is thirty thousand pounds, but I cannot help supposing that the hope of revenging himself on me was a strong inducement. His revenge would have been complete indeed." This, madam, is a faithful narrative of every event in which we have been concerned together, and if you do not absolutely reject it as false, you will, I hope, acquit me henceforth of cruelty towards Mr. Wickham. I know not in what manner, under what form of falsehood he has imposed on you, but his success is not perhaps to be wondered at. Ignorant as you previously were of everything concerning either, Detection could not be in your power, and suspicion certainly not in your inclination. You may possibly wonder why all this was not told you last night, but I was not then master enough of myself to know what could or ought to be revealed. 
For the truth of everything here related, I can appeal more particularly to the testimony of Colonel Fitzwilliam, who, from our near relationship and constant intimacy, and still more as one of the executors of my father's will, has been unavoidably acquainted with every particular of these transactions. If your abhorrence of me should make my assertions valueless, you cannot be prevented by the same cause from confiding in my cousin, and that there may be the possibility of consulting him, I shall endeavour to find some opportunity of putting this letter in your hands in the course of the morning. I will only add, God bless you. Fitzwilliam Darcy End of chapter 35 Recorded on November 12th, 2005, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Crowther Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapter 36 If Elizabeth, when Mr. Darcy gave her the letter, did not expect it to contain a renewal of his offers, she had formed no expectation at all of its contents. But such as they were, it may well be supposed how eagerly she went through them, and what a contrariety of emotion they excited. Her feelings, as she read, were scarcely to be defined. With amazement did she first understand that he believed any apology to be in his power, and steadfastly was she persuaded that he could have no explanation to give which a just sense of shame would not conceal. With a strong prejudice against everything he might say, she began his account of what had happened at Netherfield. She read with an eagerness which hardly left her power of comprehension, and from impatience of knowing what the next sentence might bring, was incapable of attending to the sense of the one before her eyes. His belief of her sister's insensibility she instantly resolved to be false, and his account of the real, the worse objections to the match, made her too angry to have any wish of doing him justice. He expressed no regret for what he had done which satisfied her. His style was not penitent, but haughty. It was all pride and insolence. But when this subject was succeeded by his account of Mr. Wickham, when she read with somewhat clearer attention a relation of events which, if true, must overthrow every cherished opinion of his worth, and which bore so alarming an affinity to his own history of himself, her feelings were yet more acutely painful and more difficult of definition. Astonishment, apprehension, and even horror oppressed her, she wished to discredit it entirely, repeatedly exclaiming, This must be false, this cannot be, this must be the grossest falsehood. And when she had gone through the whole letter, though scarcely knowing anything of the last page or two, put it hastily away, protest protesting that she would not regard it, that she would never look at it again. In this perturbed state of mind, with thoughts that could rest on nothing, she walked on, but it would not do. In half a minute the letter was unfolded again, and collecting herself as well as she could, she again began the mortifying perusal of all that related to Wickham, and commanded herself so far as to examine the meaning of every sentence. The account of his connection with the Pemberley family was exactly what he had related himself. And the kindness of the late Mr. Darcy, though she had not before known its extent, agreed equally well with his own words. So far each recital confirmed the other. But when she came to the will, the difference was great. What Wickham had said of the living was fresh in her memory, 
and as she recalled his very words, it was impossible not to feel that there was gross duplicity on one side or the other, and for a few moments she flattered herself that her wishes did not err. But when she read and re-read with the closest attention the particulars immediately following of Wickham's resigning all pretensions to the living, of his receiving in lieu so considerable a sum as three thousand pounds, again she was forced to hesitate. She put down the letter, weighed every circumstance with what she meant to be impartiality, deliberated on the probability of each statement, but with little success. On both sides it was only assertion. Again she read on, but every line proved more clearly that the affair, which she had believed it impossible that any contrivance could so represent as to render Mr. Darcy's conduct in it less than infamous, was capable of a turn which must make him entirely blameless throughout the whole. The extravagance and general profligacy, which he scrupled not to lay at Mr. Wickham's charge, exceedingly shocked her, the more so as she could bring no proof of its injustice. She had never heard of him before his entrance into the Shar militia, in which he had engaged at the persuasion of the young man who, on meeting him accidentally in town, had there renewed a slight acquaintance. Of his former way of life nothing had been known in Hertfordshire but what he told himself. As to his real character, had information been in her power, she had never felt a wish of inquiring. His countenance, voice, and manner had established him at once in the possession of every virtue. She tried to recollect some instance of goodness, some distinguished trait of integrity or benevolence that might rescue him from the attacks of Mr. Darcy, or at least by the predominance of virtue atone for those casual errors under which she would endeavour to class what Mr. Darcy had described as the idleness and vice of many years continued. But no such recollection re befriended her. She could see him instantly before her in every charm of air and address, but she could remember no more substantial good than the general approbation of the neighbourhood, and the regard which his social powers had gained him in the mess. After pausing on this point a considerable while, she once more continued to read, but alas, the story which followed, of his designs on Miss Darcy, received some confirmation from what had passed between Colonel Fitzwilliam and herself only the morning before, and at last she was referred for the truth of every particular to Colonel Fitzwilliam himself, from whom she had previously received the information of his near concern in all his cousin's affairs, and whose character she had no reason to question. At one time she had almost resolved on applying to him, but the idea was checked by the awkwardness of the application, and at length wholly banished by the conviction that Mr. Hart Darcy would never have hazarded such a proposal he had not been well assured of his cousin's corroboration. She perfectly remembered everything that had passed in conversation between Wickham and herself in their first evening at Mr. Phillips's. Many of his expressions were still fresh in her memory. She was now struck with the impropriety of such communications to a stranger, and wonder it had escaped her before. She saw the indelicacy of putting himself forward as he had done, and the inconsistency of his professions with his conduct. She remembered that he had boasted of having no fear of seeing Mr. Darcy, that Mr. Darcy must leave the country, but that he should stand his ground. Yet he had avoided the Netherfield Ball the very next week. She remembered also that till the Netherfield family had quitted the country, he had told his story to no one but herself, 
but that after their removal it had been everywhere discussed, that he had then no reserves, no scruples in sinking Mr. Darcy's character, though he had assured her that respect for the father would always prevent his exposing the son. How differently did everything now appear in that he was concerned! His attentions to Miss King were now the consequence of views solely and hatefully mercenary, and the mediocrity of her fortune proved no longer the moderation of his wishes, but his eagerness to grasp at anything. His behaviour to herself could now have had no tolerable motive. He had either been deceived with regard to her fortune, or had been gratifying his vanity by encouraging the preference which she believed she had most incautiously shown. Every lingering struggle in his favour grew fainter and fainter. And in farther justification of Mr. Darcy, she could not but allow Mr. Bingley, when questioned by Jane, had long ago asserted his blamelessness in the affair that proud and repulsive as were his manners she had never in the whole course of their acquaintance an acquaintance which had latterly brought them much together and given her a sort of intimacy with his ways seen anything that betrayed him to be unprincipled or unjust anything that spoke him of irreligious or immoral habits that among his own connections he was esteemed and valued that even Wickham had allowed him merit as a brother, and that she had often heard him speak so affectionately of his sister as to prove him capable of some amiable feeling, that had his actions been what Mr. Wickham represented them, so gross a violation of everything right could hardly have been concealed from the world, and that friendship between a person capable of it and such an amiable man as Mr. Bingley was incomprehensible. She grew absolutely ashamed of herself. Of neither Darcy nor Wickham could she think without feeling she had been blind, partial, prejudiced, absurd. "'How despicably I have acted!' she cried. "'I, who have prided myself on my discernment, I, who have valued myself on my abilities. From herself to Jane, from Jane to Bingley, her thoughts were in a line, which soon brought to her recollection that Mr. Darcy's explanation there had appeared very insufficient, and she read it again. Widely different was the effect of the second perusal. How could she deny that credit to his assertions, in one instance, which she had been obliged to give in the other. He declared himself to be totally unsuspicious of her sister's attachment, and she could not help remembering what Charlotte's opinion had always been. Neither could she deny the justice of his description of Jane. She felt that Jane's feelings, though fervent, were little displayed, and that there was a constant complacency in her air and manner, not often united with great sensibility. When she came to that part of the letter in which her family were mentioned in terms of such mortifying, yet merited reproach, her sense of shame was severe. The justice of the charge struck her too forcibly for denial, and the circumstances to which he particularly alluded as having passed at the Netherfield Ball, and as confirming all his first disapprobation, could not have made a stronger impression on his mind than on hers. The compliment to herself and her sister was not unfelt. It soothed, but it could not console her for the contempt which had thus been self-attracted by the rest of her family, and as she considered that Jane's disappointment had in fact been the work of her nearest relations, and reflected how materially the credit of both must be hurt by such impropriety of conduct, she felt depressed beyond anything she had ever known. After wandering along the lane for two hours, giving way to every variety of thought, reconsidering events, determining probabilities, and reconciling herself, as well as she could, to a change so sudden and so important, fatigue and a recollection of her long absence made her at length return home. 
and she entered the house with the wish of appearing cheerful as usual, and the resolution of repressing such reflections as must make her unfit for conversation. She was immediately told that the two gentlemen from Rosings had each called during her absence, Mr. Darcy only for a few minutes to take leave, but that Colonel Fitzwilliam had been sitting with them at least an hour, hoping for her return, and almost resolving to walk after her till she could be found. Elizabeth could but just affect concern in missing him. She really rejoiced at it. Colonel Fitzwilliam was no longer an object. She could think only of her letter. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 The two gentlemen left Rosings the next morning, and Mr. Collins, having been in waiting near the lodges to make them his parting obeisance, was able to bring home the pleasing intelligence of their appearing in very good health and in as tolerable spirits as could be expected, after the melancholy scene so lately gone through at Rosings. To Rosings he then hastened to console Lady Catherine and her daughter, and on his return brought back with great satisfaction a message from her ladyship, importing that she felt herself so dull as to make her very desirous of having them all to dine with her. Elizabeth could not see Lady Catherine without recollecting that, had she chosen it, she might by this time have been presented to her as her future niece, nor could she think without a smile of what her ladyship's indignation would have been. What would she have said? How would she have behaved? were questions with which she amused herself. Their first subject was the diminution of the Rosings' party. I assure you I feel it exceedingly, said Lady Catherine. I believe no one feels the loss of friends as much as I do, but I am particularly attached to these young men, and know them to be so much attached to me. They were excessively sorry to go, but so they always are. The dear Colonel rallied his spirits tolerably till just at last, but Darcy seemed to feel it more acutely, I think, than last year. His attachment to Rosing certainly increases. Mr. Collins had a compliment and an allusion to throw in here, which were kindly smiled on by the mother and daughter. Lady Catherine observed after dinner that Miss Bennet seemed out of spirits, and immediately accounted for it by herself, by supposing that she did not like to go home again so soon, she added. But if that is the case, you must write to your mother and beg that you may stay a little longer. Mrs. Collins will be very glad of your company, I am sure. I am much obliged to your ladyship for your kind invitation, replied Elizabeth, but it is not in my power to accept it. I must be in town next Saturday. Why, at that rate, you will have been here only six weeks. I expected you to stay two months. I told Mrs. Collins so before you came. There can be no occasion for your going so soon. Mrs. Bennet could certainly spare you for another fortnight. But my father cannot. He wrote last week to hurry my return. Oh, your father, of course, may spare you if your mother can. Daughters are never of so much consequence to a father, and if you will stay another month complete, it will be in my power to take one of you as far as London, for I am going there early in June for a week, and as Dawson does not object to the barouche box, there will be very good room for one of you, and indeed, if the weather should happen to be cool, I should not object to taking you both, as you are neither of you large. You are all kindness, ma'am, but I believe we must abide by our original plan." Lady Catherine seemed resigned. Mrs. Collins, you must send a servant for them. You know I always speak my mind, and I cannot bear the idea of two young women travelling post by themselves. It is highly improper. You must contrive to send somebody. I have the greatest dislike in the world to that sort of thing. Young women should always be properly guarded and attended, according to their situation in life. When my niece Georgina went to Ramsgate last summer, I made a point of having two men-servants go with her. 
Miss Darcy, the daughter of Mr. Darcy of Pemberley and Lady Anne, could not have appeared with propriety in a different manner. I am excessively attentive to all those things. You must send John with the young ladies, Mrs. Collins. I am glad it occurred to me to mention it, for it would really be discreditable to you to let them go alone. My uncle is to send a servant for us. Oh, your uncle? He keeps a man-servant, does he? I am very glad you have somebody who thinks of these things. Where shall you change horses? Oh, Bromley, of course. If you mention my name at the bell, you will be attended to. Lady Catherine had many other questions to ask respecting their journey, and as she did not answer them all herself, attention was necessary, which Elizabeth believed to be lucky for her. Or with a mind so occupied, she might have forgotten where she was. Reflection must be reserved for solitary hours. Whenever she was alone, she gave way to it as the greatest relief. And not a day went by without a solitary walk, in which she might indulge in all the delight of unpleasant recollections. Mr. Darcy's letter she was in a fair way of soon knowing by heart. She studied every sentence, and her feelings towards its writer were at times widely different. When she remembered the style of his address, she was still full of indignation. But when she considered how unjustly she had condemned and upbraided him, her anger was turned against herself, and his disappointed feelings became the object of compassion. His attachment excited gratitude, his general character respect, but she could not approve him, nor could she for a moment repent her refusal or feel the slightest inclination ever to see him again. In her own past behavior, there was a constant source of vexation and regret, and in the unhappy defects of her family a subject of yet heavier chagrin. They were hopeless of remedy. Her father, contented with laughing at them, would never exert himself to restrain the wild giddiness of his youngest daughters and her mother, with manners so far from right herself, was entirely insensible to the evil. Elizabeth had frequently united with Jane in an endeavour to check the imprudence of Catherine and Lydia, but while they were supported by their mother's indulgence, what chance could there be for, of improvement? Catherine, weak-spirited, irritable, and completely under Lydia's guidance, had always been affronted by their advice, and Lydia, self-willed and careless, would scarcely give them a hearing. They were ignorant, idle, and vain. While there was an officer in Meryton, they would flirt with him, and while Meryton was within a walk of Longbourn, they would be going there for ever. Anxiety on Jane's behalf was another prevailing concern, and Mr. Darcy's explanation, by restoring Bingley to all her former good opinion, heightened the sense of what Jane had lost. His affection was proved to have been sincere, and his conduct cleared of all blame, unless any could attach to the implicitness of his confidence in his friend. How grievous, then, was the thought that, of a situation so desirable in every respect, so replete with advantage, so promising for her happiness, Jane had been deprived by the folly and indecorum of her own family." When to these recollections was added the development of Wickham's character, it may be easily believed that the happy spirits, which had seldom been depressed before, were now so much affected as to make it impossible for her to appear tolerably cheerful. Their engagements at Rosings were as frequent during the last week of her stay as they had been at first. The very last evening was spent there, and her ladyship again inquired minutely into the particulars of their journey, gave them directions as to the best method of packing, and was so urgent on the necessity of placing gowns in the only right way, that Maria thought herself obliged on her return to undo all the work of the morning and pack her trunk afresh. 
When they parted, Lady Catherine, with great condescension, wished them a good journey, and invited them to come to Hunsford again next year and Miss de Bourgh exerted herself so far as to curtsy and hold out her hand to both. End of chapter 37 Ben, Ben, Ben This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Crowther Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapter 38 On Saturday morning, Elizabeth and Mr. Collins met for breakfast a few minutes before the others appeared, and he took the opportunity of paying the parting civilities which he deemed indispensably necessary. "'I know not, Miss Elizabeth,' said he, "'whether Mrs. Collins has yet expressed her sense of your kindness in coming to us,' but I am very certain you will not leave the house without receiving her thanks for it. The favour of your company has been much felt, I assure you. We know how little there is to tempt any one in our humble abode, our plain manner of living, our small rooms and few domestics, and the little we see of the world must make Hunsford extremely dull to a young lady like yourself, but I hope you will believe us grateful for the condescension." and that we have done everything in our power to prevent your spending your time unpleasantly. Elizabeth was eager with her thanks and assurances of happiness. She had spent six weeks with great enjoyment, and the pleasure of being with Charlotte and the kind attentions she had received must make her feel the obliged. Mr. Collins was gratified, and with more smiling solemnity replied, it gives me great pleasure to hear that you have passed your time not disagreeably. We have certainly done our best, and most fortunately having it in our power to introduce you to very superior society, and from our connections with Rosings, the frequent means of varying the humble home scene, I think we may flatter ourselves that your Hunsford visit cannot have been entirely irksome. Our situation with regard to Lady Catherine's family is indeed the sort of extraordinary advantage and blessing which few can boast. You see on what a footing we are. You see how continually we are engaged there. In truth, I must acknowledge that with all the disadvantages of this humble parsonage, I should not think any one abiding in it an object of compassion while they are sharers of our intimacy at Rosings. Words were insufficient for the elevation of his feelings, and he was obliged to walk about the room while Elizabeth tried to unite civility and truth in a few short sentences. "'You may, in fact, carry a very favourable report of us into Hertfordshire, my dear cousin. I flatter myself, at least, that you will be able to do so. Lady Catherine's great attentions to Mrs. Collins you have been a daily witness of, and altogether I trust it does not appear that your friend has drawn an unfortunate, but on this point it will be as well to be silent. Only let me assure you, my dear Elizabeth, that I can from my heart most cordially wish you equal felicity in marriage. My dear Charlotte and I have but one mind and one way of thinking— there is in everything a most remarkable resemblance of character and ideas between us. We seem to have been designed for each other. Elizabeth could safely say that it was a great happiness where that was the case, and with equal sincerity could add that she firmly believed and rejoiced in his domestic comforts. She was not sorry, however, to have the recital of them interrupted by the lady from whom they sprang. Poor Charlotte! It was melancholy to leave her to such society. But she had chosen it with her eyes open, and though evidently regretting that her visitors were to go, she did not seem to ask for compassion. Her home and her housekeeping, her parish and her poultry, and all their dependent concerns had not yet lost their charms. At length the chaise arrived, the trunks were fastened on, the parcels placed within, and it was pronounced to be ready. 
After an affectionate parting between the friends, Elizabeth was attended to the carriage by Mr. Collins, and as they walked down the garden he was commissioning her with his best respects to all her family, not forgetting his thanks for the kindness he had received at Longburn in the winter, and his compliments to Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner, though unknown. He then handed her in, Maria followed, and the door was on the point of being closed, when he suddenly reminded them, with some consternation, that they had hitherto forgotten to leave any messages for the ladies at Rosings. But, he added, you will of course wish to have your humble respects delivered to them, with your grateful thanks for their kindness to you while you have been here. Elizabeth made no objection. The door was then allowed to be shut, and the carriage drove off. "'Good gracious!' cried Maria, after a few minutes' silence. "'It seems but a day or two since we first came, and yet how many things have happened!' "'A great many, indeed,' said her companion with a sigh. "'We have dined nine times at Rosings, besides drinking tea there twice. How much I shall have to tell!' Elizabeth added privately and how much I shall have to conceal. Their journey was performed without much conversation or any alarm, and within four hours of their leaving Hunsford they reached Mr. Gardiner's house, where they were to remain a few days. Jane looked well, and Elizabeth had little opportunity of studying her spirits amidst the various engagements which the kindness of her aunt had reserved for them. But Jane was to go home with her, and at Longbourn there would be leisure enough for observation. It was not without an effort, meanwhile, that she could wait even for Longbourn, before she told her sister of Mr. Darcy's proposals. To know that she had the power of revealing what would so exceedingly astonish Jane, and must at the same time so highly gratify whatever of her own vanity she had not yet been able to reason away, was such a temptation to openness as nothing could have been conquered but the state of indecision in which she remained as to the extent of what she should communicate, and her fear if she once entered on the subject of being hurried into repeating something of Bingley which might only grieve her sister further. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 it was the second week in May in which the three young ladies set out together from Gracechurch Street for the town in Hertfordshire, and as they drew near the approved inn where Mr. Bennet's carriage was to meet them, they quickly perceived, in token of the coachman's punctuality, both Kitty and Lydia looking out of a dining-room upstairs. These two girls had been above an hour in the place, happily employed in visiting an opposite milliner, watching the sentinel on guard, and dressing a salad and cucumber. After welcoming their sisters, they triumphantly displayed a table set out with such cold meat as an inn larder usually affords, exclaiming, Is this not nice? Is not this an agreeable surprise? And we mean to treat you all, added Lydia, but you must lend us the money, for we have just spent ours at the shop out there. Then, showing her purchases, Look here, I have bought this bonnet. I do not think it is very pretty, but I thought I might as well buy it as not. I shall pull it to pieces as soon as I get home, and see if I can make it up any better. And when her sisters abused it as ugly, she added with perfect unconcern, Oh, but there were two or three much uglier in the shop. And when I have bought some prettier colored satin to trim it with, fresh, I think it will be very tolerable. Besides, it will not much signify what one wears this summer, after the militia have left Meryton, and they are going in a fortnight. Are they indeed? cried Elizabeth, with great satisfaction. They are going to be encamped near Brighton, and I do so want Papa to take us there for the summer. It would be such a delicious scheme, and I dare say would cost hardly anything at all. Mamma would like to go too, of all things. Only think what a miserable summer else we shall have. Yes, thought Elizabeth, that would be a delightful scheme indeed, and completely do for us at once. Good heaven! 
Brighton and a whole campful of soldiers to us who have been overset already by one poor regiment of militia and the monthly balls of Meryton. Now I have got some news for you, said Lydia, as they sat down at the table. What do you think? It is excellent news, capital news, and about a certain person we all like. Jane and Elizabeth looked at each other, and the waiter was told he need not stay. Lydia laughed and said, "'Aye, that is just like your formality and discretion. You thought the waiter must not hear as if he cared. I dared say he often hears worse things said than what I am going to say. But he is an ugly fellow. I am glad he is gone. I never saw such a long chin in my life. Well, but now for my news. It is about dear Wickham. Too good for the waiter, is it not?' There is no danger of Wickham's marrying Mary King. There's for you. She has gone down to her uncle at Liverpool, gone to stay. Wickham is safe. And Mary King is safe, added Elizabeth, safe from a connection imprudent as to fortune. She is a great fool for going away if she liked him. But I am sure there is no strong attachment on either side, said Jane. I am sure there is not on his. I will answer for it. He never cared three straws about her. Who could about such a nasty little freckled thing? Elizabeth was shocked to think that, however incapable of such coarseness of expression herself, the coarseness of the sentiment was little other than her own breast had harbored and fancied liberal. As soon as all had ate, and the elder ones paid, the carriage was ordered, and after some contrivance the whole party, with all their boxes, work-bags, and parcels, and the unwelcome addition of Kitty's and Lydia's purchases, were seated in it. "'How nicely we are all crammed in!' cried Lydia. "'I am glad I bought my bonnet, if it is only for the fun of having another bandbox. Well, now, let us be quite comfortable and snug, and talk and laugh all the way home. And in the first place, let us hear what has happened to you all since you went away. Have you seen any pleasant men? Have you had any flirting? I was in great hopes that one of you would have got a husband before you came back. Jane will be quite an old maid soon, I declare. She is almost twenty-three. Lord, how ashamed I should be of not being married before twenty and three. My Aunt Phillips wants you so to get husbands. You can't think. She says Lizzie had better have taken Mr. Collins, and I do not think there would have been any fun in it. Lord, how I should like to be married before any of you, and then I would chaperone you about to all the balls. Dear me, we had such a good piece of fun the other day at Colonel Foster's. Kitty and me were to spend the day there, and Mrs. Foster promised to have a little dance in the evening. By the by, Mrs. Foster and me are such friends. And so she asked the two Harringtons to come, but Harriet was ill, and so Penn was forced to come by herself, and then what do you think we did? We dressed up Chamberlain's in women's clothes on purpose to pass for a lady. Only think what fun! Not a soul knew of it but Colonel and Mrs. Foster and Kitty and me, except my aunt, for we were forced to borrow one of her gowns, and you could not imagine how well he looked. When Denny and Wickham and Pratt and two or three more of the men came in, they did not know him in the least. Lord, how I laughed! And so did Mrs. Foster. I thought I should have died. And that made the men suspect something, and then they soon found out what was the matter. With such kinds of histories of their parties and good jokes, did Lydia, assisted by Kitty's hints and additions, endeavour to amuse her companions all the way to Longbourn. Elizabeth listened as little as she could, but there was no escaping the frequent mention of Wickham's name. Their reception at home was most kind. Mrs. Bennet rejoiced to see Jane in undiminished beauty, and more than once during dinner did Mr. Bennet say voluntary to Elizabeth, I am glad you are back, Lizzie. Their party in the dining room was large, for almost all the Lucases came to meet Maria and hear the news, and various were the subjects that occupied them. Lady Lucas was inquiring of Maria after the welfare and poultry of her eldest daughter, 
Mrs. Bennet was doubly engaged, on one hand collecting an account of the present fashions from Jane, who sat way below her, and on the other retailing them all to the younger Lucases and Lydia, in a voice louder than any other person's, was enumerating the various pleasures of the morning to anybody who would hear her. "'Oh, Mary,' said she, "'I wish you had gone with us, for we had such fun. As we went along, Kitty and I drew up the blinds and pretended there was nobody in the coach, and I should have gone so all the way if Kitty had not been sick, and when we got to the George I do think we behaved very handsomely, for we treated the other three with the nicest cold luncheon in the world, and you, if you would have gone, we would have treated you too, and then when we came away it was such fun. I thought we never should have got into the coach. I was ready to die of laughter, and then we were so merry all the way home. We talked and laughed so loud that anybody might have heard us ten miles off. To this Mary very gravely replied, Far be it from me, my dear sister, to depreciate such pleasures. They would doubtless be congenial with the generality of female minds, but I confess they would have no charms for me. I should infinitely prefer a book. But all of this answer Lydia heard not a word. She seldom listened to anybody for more than half a minute, and never attended to Mary at all. In the afternoon Lydia was urgent with the rest of the girls to walk to Meryton and to see how everybody went on. But Elizabeth steadily opposed the scheme. It should not be said that the Miss Bennets could not be home half a day before they were in pursuit of the officers. There was another reason, too, for her opposition. She dreaded seeing Mr. Wickham again, and was resolved to avoid it as long as possible. The comfort to her of the regiment's approaching removal was indeed beyond expression. In a fortnight they were to go, and once gone she hoped there could be nothing more to plague her on his account. She had not been many hours at home before she found that the Brighton scheme, of which Lydia had given them a hint at the inn, was under frequent discussion between her parents. Elizabeth saw directly that her father had not the smallest intention of yielding, but his answers were at the same time so vague and equivocal that her mother, though often disheartened, had never yet despaired of succeeding at the last. End of chapter 39 9 9 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. L i b r i v o x. dot o r g. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Pride and Prejudice. By Jane Austen. Chapter 40 Elizabeth's impatience to acquaint Jane with what had happened could no longer be overcome, and at length, resolving to suppress every particular in which her sister was concerned, and preparing her to be surprised, she related to her the next morning the chief of the scene between Mr. Darcy and herself. Miss Bennet's astonishment was soon lessened by the strong sisterly partiality which made any admiration of Elizabeth appear perfectly natural and all surprise was shortly lost in other feelings. She was sorry that Mr. Darcy should have delivered his sentiments in a manner so little suited to recommend them, but still more was she grieved for the unhappiness which her sister's refusal must have given him. "'His being so sure of succeeding was wrong,' said she, "'and certainly ought not to have appeared. But consider how much it must increase his disappointment.' Indeed, replied Elizabeth, I am heartily sorry for him, but he has other feelings, which will probably soon drive away his regard for me. You do not blame me, however, for refusing him. Blame you? Oh, no! But you blame me for having spoken so warmly of Wickham? No, I do not know that you were wrong in saying what you did. But you will know it when I tell you what happened the very next day. 
She then spoke of the letter, repeating the whole of its contents as far as they concerned George Wickham. What a stroke this was for poor Jane, who would willingly have gone through the world without believing that so much wickedness existed in the whole race of mankind as was here collected in one individual. Nor was Darcy's vindication, though grateful to her feelings, capable of consoling her for such discovery. Most earnestly did she labour to prove the probability of error, and seek to clear the one without involving the other. "'This will not do,' said Elizabeth. "'You never will be able to make both of them good for anything. Take your choice, but you must be satisfied with only one. There is but such a quantity of merit between them, just enough to make one good sort of man, and of late it has been shifting about pretty much. For my part I am inclined to believe it all Darcy's, but you shall do as you choose." It was some time, however, before a smile could be extorted from Jane. "'I do not know when I have been more shocked,' said she. "'Wickham! So very bad! It is almost past belief. And poor Mr. Darcy! Dear Lizzy, only consider what he must have suffered! Such a disappointment, and with the knowledge of your ill opinion, too, and having to relate such a thing of his sister, it is really too distressing. I am sure you must feel it so. Oh, no, my regret and compassion are all done away by seeing you so full of both. I know you will do him such ample justice that I am growing every moment more unconcerned and indifferent. Your profusion makes me saving, and if you lament over him much longer my heart will be as light as a feather. Poor Wickham! There is such an expression of goodness in his countenance, such an openness and gentleness in his manner. There certainly was some great mismanagement in the education of those two young men. One has got all the goodness, and the other all the appearance of it. I never thought Mr. Darcy so deficient in the appearance of it as you used to do. And yet... I meant to be uncommonly clever in taking so decided a dislike to him, without any reason. It is such a spur to one's genius, such an opening for wit, to have a dislike of that kind. One may be continually abusive without saying anything just, but one cannot always be laughing at a man without now and then stumbling on something witty. Lizzie. When you first read that letter, I am sure you could not treat the matter as you do now. Indeed, I could not. I was uncomfortable enough, I may say, unhappy, and with no one to speak to about what I felt, no Jane to comfort me and say that I had not been so very weak and vain and nonsensical as I knew I had. Oh, how I wanted you! How unfortunate that you should have used such very strong expressions in speaking of Wickham to Mr. Darcy, for now they do appear wholly undeserved. Certainly. But the misfortune of speaking with bitterness is a most natural consequence of the prejudices I had been encouraging. There is one point on which I want your advice. I want to be told whether I ought or ought not, to make our acquaintances in general understand Wickham's character. Miss Bennet paused a little, and then replied, Surely there can be no occasion for exposing him so dreadfully. What is your opinion? That it ought not to be attempted. Mr. Darcy has not authorized me to make his communication public. On the contrary, Every particular relative to his sister was meant to be kept as much as possible to myself, and if I endeavour to undeceive people as to the rest of his conduct, who will believe me? The general prejudice against Mr. Darcy is so violent that it would be the death of half the good people in Meryton to attempt to place him in an amiable light. I am not equal to it. 
Wickham will soon be gone, and therefore it will not signify to any one here what he really is. Sometime hence it will be all found out, and we may laugh at their stupidity in not knowing it before. At present I will say nothing about it. You are quite right. To have his errors made public might ruin him for ever. He is now, perhaps, sorry for what he has done, and anxious to re-establish a character. We must not make him desperate. The tumult of Elizabeth's mind was allayed by this conversation. She had got rid of two of the secrets which had weighed on her for a fortnight, and was certain of a willing listener in Jane, whenever she might wish to talk again of either. But there was still something lurking behind, of which prudence forbade the disclosure. She dared not relate the other half of Mr. Darcy's letter, nor explain to her sister how sincerely she had been valued by her friend. Here was knowledge in which no one could partake, and she was sensible that nothing less than a perfect understanding between the parties could justify her in throwing off this last encumbrance of mystery. And then, said she, if that very improbable event should ever take place, I shall merely be able to tell what Bingley may tell in a much more agreeable manner himself. The liberty of communication cannot be mine till it has lost all its value. She was now, on being settled at home, at leisure to observe the real state of her sister's spirits. Jane was not happy. She still cherished a very tender affection for Bingley. Having never even fancied herself in love before, her regard had all the warmth of first attachment, and from her age and disposition greater steadiness than most first attachments often boast and so fervently did she value his remembrance, and prefer him to every other man, that all her good sense, and all her attention to the feelings of her friends, were requisite to check the indulgence of those regrets which must have been injurious to her own health, and their tranquillity. "'Well, Lizzie,' said Mrs. Bennet one day, "'what is your opinion now of this sad business of Jane's?' For my part, I am determined never to speak of it again to anybody. I told my sister Philip so the other day. But I cannot find out that Jane saw anything of him in London. Well, he is a very undeserving young man, and I do not suppose there is the least chance in the world of her ever getting him now. There is no talk of his coming to Netherfield again in the summer, and I have inquired of everybody, too, who is likely to know." I do not believe he will ever live at Netherfield any more. Oh, well, it is just as he chooses. Nobody wants him to come, though I shall always say he used my daughter extremely ill, and if I was her I would not have put up with it. Well, my comfort is I am sure Jane will die of a broken heart, and then he will be sorry for what he has done. But as Elizabeth could not receive comfort from any such expectation, she made no answer. "'Well, Lizzie,' continued her mother soon afterwards, "'and so the Collinses live very comfortably, do they? Well, well, I only hope it will last. And what sort of table do they keep? Charlotte is an excellent manager, I dare say. If she is half as sharp as her mother, she is saving enough.' There is nothing extravagant in their house, I dare say. No, nothing at all. A great deal of good management, depend upon it. Yes, yes, they will take care not to outrun their income. They will never be distressed for money. Well, much good may it do them. And so I suppose they often talk of having long born when your father is dead. They look upon it quite as their own, I dare say, whenever that happens. It was a subject which they could not mention before me. No, it would have been strange if they had, but I make no doubt they often talk of it between themselves. Well, if they can be easy with an estate that is not lawfully their own, so much the better. I should be ashamed of having one that was only entailed on me. 
End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 The first week of their return was soon gone. The second began. It was the last of the regiment's stay in Meryton, and all the young ladies in the neighborhood were drooping apace. The dejection was almost universal. The elder Miss Bennets alone were still able to eat, drink, and sleep, and pursue the usual course of their employments. Very frequently were they reproached for this insensibility by Kitty and Lydia, whose own misery was extreme, and who could not comprehend such hard-heartedness in any of the family. "'Good heaven! What is to become of us? What are we to do?' would they often exclaim in the bitterness of woe, "'How can you be smiling so, Lizzie?' Their affectionate mother shared all their grief. She remembered what she had herself endured on a similar occasion, five and twenty years ago. "'I am sure,' said she, "'I cried for two days together when Colonel Miller's regiment went away. I thought I should have broken my heart.' "'I am sure I shall break mine,' said Lydia." "'If one could but go to Brighton,' observed Mrs. Bennet. "'Oh, yes, if one could but go to Brighton. But Papa is so disagreeable. A little sea-bathing would set me up forever. And my Aunt Phillips is sure it would do me a great deal of good,' added Kitty. Such were the kind of lamentations resounding perpetually through Longbourn House. Elizabeth tried to be diverted by them but all sense of pleasure was lost in shame. She felt anew the justice of Mr. Darcy's objections, and never had she been so much disposed to pardon his interference in the views of his friend. But the gloom of Lydia's prospect was shortly cleared away, for she received an invitation from Mrs. Forster, the wife of the colonel of the regiment, to accompany her to Brighton. This invaluable friend was a very young woman, and very lately married. A resemblance in good humor and good spirits had recommended her and Lydia to each other, and out of their three months' acquaintance they had been intimate, too. The rapture of Lydia on this occasion, her adoration of Mrs. Forster, the delight of Mrs. Bennet, and the mortification of Kitty, are scarcely to be described. Wholly inattentive to her sister's feelings, Lydia flew about the house in restless ecstasy, calling for everyone's congratulations, and laughing and talking with more violence than ever, whilst the luckless Kitty continued in the parlour, repined at her fate, in terms as unreasonable as her accent was peevish. I cannot see why Mrs. Forster should not ask me as well as Lydia, said she, though I am not her particular friend. I have just as much right to be asked as she has, and more too, for I am two years older. In vain did Elizabeth attempt to make her reasonable, and Jane to make her resigned. As for Elizabeth herself, this invitation was so far from exciting in her the same feelings as in her mother and Lydia that she considered it as the death-warrant of all possibility of common sense for the latter, and detestable as such a step must make her were it known, she could not help secretly advising her father not to let her go. She represented to him all the improprieties of Lydia's general behaviour, the little advantage she could derive from the friendship of such a woman as Mrs. Forster, and the probability of her being yet more imprudent with such a companion at Brighton, where the temptations must be greater than at home. He heard her attentively, and then said, "'Lydia will never be easy until she has exposed herself in some public place or other, and we can never expect her to do it with so little expense or inconvenience to her family as under the present circumstances.' "'If you were aware,' said Elizabeth, of the very great disadvantage to us all which must arise from the public notice of Lydia's unguarded and imprudent manner, nay, which has already arisen from it, I am sure you would judge differently in the affair. "'Already arisen?' repeated Mr. Bennet. "'What, has she frightened away some of your lovers?' "'Poor little Lizzie!' 
but do not be cast down. Such squeamish youths as cannot bear to be connected with a little absurdity are not worth a regret. Come, let me see the list of pitiful fellows who have been kept aloof by Lydia's folly. Indeed, you are mistaken. I have no such injuries to resent. It is not of particular but of general evils which I am now complaining. Our importance, our respectability in the world, must be affected by the wild volatility, the assurance and disdain of all restraint which mark Lydia's character. Excuse me, for I must speak plainly. If you, my dear father, will not take the trouble of checking her exuberant spirits, and of teaching her that her present pursuits are not to be the business of her life, she will soon be beyond the reach of amendment. Her character will be fixed, and she will at sixteen be the most determined flirt that ever made herself or her family ridiculous. A flirt, too, in the worst and meanest degree of flirtation without any attraction beyond youth and a tolerable person, and, from the ignorance and emptiness of her mind, wholly unable to ward off any portion of that universal contempt which her rage for admiration will excite. In this danger Kitty also is comprehended. She will follow wherever Lydia leads. Vain, ignorant, idle, and absolutely uncontrolled, Oh, my dear father, can you suppose it possible that they will not be censured and despised wherever they are known, and that their sisters will not be often involved in the disgrace? Mr. Bennet saw that her whole heart was in the subject, and affectionately, taking her hand, said in reply, Do not make yourself uneasy, my love. Wherever you and Jane are known, you must be respected and valued and you will not appear to less advantage for having a couple of, or I may say three, very silly sisters. We shall have no peace at Longbourn if Lydia does not go to Brighton. Let her go, then. Colonel Forster is a sensible man, and will keep her out of any real mischief. And she is luckily too poor to be an object of prey to anybody. At Brighton she will be of less importance even as a common flirt than she has been here. The officers will find women better worth their notice. Let us hope, therefore, that her being there may teach her her own insignificance. At any rate, she cannot grow many degrees worse without authorizing us to lock her up for the rest of her life. With this answer Elizabeth was forced to be content. But her own opinion continued the same, and she left him disappointed and sorry. It was not in her nature, however, to increase her vexations by dwelling on them. She was confident of having performed her duty, and to fret over unavoidable evils, or augment them by anxiety, was no part of her disposition. Had Lydia and her mother known the substance of her conference with her father, their indignation would hardly have found expression in their united volubility. In Lydia's imagination, a visit to Brighton comprised every possibility of earthly happiness. She saw, with the creative eye of fancy, the streets of that gay bathing place covered with officers. She saw herself, the object of attention, to tens and to scores of them at present unknown. She saw all the glories of the camp, its tents, stretched forth in beauteous uniformity of lines, crowded with the young and the gay, and dazzling with scarlet. And to complete the view, she saw herself seated beneath a tent, tenderly flirting with at least six officers at once. Had she known her sister sought to tear her from such prospects and such realities as these, what would have been her sensations? they could have been understood only by her mother, who might have felt nearly the same. Lydia's going to Brighton was all that consoled her, for her melancholy conviction of her husband's never intending to go there himself. But they were entirely ignorant of what had passed, and their raptures continued, with little intermission, to the very day of Lydia's leaving home. Elizabeth was now to see Mr. Wickham for the last time, Having been frequently in company with him since her return, agitation was pretty well over. The agitations of formal partiality entirely so. 
She had even learnt to detect, in the very gentleness which had first delighted her, an affectation and a sameness to disgust and weary. In his present behaviour to herself, moreover, she had a fresh source of displeasure, for the inclination he soon testified of renewing those intentions which had marked the early part of their acquaintance could only serve, after what had since passed, to provoke her. She lost all concern for him in finding herself thus selected as the object of such idle and frivolous gallantry, and while she steadily repressed it, could not but feel the reproof contained in his believing that however long and for whatever cause his attentions had been withdrawn, her vanity would be gratified and her preference secured at any time by their renewal. On the very last day of the regiment's remaining at Meryton, he dined with other of the officers at Longbourn. And so little was Elizabeth disposed to part from him in good humour, that on his making some inquiry as to the manner in which her time had passed at Hunsford, she mentioned Colonel Fitzwilliam's and Mr. Darcy's having both spent three weeks at Rosings, and asked him if he was acquainted with the former. He looked surprised, displeased, alarmed, but with a moment's recollection and a returning smile, replied that he had formerly seen him often, and after observing that he was a very gentlemanly-like man, asked her how she had liked him. Her answer was warmly in his favour. With an air of indifference he soon afterwards added, "'How long did you say he was at Rosings?' "'Nearly three weeks.' "'And you saw him frequently?' "'Yes, almost every day. "'His manners are very different from his cousins.' "'Yes, very different. "'But I think Mr. Darcy improves upon acquaintance.' "'Indeed!' cried Mr. Wickham with a look which did not escape her. And pray, may I ask? But checking himself, he added in a gayer tone, Is it in address that he improves? Has he dined to add aught of civility to his ordinary style? For I dare not hope, he continued in a lower and more serious tone, that he is improved in essentials. Oh, no, said Elizabeth. In essentials? I believe he is very much what he ever was." While she spoke, Wickham looked as if, scarcely knowing whether to rejoice over her words, or to distrust their meaning. There was a something in her countenance which made him listen with an apprehensive and anxious attention while she added, "'When I said that he improved on acquaintance, I did not mean that his mind or his manners were in a state of improvement, but that from knowing him better, his disposition was better understood. Wickham's alarm now appeared in a heightened complexion and agitated look. For a few minutes he was silent, till shaking off his embarrassment he turned to her again and said in the gentlest of accents, "'You, who so well know my feeling toward Mr. Darcy, will readily comprehend how sincerely I must rejoice that he is wise enough to assume even the appearance of what is right. His pride in that direction may be of service, if not to himself, to many others, for it must only deter him from such foul misconduct as I have suffered by. I only fear that the sort of cautionness to which you, I imagine, have been alluding, is merely adopted on his visits to his aunt, of which good opinion and judgment he stands much in awe, his fear of her has always operated, I know, when they were together, and a good deal is to be imputed to his wish of forwarding the match with Miss de Bourgh, which I am certain he has very much at heart." Elizabeth could not repress a smile at this, but she answered only by a slight inclination of the head. She saw that he wanted to engage her on the old subject of his grievances, and she was in no humour to indulge him. The rest of the evening passed with the appearance, on his side, of useful cheerfulness, but with no further attempt to distinguish Elizabeth, and they parted at last with mutual civility, and possibly a mutual desire of never meeting again. 
When the party broke up, Lydia returned with Mrs. Forster to Meryton, from whence they were to set out early the next morning. The separation between her and her family was rather noisy than pathetic. Kitty was the only one who shed tears, but she did weep from vexation and envy. Mrs. Bennet was diffuse in her good wishes for the felicity of her daughter, and impressive in her injunctions that she should not miss the opportunity of enjoying herself as much as possible, advice which there was every reason to believe would be well attended to. And in the clamorous happiness of Lydia herself, in bidding farewell, the more gentle adieus of her sisters were uttered without being heard. End of chapter 41This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Chapters 42 and 43. Chapter 42. Had Elizabeth's opinion been all drawn from her own family, she could not have formed a very pleasing opinion of conjugal felicity or domestic comfort. Her father, captivated by youth and beauty, and that appearance of good humour which youth and beauty generally give, had married a woman whose weak understanding and illiberal mind had very early in their marriage put an end to all real affection for her. Respect, esteem, and confidence had vanished for ever, and all his views of domestic happiness were overthrown. But Mr. Bennet was not of a disposition to seek comfort for the disappointment which his own imprudence had brought on, in any of those pleasures which too often console the unfortunate for their folly or their vice. He was fond of the country and of books, and from these tastes had arisen his principal enjoyments. To his wife he was very little otherwise indebted than as her ignorance and folly had contributed to his amusement. This is not the sort of happiness which a man would in general wish to owe to his wife, but where other powers of entertainment are wanting, the true philosopher will derive benefit from such as are given. Elizabeth, however, had never been blind to the impropriety of her father's behaviour as a husband. She had always seen it with pain, but respecting his abilities, and grateful for his affectionate treatment of herself, she endeavoured to forget what she could not overlook, and to banish from her thoughts that continual breach of conjugal obligation and decorum, which, in exposing his wife to the contempt of her own children, was so highly reprehensible. But she had never felt so strongly as now the disadvantages which must attend the children of so unsuitable a marriage, nor ever been so fully aware of the evils arising from so ill-judged a direction of talents, talents which, rightly used, might at least have preserved the respectability of his daughters, even if incapable of enlarging the mind of his wife. When Elizabeth had rejoiced over Wickham's departure, she found little other cause for satisfaction in the loss of the regiment. Their parties abroad were less varied than before, and at home she had a mother and sister whose constant repinings at the dullness of everything around them threw a real gloom over their domestic circle. And, though Kitty might in time regain her natural degree of sense, since the disturbers of her brain were removed, her other sister, from whose disposition greater evil might be apprehended, was likely to be hardened in all her folly and assurance by a situation of such double danger as a watering-place and a camp. Upon the whole, therefore, she found, what has sometimes been found before, that an event to which she had been looking with impatient desire did not, in taking place, bring all the satisfaction she had promised herself. It was consequently necessary to name some other period for the commencement of actual felicity, to have some other point on which her wishes and hopes might be fixed, and by again enjoying the pleasure of anticipation, console herself for the present, and prepare for another disappointment. 
Her tour to the lakes was now the object of her happiest thoughts. It was her best consolation for all the uncomfortable hours which the discontentedness of her mother and Kitty made inevitable. And could she have included Jane in the scheme, every part of it would have been perfect. But it is fortunate, thought she, that I have something to wish for. Were the whole arrangement complete, my disappointment would be certain, but here, by carrying with me one ceaseless source of regret in my sister's absence, I may reasonably hope to have all my expectations of pleasure realized. A scheme of which every part promises delight can never be successful, and general disappointment is only warded off by the defence of some little peculiar vexation. When Lydia went away she promised to write very often and very minutely to her mother and Kitty, but her letters were always long expected, and always very short. Those to her mother contained little else than that they were just returned from the library, where such and such officers had attended them, and where she had seen such beautiful ornaments as made her quite wild. That she had a new gown or a new parasol, which she would have described more fully, but was obliged to leave off in a violent hurry, as Mrs. Forster called her, and they were going off to the camp. And from her correspondence with her sister, there was still less to be learnt, for her letters to Kitty, though rather longer, were much too full of lines under the words to be made public. After the first fortnight or three weeks of her absence, health, good humour, and cheerfulness began to reappear at Longbourn. Everything wore a happier aspect. The families who had been in town for the winter came back again, and summer finery and summer engagements arose. Mrs. Bennet was restored to her usual querulous serenity, and, by the middle of June, Kitty was so much recovered as to be able to enter Meryton without tears, an event of such happy promise as to make Elizabeth hope that, by the following Christmas, she might be so tolerably reasonable as not to mention an officer above once a day, unless, by some cruel and malicious arrangement at the war office, another regiment should be quartered in Meryton. The time fixed for the beginning of their northern tour was now fast approaching, and a fortnight only was wanting of it, when a letter arrived from Mrs. Gardiner, which at once delayed its commencement and curtailed its extent. Mr. Gardiner would be prevented by business from setting out till a fortnight later in July, and must be in London again within a month. And as that left too short a period for them to go so far and see so much as they had proposed, or at least to see it with the leisure and comfort they had built on, they were obliged to give up the lakes and substitute a more contracted tour, and, according to the present plan, were to go no farther northwards than Derbyshire. In that county there was enough to be seen to occupy the chief of their three weeks, and to Mrs. Gardiner it had a peculiarly strong attraction. The town where she had formerly passed some years of her life, and where they were now to spend a few days, was probably as great an object of her curiosity as all the celebrated beauties of Matlock, Chatsworth, Dovedale, or the Peak. Elizabeth was excessively disappointed. She had set her heart on seeing the lakes, and still thought there might have been time enough. But it was her business to be satisfied, and certainly her temper to be happy, and all was soon right again. With the mention of Derbyshire there were many ideas connected. It was impossible for her to see the word without thinking of Pemberley and its owner. But surely, said she, I may enter his county without impunity, and rob it of a few petrified spars without his perceiving me. The period of expectation was now doubled. Four weeks were to pass away before her uncle and aunt's arrival. But they did pass away and Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner, with their four children, did at length appear at Longbourn. The children, two girls of six and eight years old, and two younger boys, were to be left under the particular care of their cousin Jane, who was the general favourite, and whose steady sense and sweetness of temper exactly adapted her for attending to them in every way, teaching them, playing with them, and loving them. 
The gardeners stayed only one night at Longbourn, and set off the next morning with Elizabeth in pursuit of novelty and amusement. One enjoyment was certain, that of suitableness of companions, a suitableness which comprehended health and temper to bear inconveniences, cheerfulness to enhance every pleasure, and affection and intelligence which might supply it among themselves if there were disappointments abroad. It is not the object of this work to give a description of Derbyshire, nor of any of the remarkable places through which their route thither lay. Oxford, Blenheim, Warwick, Kenilworth, Birmingham, etc., are sufficiently known. A small part of Derbyshire is all the present concern. To the little town of Lambton, the scene of Mrs. Gardiner's former residence, and where she had lately learned some acquaintance still remained, they bent their steps. After having seen all the principal wonders of the country, and within five miles of Lambton, Elizabeth found from her aunt that Pemberley was situated. It was not in their direct road, nor more than a mile or two out of it. In talking over their route the evening before, Mrs. Gardiner expressed an inclination to see the place again. Mr. Gardiner declared his willingness, and Elizabeth was applied to for her approbation. "'My love, should you not like to see a place of which you have heard so much?' said her aunt. "'A place, too, with which so many of your acquaintances are connected. Wickham passed all his youth there, you know.' Elizabeth was distressed. She felt that she had no business at Pemberley, and was obliged to assume a disinclination for seeing it. She must own that she was tired of seeing great houses— after going over so many, she really had no pleasure in fine carpets or satin curtains. Mrs. Gardiner abused her stupidity. "'If it were merely a fine house richly furnished,' said she, "'I should not care about it myself, but the grounds are delightful. They have some of the finest woods in the country.' Elizabeth said no more, but her mind could not acquiesce. The possibility of meeting Mr. Darcy while viewing the place instantly occurred. It would be dreadful. She blushed at the very idea, and thought it would be better to speak openly to her aunt than to run such a risk. But against this there were objections, and she finally resolved that it could be the last resource if her private inquiries to the absence of the family were unfavourably answered. Accordingly, when she retired at night, she asked the chambermaid whether Pemberley were not a very fine place, what was the name of its proprietor, and, with no little alarm, whether the family were down for the summer. A most welcome negative followed the last question, and her alarms now being removed, she was at leisure to feel a great deal of curiosity to see the house herself, and when the subject was revived the next morning— and she was again applied to, could readily answer, and with a proper air of indifference, that she had not really any dislike to the scheme. To Pemberley, therefore, they were to go. End of chapter 42 Chapter 43 Elizabeth, as they drove along, watched for the first appearance of Pemberley Woods with some perturbation, and when at length they turned in at the lodge, her spirits were in a high flutter. The park was very large, and contained great variety of ground. They entered it in one of its lowest points, and drove for some time through a beautiful wood stretching over a wide extent. Elizabeth's mind was too full for conversation, but she saw and admired every remarkable spot and point of view. They gradually ascended for half a mile, and then found themselves at the top of a considerable eminence, where the wood ceased, and the eye was instantly caught by Pemberley House, situated on the opposite side of a valley, into which the road, with some abruptness, wound. It was a large, handsome stone building, standing well on rising ground, and backed by a ridge of high woody hills, and in front a stream of some natural importance was swelled into greater, but without any artificial appearance. Its banks were neither formal nor falsely adorned. Elizabeth was delighted. She had never seen a place for which nature had done more, or where natural beauty had been so little counteracted by an awkward taste. 
they were all of them warm in their admiration, and at that moment she felt that to be mistress of Pemberley might be something. They descended the hill, crossed the bridge, and drove to the door, and, while examining the nearer aspect of the house, all her apprehension of meeting its owner returned. She dreaded lest the chambermaid had been mistaken. On applying to see the place they were admitted into the hall, and Elizabeth, as they waited for the housekeeper, had leisure to wonder at her being where she was. The housekeeper came, a respectable-looking elderly woman, much less fine and more civil than she had any notion of finding her. They followed her into the dining parlour. It was a large, well-proportioned room, handsomely fitted up. Elizabeth, after slightly surveying it, went to a window to enjoy its prospect. The hill, crowned with wood, which they had descended, receiving increased abruptness from the distance, was a beautiful object. Every disposition of the ground was good, and she looked on the whole scene, the river, the trees scattered on its banks, and the winding of the valley as far as she could trace it, with delight. As they passed into other rooms these objects were taking different positions, but from every window there were beauties to be seen. The rooms were lofty and handsome, and their furniture suitable to the fortune of its proprietor, but Elizabeth saw, with admiration of his taste, that it was neither gaudy nor uselessly fine, with less of splendour and more real elegance than the furniture of Rosings. "'And of this place,' thought she, "'I might have been mistress. With these rooms I might now have been familiarly acquainted. Instead of viewing them as a stranger, I might have rejoiced in them as my own, and welcomed to them as visitors my uncle and aunt. But no.' recollecting herself. That could never be. My uncle and aunt would have been lost to me. I should not have been allowed to invite them. This was a lucky recollection. It saved her from something very like regret. She longed to inquire of the housekeeper whether her master was really absent, but had not the courage for it. At length, however, the question was asked by her uncle, and she turned away with alarm, while Mrs. Reynolds replied that he was, adding, "'But we expect him to-morrow, with a large party of friends.' How rejoiced was Elizabeth that their own journey had not by any circumstance been delayed a day. Her aunt now called her to look at a picture. She approached and saw the likeness of Mr. Wickham, suspended, amongst several other miniatures, over the mantelpiece. Her aunt asked her, smilingly, how she liked it. The housekeeper came forward and told them it was a picture of a young gentleman, the son of her late master's steward, who had been brought up by him at his own expense. "'He is now gone into the army,' she added. "'But I am afraid he has turned out very wild.' Mrs. Gardiner looked at her niece with a smile, but Elizabeth could not return it. "'And that,' said Mrs. Reynolds, pointing to another of the miniatures, is my master, and very like him. It was drawn at the same time as the other, about eight years ago. "'I have heard much of your master's fine person,' said Mrs. Gardiner, looking at the picture. "'It is a handsome face, but, Lizzie, you can tell us whether it is like or not.' Mrs. Reynolds' respect for Elizabeth seemed to increase on this intimation of her knowing her master. "'Does that young lady know Mr. Darcy?' Elizabeth coloured, and said, "'A little.' "'And do you not think him a very handsome gentleman, ma'am?' "'Yes, very handsome.' "'I am sure I know none so handsome, but in the gallery upstairs you will see a finer, larger picture of him than this. This room was my late master's favourite room, and these miniatures are just as they used to be then. He was very fond of them.' This accounted to Elizabeth for Mr. Wickham's being among them. Mrs. Reynolds then directed their attention to one of Miss Darcy, drawn when she was only eight years old. "'And is Miss Darcy as handsome as her brother?' said Mrs. Gardiner. "'Oh, yes, the handsomest young lady that ever was seen, and so accomplished. She plays and sings all day long. 
In the next room is a new instrument just come down for her, a present from my master. She comes here to-morrow with him. Mr. Gardiner, whose manners were very easy and pleasant, encouraged her communicativeness by his questions and remarks. Mrs. Reynolds, either by pride or attachment, had evidently great pleasure in talking of her master and his sister. "'Is your master much at Pemberley in the course of the year?' "'Not so much as I could wish, sir, but I dare say he may spend half his time here, and Miss Darcy is always down for the summer months.' except thought elizabeth when she goes to ramsgate if your master would marry you might see more of him yes sir but i do not know when that will be i do not know who is good enough for him mr and mrs gardiner smiled elizabeth could not help saying it is very much to his credit i am sure that you should think so "'I say no more than the truth, and everybody will say that knows him,' replied the other. Elizabeth thought this was going pretty far, and she listened with increasing astonishment, as the housekeeper added, "'I have never known a cross word from him in my life, and I have known him ever since he was four years old.' This was praise of all others most extraordinary, most opposite to her ideas." that he was not a good-tempered man had been her firmest opinion. Her keenest attention was awakened. She longed to hear more, and was grateful to her uncle for saying, "'There are very few people of whom so much can be said. You are lucky in having such a master.' "'Yes, sir, I know I am. If I were to go through the world I could not meet with a better. But I have always observed that they who are good-natured when children are good-natured when they grow up and he was always the sweetest-tempered, most generous-hearted boy in the world. Elizabeth almost stared at her. "'Can this be Mr. Darcy?' thought she. "'His father was an excellent man,' said Mrs. Gardiner. "'Yes, ma'am, that he was indeed, and his son will be just like him, just as affable to the poor.' Elizabeth listened, wondered, doubted, and was impatient for more. Mrs. Reynolds could interest her on no other point. She related the subjects of the pictures, the dimensions of the rooms, and the price of the furniture in vain. Mr. Gardiner, highly amused by the kind of family prejudice to which he attributed her excessive commendation of her master, soon led again to the subject, and she dwelt with energy on his many merits as they proceeded together up the great staircase." "'He is the best landlord and the best master,' said she, "'that ever lived, not like the wild young men nowadays "'who think of nothing but themselves. "'There is not one of his tenants or servants "'but will give him a good name. "'Some people call him proud, "'but I am sure I never saw anything of it. "'To my fancy it is only because he does not rattle away "'like other young men.' "'In what an amiable light does this place him?' thought Elizabeth. "'This fine account of him,' whispered her aunt as they walked, "'is not quite consistent with his behaviour to our poor friend. "'Perhaps we might be deceived. "'That is not very likely. Our authority was too good.' "'On reaching the spacious lobby above they were shown into a very pretty sitting-room, "'lately fitted up with greater elegance and lightness than the apartments below, "'and were informed that it was but just done to give pleasure to Miss Darcy, who had taken a liking to the room when last at Pemberley. "'He is certainly a good brother,' said Elizabeth, as she walked towards one of the windows. Mrs. Reynolds anticipated Miss Darcy's delight when she should enter the room. "'And this is always the way with him,' she added. "'Whatever can give his sister any pleasure is sure to be done in a moment. There is nothing he would not do for her.' The picture-gallery and two or three of the principal bedrooms were all that remained to be shown. In the former were many good paintings, but Elizabeth knew nothing of the art, and from such as had been already visible below she had willingly turned to look at some drawings of Miss Darcy's, in crayons, whose subjects were usually more interesting, and also more intelligible. 
In the gallery there were many family portraits, but they could have little to fix the attention of a stranger. Elizabeth walked in quest of the only face whose features would be known to her. At last it arrested her, and she beheld a striking resemblance to Mr. Darcy, with such a smile over the face as she remembered to have sometimes seen when he looked at her. She stood several minutes before the picture, in earnest contemplation, and returned to it again before they quitted the gallery. Mrs. Reynolds informed them that it had been taken in his father's lifetime. There was certainly at this moment in Elizabeth's mind a more gentle sensation towards the original than she had ever felt at the height of their acquaintance. The commendation bestowed on him by Mrs. Reynolds was of no trifling nature. What praise is more valuable than the praise of an intelligent servant? As a brother, a landlord, a master, she considered how many people's happiness were in his guardianship. How much of pleasure and pain was it in his power to bestow? How much of good or evil must be done by him? Every idea that had been brought forward by the housekeeper was favourable to his character, and as she stood before the canvas on which he was represented, and fixed his eyes upon herself, she thought of his regard with a deeper sentiment of gratitude than it had ever raised before. She remembered its warmth, and softened its impropriety of expression. When all of the house that was open to general inspection had been seen, they returned downstairs, and, taking leave of the housekeeper, were consigned over to the gardener, who met them at the hall door. As they walked across the hall towards the river, Elizabeth turned back to look again. Her uncle and aunt stopped also, and while the former was conjecturing as to the date of the building, the owner of it himself suddenly came forward from the road which led behind it to the stables. They were within twenty yards of each other, and so abrupt was his appearance that it was impossible to avoid his sight. Their eyes instantly met, and the cheeks of both were overspread with the deepest blush. He absolutely started, and for a moment seemed immovable from surprise, but shortly recovering himself, advanced towards the party, and spoke to Elizabeth, if not in terms of perfect composure, at least of perfect civility. She had instinctively turned away, but stopping on his approach, received his compliments with an embarrassment impossible to be overcome. Had his first appearance, or his resemblance to the picture they had just been examining, been insufficient to assure the other two that they now saw Mr. Darcy, the gardener's expression of surprise on beholding his master must immediately have told it. They stood a little aloof while he was talking to their niece, who, astonished and confused, scarcely dared lift her eyes to his face, and knew not what answer she returned to his civil inquiries after her family. Amazed at the alteration of his manner since they last parted, every sentence that he uttered was increasing her embarrassment, and every idea of the impropriety of her being found there recurring to her mind, the few minutes in which they continued were some of the most uncomfortable in her life. Nor did he seem much more at ease. When he spoke his accent had none of its usual sedateness, and he repeated his inquiries as to the time of her having left Longbourn, and of her having stayed in Derbyshire so often, and in so hurried a way, as plainly spoke the distraction of his thoughts. At length every idea seemed to fail him, and— after standing a few moments without saying a word, he suddenly recollected himself and took leave. The others then joined her, and expressed admiration of his figure, but Elizabeth heard not a word, and, wholly engrossed by her own feelings, followed them in silence. She was overpowered by shame and vexation. Her coming there was the most unfortunate, the most ill-judged thing in the world. How strange it must appear to him! In what a disgraceful light might it not strike so vain a man! It might seem as if she had purposely thrown herself in his way again. Oh, why did she come? Or why did he thus come a day before he was expected? Had they been only ten minutes sooner, they should have been beyond the reach of his discrimination. For it was plain that he was that moment arrived, that moment alighted from his horse or his carriage. 
she blushed again and again over the perverseness of the meeting. And his behaviour, so strikingly altered, what could it mean? That he should even speak to her was amazing, but to speak with such civility, to inquire after her family. Never in her life had she seen his manners so little dignified, never had he spoken with such gentleness as on this unexpected meeting. What a contrast did it offer to his last address in Rosings Park, when he put his letter into her hand! She knew not what to think, or how to account for it. They had now entered a beautiful walk by the side of the water, and every step was bringing forward a nobler fall of ground, or a finer reach of the woods to which they were approaching. But it was some time before Elizabeth was sensible of any of it, and— though she answered mechanically to the repeated appeals of her uncle and aunt, and seemed to direct her eyes to such objects as they pointed out, she distinguished no part of the scene. Her thoughts were all fixed on that one spot of Pemberley House, whichever it might be, where Mr. Darcy then was. She longed to know what at the moment was passing in his mind, in what manner he thought of her, and whether— in defiance of everything, she was still dear to him. Perhaps he had been civil only because he felt himself at ease. Yet there had been that in his voice which was not like ease. Whether he had felt more of pain or of pleasure in seeing her, she could not tell, but he certainly had not seen her with composure. At length, however, the remarks of her companions on her absence of mind aroused her, and she felt the necessity of appearing more like herself. They entered the woods, and, bidding adieu to the river for a while, ascended some of the higher grounds, when, in spots where the opening of the trees gave the eye power to wander, were many charming views of the valley, the opposite hills, with the long range of woods overspreading many, and occasionally part of the stream. Mr. Gardiner expressed a wish of going round the whole park, but feared it might be beyond a walk. With a triumphant smile they were told that it was ten miles round. It settled the matter, and they pursued the accustomed circuit, which brought them again, after some time, in a descent among hanging woods to the edge of the water, and one of its narrowest parts. They crossed it by a simple bridge, in character with the general air of the scene, it was a spot less adorned than any they had yet visited, and the valley, here contracted into a glen, allowed room only for the stream, and a narrow walk amidst the rough coppice-wood which bordered it. Elizabeth longed to explore its windings, but when they had crossed the bridge, and perceived their distance from the house, Mrs. Gardiner, who was not a great walker, could go no farther, and thought only of returning to the carriage as quickly as possible. Her niece was, therefore, obliged to submit, and they took their way towards the house on the opposite side of the river, in the nearest direction, but their progress was slow, for Mr. Gardiner, though seldom able to indulge the taste, was very fond of fishing, and was so much engaged in watching the occasional appearance of some trout in the water, and talking to the man about them, that he advanced but little. Whilst wandering on in this slow manner they were again surprised, and Elizabeth's astonishment was quite equal to what it had been at first, by the sight of Mr. Darcy, approaching them, and at no great distance. The walk here being less sheltered than on the other side, allowed them to see him before they met. Elizabeth, however astonished, was at least more prepared for an interview than before, and resolved to appear, and to speak with calmness, if he really intended to meet them. For a few moments, indeed, she felt that he would probably strike into some other path. The idea lasted while a turning in the walk concealed him from their view. The turning passed, he was immediately before them. With a glance she saw that he had lost none of his recent civility, and, to imitate his politeness, she began, as they met, to admire the beauty of the place. But she had not got beyond the words, delightful, and charming, when some unlucky recollections obtruded, and she fancied that praise of Pemberley from her might be mischievously construed, her colour changed, and she said no more. Mrs. Gardiner was standing a little behind, and on her pausing 
he asked her if she would do him the honour of introducing him to her friends. This was a stroke of civility for which she was quite unprepared, and she could hardly suppress a smile at his being now seeking the acquaintance of some of those very people against whom his pride had revolted in his offer to herself. "'What will be his surprise,' thought she, "'when he knows who they are? He takes them now for people of fashion.' The introduction, however, was immediately made, and as she named their relationship to herself she stole a sly look at him, to see how he bore it, and was not without the expectation of his decamping as fast as he could from such disgraceful companions. That he was surprised by the connection was evident. He sustained it, however, with fortitude, and so far from going away, turned back with them, and entered into conversation with Mr. Gardiner. Elizabeth could not but be pleased, could not but triumph. It was consoling that he should know she had some relations for whom there was no need to blush. She listened most attentively to all that passed between them, and gloried in every expression, every sentence of her uncle which marked his intelligence, his taste, or his good manners. The conversation soon turned upon fishing, and she heard Mr. Darcy invite him, with the greatest civility, to fish there as often as he chose, while he continued in the neighbourhood, offering at the same time to supply him with fishing-tackle, and pointing out those parts of the stream where there was usually most sport. Mrs. Gardiner, who was walking arm in arm with Elizabeth, gave her a look expressive of wonder. Elizabeth said nothing, but it gratified her exceedingly. The compliment must be all for herself." Her astonishment, however, was extreme, and continually was she repeating, "'Why is he so altered? From what can it proceed? It cannot be for me. It cannot be for my sake that his manners are thus softened. My reproofs at Hunsford could not work such a change as this. It is impossible that he should still love me.' After walking some time in this way, the two ladies in front, the two gentlemen behind, on resuming their places, after descending to the brink of the river for the better inspection of some curious water-plant, there chanced to be a little alteration. It originated in Mrs. Gardiner, who, fatigued by the exercise of the morning, found Elizabeth's arm inadequate to her support, and consequently preferred her husband's. Mr. Darcy took her place by her niece, and they walked on together. After a short silence the lady first spoke. She wished him to know that she had been assured of his absence before she came to the place, and accordingly began by observing that his arrival had been very unexpected. "'For your housekeeper,' she added, "'informed us that you would certainly not be here till to-morrow, and, indeed, before we left Bakewell we understood that you were not immediately expected in the country.' He acknowledged the truth of it all, and said that business with his steward had occasioned his coming forward a few hours before the rest of the party with whom he had been travelling. "'They will join me early to-morrow,' he continued, "'and among them are some who will claim an acquaintance with you, Mr. Bingley and his sisters.' Elizabeth answered only by a slight bow. Her thoughts were instantly driven back to the time when Mr. Bingley's name had been the last mentioned between them, and— if she might judge by his complexion, his mind was not very differently engaged. "'There is also one other person in the party,' he continued after a pause, "'who more particularly wishes to be known to you. Will you allow me, or do I ask too much, to introduce my sister to your acquaintance during your stay at Lambton?' The surprise of such an application was great indeed. It was too great for her to know in what manner she acceded to it. She immediately felt that whatever desire Miss Darcy might have of being acquainted with her must be the work of her brother, and without looking farther it was satisfactory. It was gratifying to know that his resentment had not made him think really ill of her. They now walked on in silence, each of them deep in thought. Elizabeth was not comfortable. That was impossible but she was flattered and pleased. His wish of introducing his sister to her was a compliment of the highest kind. They soon outstripped the others, and when they had reached the carriage, Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner were half a quarter of a mile behind. 
He then asked her to walk into the house, but she declared herself not tired, and they stood together on the lawn. At such a time much might have been said, and silence was very awkward. She wanted to talk, but there seemed to be an embargo on every subject. At last she recollected that she had been travelling, and they talked of Matlock and Dovedale with great perseverance. Yet time and her aunt moved slowly, and her patience and her ideas were nearly worn out before the tete-a-tete was over. On Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner's coming up they were all pressed to go into the house and take some refreshment, but this was declined, and they parted on each side with utmost politeness. Mr. Darcy handed the ladies into the carriage, and when it drove off Elizabeth saw him walking slowly towards the house. The observations of her uncle and aunt now began, and each of them pronounced him to be infinitely superior to anything they had expected. "'He is perfectly well-behaved, polite, and unassuming,' said her uncle. "'There is something a little stately in him, to be sure,' replied her aunt. "'but it is confined to his air, and is not unbecoming. "'I can now say with the housekeeper that, "'though some people may call him proud, "'I have seen nothing of it. "'I was never more surprised than by his behaviour to us. "'It was more than civil. "'It was really attentive, "'and there was no necessity for such attention. "'His acquaintance with Elizabeth was very trifling.' "'To be sure, Lizzie,' said her aunt, "'he is not so handsome as Wickham, or rather... He has not Wickham's countenance, for his features are perfectly good. But how came you to tell me that he was so disagreeable? Elizabeth excused herself as well as she could, said that she had liked him better when they had met in Kent than before, and that she had never seen him so pleasant as this morning. But perhaps he may be a little whimsical in his civilities, replied her uncle. Your great men often are, and therefore I shall not take him at his word, as he might change his mind another day and warn me off his grounds. Elizabeth felt that they had entirely misunderstood his character, but said nothing. "'From what we have seen of him,' continued Mrs. Gardiner, "'I really should not have thought that he could have behaved in so cruel a way by anybody as he has done by poor Wickham. He has not an ill-natured look. On the contrary, there is something pleasing about his mouth when he speaks.' and there is something of dignity in his countenance that would not give one an unfavourable idea of his heart. But, to be sure, the good lady who showed us his house did give him a most flaming character. I could hardly help laughing aloud sometimes. But he is a liberal master, I suppose, and that, in the eye of a servant, comprehends every virtue. Elizabeth here felt herself called on to say something in vindication of his behaviour to Wickham, and therefore gave them to understand, in as guarded a manner as she could, that by what she had heard from his relations in Kent, his actions were capable of a very different construction, and that his character was by no means so faulty, nor Wickham's so amiable, as they had been considered in Hertfordshire. In confirmation of this, she related the particulars of all the pecuniary transactions in which they had been connected, without actually naming her authority, but stating it to be such as might be relied on. Mrs. Gardiner was surprised and concerned, but as they were now approaching the scene of her former pleasures, every idea gave way to the charm of recollection, and she was too much engaged in pointing out to her husband all the interesting spots in its environs to think of anything else. Fatigued as she had been by the morning's walk, they had no sooner dined than she set off again in quest of her former acquaintance, and the evening was spent in the satisfactions of an intercourse renewed after many years' discontinuance. The occurrences of the day were too full of interest to leave Elizabeth much attention for any of these new friends, and she could do nothing but think, and think with wonder, of Mr. Darcy's civility, and, above all, of his wishing her to be acquainted with his sister. End of chapter 43 Read by Kara Schallenberg on December 17, 2005, in Oceanside, California.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Mark Bradford. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter 44. Elizabeth had settled it that Mr. Darcy would bring his sister to visit her the very day after her reaching Pemberley, and was consequently resolved not to be out of sight of the inn the whole of that morning. But her conclusion was false, for on the very morning after their arrival at Lambton these visitors came. They had been walking about the place with some of their new friends, and were just returning to the inn to dress themselves for dining with the same family, when the sound of a carriage drew them to a window, and they saw a gentleman and a lady in a curricle driving up the street. Elizabeth, immediately recognizing the livery, guessed what it meant, and imparted no small degree of her surprise to her relations by acquainting them with the honor which she expected. Her uncle and aunt were all amazement, and the embarrassment of her manner, as she spoke, joined to the circumstance itself, and many of the circumstances of the preceding day, opened to them a new idea on the business. Nothing had ever suggested it before, but they felt that there was no other way of accounting for such attentions from such a quarter than by supposing a partiality for their niece. While these newly-born notions were passing in their heads, the perturbation of Elizabeth's feelings was at every moment increasing. She was quite amazed at her own discomposure, but amongst other causes of disquiet, she dreaded lest the partiality of the brother should have said too much in her favour, and, more than commonly anxious to please, she naturally suspected that every power of pleasing would fail her. She retreated from the window, fearful of being seen, and as she walked up and down the room, endeavouring to compose herself, saw such looks of inquiring surprise in her uncle and aunt as made everything worse. Miss Darcy and her brother appeared, and this formidable introduction took place. With astonishment did Elizabeth see that her new acquaintance was at least as much embarrassed as herself. Since her being at Lambton, she had heard that Miss Darcy was exceedingly proud, but the observation of a very few minutes convinced her that she was only exceedingly shy. She found it difficult to obtain even a word from her beyond a monosyllable. Miss Darcy was tall, and on a larger scale than Elizabeth, and, though little more than sixteen, her figure was formed, and her appearance womanly and graceful. She was less handsome than her brother, but there was sense and good humour in her face, and her manners were perfectly unassuming and gentle. Elizabeth, who had expected to find in her as acute and unembarrassed an observer as ever Mr. Darcy had been, was much relieved by discerning such different feelings. They had not long been together before Mr. Darcy told her that Bingley was also coming to wait on her, and she had barely time to express her satisfaction and prepare for such a visitor, when Bingley's quick step was heard on the stairs, and in a moment he entered the room. All Elizabeth's anger against him had been long done away, but had she still felt any, it could hardly have stood its ground against the unaffected cordiality with which he expressed himself on seeing her again. He inquired in a friendly, though general, way after her family, and looked and spoke with the same good-humoured ease that he had ever done. To Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner he was scarcely a less interesting personage than to herself. They had long wished to see him. The whole party before them, indeed, excited a lively attention. The suspicions which had just arisen of Mr. Darcy and their niece directed their observation towards each with an earnest, though guarded, inquiry, and they soon drew from those inquiries the full conviction that one of them, at least, knew what it was to love. Of the ladies' sensations they remained a little in doubt, but that the gentleman was overflowing with admiration was evident enough. Elizabeth, on her side, had much to do. She wanted to ascertain the feelings of each of her visitors. She wanted to compose her own and to make herself agreeable to all, and in the latter object, where she feared most to fail, she was most sure of success, for those to whom she endeavoured to give pleasure were prepossessed in her favour. Bingley was ready, Georgiana was eager, and Darcy determined to be pleased. 
In seeing Bingley her thoughts naturally flew to her sister, and, oh, how ardently did she long to know whether any of his were directed in a like manner. Sometimes she could fancy that he talked less than on former occasions, and once or twice pleased herself with the notion that, as he looked at her, he was trying to trace a resemblance. But, though this might be imaginary, she could not be deceived as to his behaviour to Miss Darcy, who had been set up as a rival to Jane. No look appeared on either side that spoke particular regard. Nothing occurred between them that could justify the hopes of his sister. On this point she was soon satisfied, and two or three little circumstances occurred ere they parted, which, in her anxious interpretation, denoted a recollection of Jane not untinctured by tenderness, and a wish of saying more that might lead to the mention of her, had he dared. He observed to her, at a moment when the others were talking together, and in a tone which had something of real regret, that it was a very long time since he had had the pleasure of seeing her. And, before she could reply, he added, "'It is above eight months. We have not met since the twenty-sixth of November, when we were all dancing together at Netherfield.' Elizabeth was pleased to find his memory so exact, and he afterwards took occasion to ask her, when unattended to by any of the rest, whether all her sisters were at Longbourn. There was not much in the question, nor in the preceding remark, but there was a look and a manner which gave them meaning. It was not often that she could turn her eyes on Mr. Darcy himself, but whenever she did catch a glimpse, she saw an expression of general complaisance and in all that he said she heard an accent so removed from hauteur or disdain of his companions as convinced her that the improvement of manners which she had yesterday witnessed, however temporary its existence might prove, had at least outlived one day. When she saw him thus seeking the acquaintance and courting the good opinion of people with whom any intercourse a few months ago would have been a disgrace, when she saw him thus civil not only to herself but to the very relations whom he had openly disdained, and recollected their last lively scene in Hunsford Parsonage. The difference, the change, was so great, and struck so forcibly on her mind, that she could hardly restrain her astonishment from being visible. Never, even in the company of his dear friends at Netherfield, or his dignified relations at Rosings, had she seen him so desirous to please, so free from self-consequence or unbending reserve, as now, when no importance could result from the success of his endeavours and when even the acquaintance of those to whom his attentions were addressed would draw down the ridicule and censure of the ladies, both of Netherfield and Rosings. Their visitor stayed with them above half an hour, and when they arose to depart, Mr. Darcy called on his sister to join him in expressing their wish of seeing Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner and Miss Bennet to dinner at Pemberley before they left the country. Miss Darcy, though with a diffidence which marked her little in the habit of giving invitations, readily obeyed. Mrs. Gardiner looked at her niece, desirous of knowing how she, whom the invitation most concerned, felt disposed as to its acceptance, but Elizabeth had turned away her head. Presuming, however, that this studied avoidance spoke rather a momentary embarrassment than any dislike of the proposal, and seeing in her husband, who was fond of society, a perfect willingness to accept it, she ventured to engage for her attendance, and the day after the next was fixed on. Bingley expressed great pleasure in the certainty of seeing Elizabeth again, having still a great deal to say to her, and many inquiries to make after all their Hertfordshire friends. Elizabeth, construing all this into a wish of hearing her speak of her sister, was pleased, and on this account, as well as some others, found herself, when their visitors left them, capable of considering the last half-hour with some satisfaction, though while it was passing the enjoyment of it had been little. Eager to be alone, and fearful of inquiries or hints from her uncle and aunt, she stayed with them only long enough to hear their favourable opinion of Bingley, and then hurried away to dress. But she had no reason to fear Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner's curiosity. It was not their wish to force her communication. It was evident that she was much better acquainted with Mr. Darcy than they had before any idea of. It was evident that he was very much in love with her. They saw much to interest but nothing to justify inquiry. Of Mr. Darcy it was now a matter of anxiety to think well, and, as far as their acquaintance reached, there was no fault to find. 
they could not be untouched by his politeness, and had they drawn his character from their own feelings and his servant's report, without any reference to any other account, the circle in Hertfordshire to which he was known would not have recognized it for Mr. Darcy. There was now an interest, however, in believing the housekeeper, and they soon became sensible that the authority of a servant who had known him since he was four years old, and whose own manners indicated respectability, was not to be hastily rejected. Neither had anything occurred in the intelligence of their Lambton friends that could materially lessen its weight. They had nothing to accuse him of but pride. Pride he probably had, and if not, it would certainly be imputed by the inhabitants of a small market town where the family did not visit. It was acknowledged, however, that he was a liberal man, and did much good among the poor. With respect to Wickham, the travellers soon found that he was not held there in much estimation, for though the chief of his concerns with the son of his patron were imperfectly understood, it was yet a well-known fact that, on his quitting Derbyshire, he had left many debts behind him, which Mr. Darcy afterwards discharged. As for Elizabeth, her thoughts were at Pemberley this evening more than the last, and the evening, though as it passed seemed long, was not long enough to determine her feelings towards one in that mansion, and she lay awake two whole hours endeavouring to make them out. She certainly did not hate him. No, hatred had vanished long ago, and she had almost as long been ashamed of ever feeling a dislike against him that could be so called. The respect created by the conviction of his valuable qualities, though at first unwillingly admitted, had for some time ceased to be repugnant to her feeling, and it was now heightened into somewhat of a friendlier nature by the testimony so highly in his favour, and bringing forward his disposition in so amiable a light which yesterday had produced. But above all, above respect and esteem, there was a motive within her of good will which could not be overlooked. It was gratitude. Gratitude, not merely for having once loved her, but for loving her still well enough to forgive all the petulance and acrimony of her manner in rejecting him, and all the unjust accusations accompanying her rejection. He who, she had been persuaded, would avoid her as his greatest enemy, seemed, on this accidental meeting, most eager to preserve the acquaintance, and without any indelicate display of regard, or any peculiarity of manner, where their two selves only were concerned, was soliciting the good opinion of her friends, and bent on making her known to his sister. Such a change in a man of so much pride, exciting not only astonishment but gratitude, for to love, ardent love, it must be attributed, and as such its impression on her was of a sort to be encouraged, as by no means unpleasing, though it could not be exactly defined. She respected, she esteemed, she was grateful to him, she felt a real interest in his welfare, and she only wanted to know how far she wished that welfare to, to depend upon herself, and how far it would be for the happiness of both that she should employ the power, which her fancy told her she still possessed, of bringing on her the renewal of his addresses. It had been settled in the evening between the aunt and the niece that such a striking civility as Miss Darcy's in coming to see them on the very day of her arrival at Pemberley for she had reached it only to a late breakfast, ought to be imitated, though it could not be equalled, by some exertion of politeness on their side, and, consequently, that it would be highly expedient to wait on her at Pemberley the following morning. They were, therefore, to go. Elizabeth was pleased, though when she asked herself the reason, she had very little to say in reply. Mr. Gardiner left them soon after breakfast. The fishing scheme had been renewed the day before, and a positive engagement made of his meeting some of the gentlemen at Pemberley before noon. CHAPTER Forty Five. Convinced, as Elizabeth now was, that Miss Bingley's dislike of her had originated in jealousy, she could not help feeling how unwelcome her appearance at Pemberley must be to her, and was curious to know with how much civility on that lady's side the acquaintance would now be renewed. On reaching the house, they were shown through the hall into the saloon, whose northern aspect rendered it delightful for summer. Its windows, opening to the ground, admitted a most refreshing view of the high woody hills behind the house, and of the beautiful oaks and Spanish chestnuts which were scattered over the intermediate lawn. 
In this house they were received by Miss Darcy, who was sitting there with Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and the lady with whom she lived in London. Georgiana's reception of them was very civil, but attended with all the embarrassment which, though proceeding from shyness and the fear of doing wrong, would easily give to those who felt themselves inferior the belief of her being proud and reserved. Mrs. Gardiner and her niece, however, did her justice, and pitied her. By Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley they were noticed only by a curtsey, and, on their being seated, a pause, awkward as such pauses must always be, succeeded for a few moments. It was first broken by Mrs. Ansley, a genteel, agreeable-looking woman, whose endeavour to introduce some kind of discourse proved her to be more truly well-bred than either of the others, and between her and Mrs. Gardiner, with occasional help from Elizabeth, the conversation was carried on. Miss Darcy looked as if she wished for courage enough to join in it, and sometimes did venture a short sentence when there was least danger of its being heard. Elizabeth soon saw that she was herself closely watched by Miss Bingley, and that she could not speak a word, especially to Miss Darcy, without calling her attention. This observation would not have prevented her from trying to talk to the latter, had they not been seated at an inconvenient distance, but she was not sorry to be spared the necessity of saying much. Her own thoughts were employing her. She expected every moment that some of the gentlemen would enter the room. She wished, she feared, that the master of the house might be amongst them, and whether she wished or feared it most, she could scarcely determine. After sitting in this manner a quarter of an hour without hearing Miss Bingley's voice, Elizabeth was roused by receiving from her a cold inquiry after the health of her family. She answered with equal indifference and brevity, and the others said no more. The next variation which their visit afforded was produced by the entrance of servants, with cold meat, cake, and a variety of all the finest fruits in season. But this did not take place till after many a significant look and smile from Mrs. Ansley to Miss Darcy had been given, to remind her of her post. There was now employment for the whole party, for though they could not all talk, they could all eat, and the beautiful pyramids of grapes, nectarines, and peaches soon collected them round the table. While thus engaged, Elizabeth had a fair opportunity of deciding whether she most feared or wished for the appearance of Mr. Darcy, by the feelings which prevailed on his entering the room. And then, though but a moment before she had believed her wishes to predominate, she began to regret that he came. He had been some time with Mr. Gardiner, who, with two or three other gentlemen from the house, was engaged by the river, and had left him only on learning that the ladies of the family intended a visit to Georgiana that morning. No sooner did he appear than Elizabeth wisely resolved to be perfectly easy and unembarrassed, a resolution the more necessary to be made, but perhaps not the more easily kept, because she saw that the suspicions of the whole party were awakened against them, and that there was scarcely an eye which did not watch his behaviour when he first came into the room. In no countenance was attentive curiosity so strongly marked as in Miss Bingley's, in spite of the smiles which overspread her face whenever she spoke to one of its objects, for jealousy had not yet made her desperate, and her attentions to Mr. Darcy were by no means over. Miss Darcy, on her brother's entrance, exerted herself much more to talk, and Elizabeth saw that he was anxious for his sister and herself to get acquainted, and forwarded, as much as possible, every attempt at conversation on either side. Miss Bingley saw all this likewise, and, in the imprudence of anger, took the first opportunity of saying, with sneering civility, "'Pray, Miss Eliza, are not the Blankshire militia removed from Meryton? They must be a great loss to your family.' In Darcy's presence she dared not mention Wickham's name, but Elizabeth instantly comprehended that he was uppermost in her thoughts, and the various recollections connected with him gave her a moment's distress. But, exerting herself vigorously to repel the ill-natured attack, she presently answered the question in a tolerably detached tone. While she spoke, an involuntary glance showed her Darcy, with a heightened complexion, earnestly looking at her, and his sister overcome with confusion and unable to lift up her eyes. Had Miss Bingley known what pain she was then giving her beloved friend, she undoubtedly would have refrained from the hint but she had merely intended to discompose Elizabeth by bringing forth the idea of a man to whom she believed her partial, to make her betray a sensibility which might injure her in Darcy's opinion, 
and, perhaps, to remind the latter of all the follies and absurdities by which some part of her family were connected with that corps. Not a syllable had ever reached her of Miss Darcy's meditated elopement. To no creature had it been revealed, where secrecy was possible, except to Elizabeth, and from all Bingley's connections her brother was particularly anxious to conceal it, from the very wish which Elizabeth had long ago attributed to him, of their becoming hereafter her own. He had certainly formed such a plan, and without meaning that it should affect his endeavour to separate him from Miss Bennet, it is probable that it might add something to his lively concern for the welfare of his friend. Elizabeth's collected behaviour, however, soon quieted his emotion, and as Miss Bingley, vexed and disappointed, dared not approach nearer to Wickham, Georgiana also recovered in time, though not enough to be able to speak any more. Her brother, whose eye she feared to meet, scarcely recollected her interest in the affair, and the very circumstance which had been designed to turn his thoughts from Elizabeth seemed to have fixed them on her more and more cheerfully. Their visit did not continue long after the question and answer above mentioned, and while Mr. Darcy was attending them to their carriage, Miss Bingley was venting her feelings and criticisms on Elizabeth's person, behaviour, and dress. But Georgiana would not join her. Her brother's recommendation was enough to ensure her favour. His judgment could not err. And he had spoken in such terms of Elizabeth as to leave Georgiana without the power of finding her otherwise than lovely and amiable. When Darcy returned to the saloon, Miss Bingley could not help repeating to him some part of what she had been saying to his sister. "'How very ill Miss Eliza Bennet looks this morning, Mr. Darcy,' she cried. "'I never in my life saw any one so much altered as she is since the winter. She has grown so brown and coarse. Louisa and I were agreeing that we should not have known her again.' However little Mr. Darcy might have liked such an address, he contented himself with coolly replying, that he perceived no other alteration than her being rather tanned, no miraculous consequence of travelling in the summer. "'For my own part,' she rejoined, "'I must confess that I never could see any beauty in her. Her face is too thin, her complexion has no brilliancy, and her features are not at all handsome. Her nose wants character, there is nothing marked in its lines. Her teeth are tolerable, but not out of the common way, and as for her eyes, which have sometimes been called so fine, I could never see anything extraordinary in them. They have a sharp, shrewish look, which I do not like at all, and in her air altogether there is a self-sufficiency without fashion which is intolerable. Persuaded as Miss Bingley was that Darcy admired Elizabeth, this was not the best method of recommending herself. But angry people are not always wise, and in seeing him at last look somewhat nettled, she had all the success she expected. He was resolutely silent, however, and from a determination of making him speak, she continued, "'I remember, when we first knew her in Hertfordshire, how amazed we all were to find that she was a reputed beauty, and I particularly recollect your saying one night, after they had been dining at Netherfield, "'She a beauty! I should as soon call her mother a wit! But afterwards she seemed to improve on you, and I believe you thought her rather pretty at one time.' "'Yes,' replied Darcy, who could contain himself no longer. "'But that was only when I first saw her.' for it is many months since I have considered her as one of the handsomest women of my acquaintance. He then went away, and Miss Bingley was left to all the satisfaction of having forced him to say what gave no one any pain but herself. Mrs. Gardiner and Elizabeth talked of all that had occurred during their visit, as they returned, except what had particularly interested them both. The look and behavior of everybody they had seen were discussed, except of the person who had mostly engaged their attention. They talked of his sister, his friends, his house, his fruit, of everything but himself. Yet Elizabeth was longing to know what Mrs. Gardiner thought of him, and Mrs. Gardiner would have been highly gratified by her niece's beginning the subject. End of chapter 45 Recorded March 4, 2006, in Bishop, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recorded by Aoife Currid. 
Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapters 46 and 47 Chapter 46 Elizabeth had been a good deal disappointed in not finding a letter from Jane on their first arrival at Lambton, and this disappointment had been renewed on each of the mornings that had now been spent there. But on the third her repining was over, and her sister justified, by the receipt of two letters from her at once, on a, one of which was marked that it had been missent elsewhere. Elizabeth was not surprised at it, as Jane had written the direction, remarkably ill. They had just been preparing to walk as the letters came in, and her uncle and aunt, leaving her to enjoy them in quiet, set off by themselves. The one Miss Sent must first be attended to. It had been written five days ago. The beginning contained an account of all their little parties and engagements, with such news as the country afforded. But the latter half, which was dated a day later, and written in evident agitation, gave more important Ill intelligence. It was to this effect. Since writing the above, dearest Lizzie, something has occurred of a most unexpected and serious nature, but I am afraid of alarming you. Be assured that we are all well. What I have to say relates to poor Lydia. An express came at twelve last night, just as we were all gone to bed, from Colonel Forster, to inform us that she was gone off to Scotland with one of his officers, to own the truth with Wickham. Imagine our surprise! To Kitty, however, it does not seem so wholly unexpected. I am very, very sorry, so imprudent a match on both sides. But I am willing to hope the best, and that his character has been misunderstood. Thoughtless and indiscreet, I can easily believe him. But this step, and let us rejoice over it, marks nothing bad at heart. His choice is disinterested at least, for he must know my father can give her nothing. Our poor mother is sadly grieved. My father bears it better. How thankful I am that we never let them know what has been said against him. We must forget it ourselves. They were off Saturday night about twelve, as is conjectured, but were not missed till yesterday morning at eight. The express was sent off directly. My dear Lizzie, they must have passed within ten miles of us. Colonel Forster gives us reason to expect him here soon. Lydia left a few lines for his wife, informing her of their intention. I must conclude, for I cannot be long for my poor mother. I am afraid you will not be able to make it out, but I hardly know what I have written. Without allowing herself time for consideration, and scarcely knowing what she felt, Elizabeth, on finishing this letter, instantly seized the other, and opening it with the utmost impatience, read as follows. It had been written a day later than the conclusion of the first. By this time, my dearest sister, you have received my hurried letter. I wish this may be more intelligible, but though not confined for time, my head is so bewildered that I cannot answer for being coherent. Dearest Lizzie, I hardly know what I would write, but I have bad news for you, and it cannot be delayed. Imprudent as the marriage between Mr. Wickham and our poor Lydia would be, we are now anxious to be assured it has taken place, for there is but too much reason to fear they are not gone to Scotland. Colonel Forster came yesterday, having left Brighton the day before, not many hours after the express. Though Lydia's short letter to Mrs. F. gave them to understand that they were going to Gretna Green, something was dropped by Denny expressing his belief that W. never intended to go there, or to marry Lydia at all, which was repeated to Colonel F., who, instantly taking the alarm, set off from B. intending to trace their route. He did trace them easily to Clapham, but no further for on entering that place they removed into a hackney coach and dismissed the chaise that brought them from epsom all that is known after this that they were seen to continue the london road i know not what to think after making every possible inquiry on that side london colonel f came on into hertfordshire anxiously renewing them at all the turnpikes and at the inns in barnet and hatfield but without any success no such people had been seen to pass through 
With the kindest concern he came on to Longbourn, and broke his apprehensions to us in a manner most creditable to his heart. I am sincerely grieved for him and Mrs. F., but no one can throw any blame on them. Our distress, my dear Lizzy, is very great. My father and mother believe the worst, but I cannot think so ill of him. Many circumstances might make it more eligible for them to be married privately in town than to pursue their first plan, and even if he could form such a design against a young woman of Lydia's connections, which is not likely, can I suppose her so lost to everything? Impossible! I grieve to find, however, that Colonel F. is not disposed to depend upon their marriage. He shook his head when I expressed my hopes, and said he feared W. was not a man to be trusted. My poor mother is really ill and keeps her room. Could she exert herself it would be better, but this is not to be expected. And as to my father, I never in my life saw him so affected. Poor Kitty has anger for having concealed her attachment, but as it was a matter of confidence, one cannot wonder. I am truly glad, dearest Lizzy, that you have been spared something of these distressing scenes. But now, as the first shock is over, I shall own that I long for your return. I am so selfish, however, as to press for it, if inconvenient. Adieu. I take up my pen again to do what I have just told you I would not but circumstances are such that I cannot help earnestly begging you all to come here as soon as possible. I know my dear uncle and aunt so well that I am not afraid of requesting it, though I have still something more to ask of the former. My father is going to London with Colonel Forster instantly to try to discover her. What he means to do I am sure I know not, but his excessive distress will not allow him to pursue any measure in the best and safest way, and Colonel Forster is obliged to be at Brighton again to-morrow evening. In such an exigence, my uncle's advice and assistance would be everything in the world. He will immediately comprehend what I must feel, and I rely upon his goodness. "'Oh, where, where is my uncle?' cried Elizabeth, darting from her seat as she finished the letter, in eagerness to follow him, without losing a moment of the time so precious. But as she reached the door, it was opened by a servant, and Mr. Darcy appeared. Her pale face and impetuous manner made him start, and before he could recover himself to speak, she, in whose mind every idea was superseded by Lydia's situation, hastily exclaimed, "'I beg your pardon, but I must leave you. I must find Mr. Gardiner this moment, on business that cannot be delayed. I have not an instant to lose.' "'Good God! What is the matter?' cried he, with more feeling than politeness. Then, recollecting himself, "'I will not detain you a minute, but let me, or let the servant, go after Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner. You are not well enough. You cannot go yourself.' Elizabeth hesitated, but her knees trembled under her, and she felt how little would be gained by her attempting to pursue them. Calling back the servant, therefore, she commissioned him, though in so breathless an accent as made her almost unintelligible, to fetch his master and mistress home instantly. On his quitting the room she sat down, unable to support herself, and looking so miserably ill that it was impossible for Darcy to leave her, or to refrain from saying, in a tone of gentleness and commiseration, "'Let me call your maid.' Is there nothing you could take to give you present relief? A glass of wine? Shall I get you one? You are very ill. No, I thank you, she replied, endeavouring to recover herself. There is nothing the matter with me. I am quite well. I am only distressed by some dreadful news which I have just received from Longbourn. She burst into tears as she alluded to it, and for a few minutes could not speak another word. Darcy, in wretched suspense, could only say something indistinctly of his concern, and observe her in compassionate silence. At length she spoke again. "'I have just had a letter from Jane, with such dreadful news. It cannot be concealed from any one. My youngest sister has left all her friends, has eloped, has thrown herself into the power of—of of Mr. Wickham. They are gone off together from Brighton. 
"'You know him too well to doubt the rest. "'She has no money, no connections, nothing that can tempt him to. "'She is lost forever.' "'Darcy was fixed in astonishment. "'When I consider,' she added in a yet more agitated voice, "'that I might have prevented it, I, who knew what he was. "'Had I but explained some part of it only, "'some part of what I learnt to my own family.' Had his character been known, this could not have happened. But it is all, all too late now. I am grieved indeed, cried Darcy, grieved, shocked. But is it certain, absolutely certain? Oh, yes, they left Brighton together on Sunday night, and were traced almost to London, but not beyond. They are certainly not gone to Scotland. And what has been done, what has been attempted to recover her? My father has gone to London, and Jane has written to beg my uncle's immediate assistance, and we shall be off, I hope, in half an hour. But nothing can be done. I know very well that nothing can be done. How is such a man to be worked on? How are they even to be discovered? I have not the smallest hope. It is every way horrible. Darcy shook his head in silent acquiescence. When my eyes were open to his real character, oh, had I known what I ought, what I dared to do! But I knew not, I was afraid of doing too much. Wretched, wretched mistake! Darcy made no answer. He seemed scarcely to hear her, and was walking up and down the room in earnest meditation, his brow contracted, his air gloomy. Elizabeth soon observed and instantly understood it. Her power was sinking. Everything must sink under such a proof of family weakness, such an assurance of the deepest disgrace. She could neither wonder nor condemn, but the belief of his self-conquest brought nothing consolatory to her bosom, afforded no palliation of her distress. It was, on the contrary, exactly calculated to make her understand her own wishes and never had she so honestly felt that she could have loved him as now when all love must be vain but self though it would intrude could not engross her lydia the humiliation the misery she was bringing on them all soon swallowed up every private care and covering her face with her handkerchief elizabeth was soon lost to everything else and after a pause of several minutes was only recalled to a sense of her situation by the voice of her companion, who, in a manner which, though it spoke compassion, spoke likewise restraint, said, "'I am afraid you have been long desiring my absence, nor have I anything to plead in excuse of my stay, but a real, though unavailing, concern. Would to heaven that anything could be either said or done, on my part, that might offer consolation to such distress.' But I will torment you not with the vain wishes, which may seem purposely to ask for your thanks. This unfortunate affair will, I fear, prevent my sisters having the pleasure of seeing her at Pemberley to-day. Oh, yes, be so kind as to apologize for us to Miss Darcy. Say that urgent business calls us home immediately. Conceal the unhappy truth as long as it is possible. I know it cannot be long. He readily assured her of his secrecy, again expressed his sorrow for her distress, wished it a happier conclusion than there was at present reason to hope, and, leaving his compliments for her relations, with only one serious, parting look, went away. As he quitted the room, Elizabeth felt how improbable it was that they should ever see each other again on such terms of cordiality as had marked their several meetings in Derbyshire and as she threw a retrospective glance over the whole of their acquaintance, so full of contradictions and varieties, sighed at the perseverance of those feelings which would now have promoted its continuance, and would formerly have rejoiced in its termination. If gratitude and esteem are good foundations of affection, Elizabeth's change of sentiment will be neither improbable nor faulty. But if otherwise, if regard springing from such sources is unreasonable or unnatural, in comparison of what is so often described as arising on a first interview with its object, and even before two words have been exchanged, 
nothing can be said in her defence, except that she had given somewhat of a trial to the latter method in her partiality for Wickham, and that its ill success might, perhaps, authorise her to seek the other less interesting mode of attachment. Be that as it may, she saw him go with regret, and in this early example of what Lydia's infamy must produce, found additional anguish as she reflected on that wretched business. Never, since reading Jane's second letter, had she entertained a hope of Wickham's meaning to marry her. No one but Jane, she thought, could flatter herself with such an expectation. Surprise was the least of her feelings on this development. While the contents of the first letter remained in her mind, she was all surprise, all astonishment, that Wickham should marry a girl whom it was impossible he could marry for money, and how Lydia could ever have attached him had appeared incomprehensible. But now it was all too natural. For such an attachment as this she might have sufficient charms, and though she did not suppose Lydia to be deliberately engaging in an elopement without the intention of marriage, she had no difficulty in believing that neither her virtue nor her understanding would preserve her from falling an easy prey. She had never perceived, while the regiment was in Hertfordshire, that Lydia had any partiality for him, but she was convinced that Lydia wanted only encouragement to attach herself to anybody. Sometimes one officer, sometimes another, had been her favourite, as their attentions raised them in her opinion. Her affections had continually been fluctuating, but never without an object. The mischief of neglect and mistaken indulgence towards such a girl, oh, how acutely did she now feel it! She was wild to be at home, to hear, to see, to be upon the spot to share with Jane in the cares that must now fall wholly upon her, in a family so deranged, a father absent, a mother incapable of exertion and requiring constant attendance, and though almost persuaded that nothing could be done for Lydia, her uncle's interference seemed of the utmost importance, and till he entered the room her impatience was severe. Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner had hurried back in alarm, supposing by the servant's account that their niece was taken suddenly ill. But satisfying them instantly on that head, she eagerly communicated the cause of their summons, reading the two letters aloud and dwelling on the postscript of the last with trembling energy. Though Lydia had never been a favourite with them, Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner could not but be deeply afflicted. Not Lydia only, but all were concerned in it, and after the first exclamations of surprise and horror, Mr. Gardiner promised every assistance in his power. Elizabeth, though expecting no less, thanked him with tears of gratitude, and all three being actuated by one spirit, everything relating to their journey was speedily settled. They were to be off as soon as possible. "'But what is to be done about Pemberley?' cried Mrs. Gardiner. "'John told us Mr. Darcy was here when you sent for us. Was it so?' "'Yes, and I told him we should not be able to keep our engagement. That is all settled.' "'What is all settled?' repeated the other, as she ran into the room to prepare. "'And are they upon such terms as for her to disclose the real truth? "'Oh, that I knew how it was!' But wishes were vain, or at least could only serve to amuse her in the hurry and confusion of the following hour. Had Elizabeth been at leisure to be idle, she would have remained certain that all employment was impossible to one so wretched as herself but she had her share of business as well as her aunt, and amongst the rest there were notes to be written to all their friends at Lambton, with false excuses for their sudden departure. An hour, however, saw the whole completed, and Mr. Gardiner, meanwhile having settled his account at the inn, nothing remained to be done but to go, and Elizabeth, after all the misery of the morning, found herself, in a shorter space of time than she could have supposed, seated in the carriage and on the road to Longbourn. End of chapter 46 Recording by Aoife Curd. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, 
on January 9, 2006. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapter 47 "'I have been thinking it over again, Elizabeth,' said her uncle, as they drove from the town. "'And really, upon serious consideration, I am much more inclined than I was to judge as your eldest sister does on the matter. It appears to me so very unlikely that any young man should form such a design against a girl who is by no means unprotected or friendless, and who is actually staying in his colonel's family, that I am strongly inclined to hope the best.' Could he expect that her friends would not step forward? Could he expect to be noticed again by the regiment, after such an affront to Colonel Forster? His temptation is not adequate to the risk. "'Do you really think so?' cried Elizabeth, brightening up for a moment. "'Upon my word,' said Mrs. Gardiner, "'I begin to be of your uncle's opinion. It is really too great a violation of decency, honour, and interest for him to be guilty of.' I cannot think so very ill of Wickham. Can you yourself, Lizzie, so wholly give him up as to believe him capable of it? Not perhaps of neglecting his own interest, but of every other neglect I can believe him capable. If, indeed, it should be so, but I dare not hope it, why should they not go on to Scotland if that had been the case? In the first place, replied Mr. Gardiner, there is no absolute proof that they are not gone to Scotland. Oh, but their removing from the chaise into a hackney coach is such a presumption, and besides, no traces of them were to be found on the Barnet Road. Well, then, supposing them to be in London, they may be there, though for the purpose of concealment, for no more exceptional purpose. It is not likely that money should be very abundant on either side, and it might strike them that they could be more economically, though less expeditiously, married in London than in Scotland. But why all this secrecy? Why any fear of detection? Why must their marriage be private? Oh, no, no, this is not likely. His most particular friend, you see, by Jane's account, was persuaded of his never intending to marry her. Wickham will never marry a woman without some money. He cannot afford it. And what claims has Lydia? What attraction has she beyond youth, health, and good humor that could make him, for her sake, forego every chance of benefiting himself by marrying well? As to what restraint the apprehensions of disgrace in the corps might throw on a dishonorable elopement with her, I am not able to judge, for I know nothing of the effects that such a step might produce. But as to your other objection— I am afraid it will hardly hold good. Lydia has no brothers to step forward, and he might imagine, from my father's behavior, from his indolence and the little attention he has ever seemed to give to what was going forward in his family, that he would do as little, and think as little about it, as any father could do in such a matter. But can you think that Lydia is so lost to everything but love of him as to consent to live with him on any terms other than marriage?' "'It does seem, and it is most shocking indeed,' replied Elizabeth, with tears in her eyes, "'that a sister's sense of decency and virtue in such a point should admit of doubt. "'But really I know not what to say. "'Perhaps I am not doing her justice. "'But she is very young. "'She has never been taught to think on serious subjects, "'and for the last half-year, nay, for a twelve-month, "'she has been given up to nothing but amusement and vanity.' She has been allowed to dispose of her time in the most idle and frivolous manner, and to adopt any opinions that came in her way. Since the blank sheer were first quartered in Merrington, nothing but love, flirtation, and officers have been in her head. She has been doing everything in her power, by thinking and talking on the subject, to give greater, hmm, what shall I call it, susceptibility to her feelings, which are naturally lively enough." and we all know that Wickham has every charm of person and address that can captivate a woman. "'But you see that Jane,' said her aunt, "'does not think so very ill of Wickham as to believe him capable of the attempt. "'Of whom does Jane ever think ill? "'And who is there, whatever might be their former conduct, "'that she would think capable of such an attempt till it were proved against them? "'But Jane knows, as well as I do, what Wickham really is.' 
We both know that he has been profligate in every sense of the word, that he has neither integrity nor honor, that he is as false and deceitful as he is insinuating. And do you really know all this? cried Mrs. Gardiner, whose curiosity as to the mode of her intelligence was all alive. I do indeed, replied Elizabeth, coloring. I told you the other day of his infamous behavior to Mr. Darcy, and you yourself, when last at Longbourn, heard in what manner he spoke of the man who had behaved with such forbearance and liberality towards him. And there are other circumstances which I am not at liberty, which it is not worth while to relate. But his lies about the whole Pemberley family are endless. From what he said of Miss Darcy, I was thoroughly prepared to see a proud, reserved, disagreeable girl. Yet he knew to the contrary himself. He must know that she was as amiable and unpretending as we have found her. But does Lydia know nothing of this? Can she be ignorant of what you and Jane seem so well to understand? Oh, yes, that, that is the worst of all. Till I was in Kent, and saw so much both of Mr. Darcy and his relation, Colonel Fitzwilliam, I was ignorant of the truth myself. And when I returned home, the blank shear was to leave Meryton in a week or fortnight time. As that was the case, neither Jane, to whom I related the whole, nor I thought it necessary to make our knowledge public. For of what use could it apparently be to any one, that the good opinion which all the neighborhood had of him should then be overthrown? And even when it was settled that Lydia should go with Mrs. Forster, the necessity of opening her eyes to his character never occurred to me. That she could be in any danger from the deception never entered my head. That such a consequence as this could ensue, you may easily believe, was far enough from my thoughts. When they are all removed to Brighton, therefore you had no reason, I suppose, to believe them fond of each other? Not the slightest. I can remember no symptom of affection on either side, and had anything of the kind been perceptible, you must be aware that ours is not a family on which it could be thrown away. When he first entered the corps, she was ready enough to admire him, but so we all were. Every girl in or near Meryton was out of her senses about him for the first two months, but he never distinguished her by any particular attention, and consequently, after a moderate period of extravagant and wild admiration, her fancy for him gave way, and others of the regiment, who treated her with more distinction, again became her favorites. It may be easily believed that however little of novelty could be added to their fears, hopes, and conjectures on this interesting subject by its repeated discussion, no other could detain them from it long during the whole of the journey. From Elizabeth's thoughts it was never absent, fixed there by the keenest of all anguish, self-reproach, she could find no interval of ease or forgetfulness. They travelled as expeditiously as possible, and sleeping one night on the road, reached Longbourn by dinner-time the next day. It was a comfort to Elizabeth to consider that Jane could not have been wearied by long expectations. The little gardeners, attracted by the sight of a chaise, were standing on the steps of the house as they entered the paddock, and, when the carriage drove up to the door, the joyful surprise that lighted up their faces and displayed itself over their whole bodies in a variety of capers and frisks was the first pleasing earnest of their welcome. Elizabeth jumped out, and after giving each of them a hasty kiss, hurried into the vestibule, where Jane, who came running down from her mother's apartment, immediately met her. Elizabeth, as she affectionately embraced her, whilst tears filled the eyes of both, lost not a moment in asking whether anything had been heard of the fugitives. "'Not yet,' replied Jane. "'But now that my dear uncle is come, I hope everything will be well.' "'Is my father in town?' "'Yes, he went on Tuesday, as I wrote you word. "'And have you heard from him often?' "'We have heard only twice. "'He wrote me a few lines on Wednesday to say that he had arrived in safety, "'and to give me his directions, which I particularly begged him to do. "'He merely added that he should not write again "'till he had something of importance to mention. "'And my mother, how is she? How are you all?' My mother is tolerably well, I trust, though her spirits are greatly shaken. 
She is upstairs and will have great satisfaction in seeing you all. She does not yet leave her dressing room. Mary and Kitty, thank heaven, are quite well. But you, how are you? cried Elizabeth. You look pale. How much you must have gone through. Her sister, however, assured her of being perfectly well, and their conversation, which had been passing while Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner were engaged with their children, was now put an end to by the approach of the whole party. Jane ran to her uncle and aunt and welcomed and thanked them both with alternate smiles and tears. When they were all in the drawing room, the questions which Elizabeth had already asked were, of course, repeated by the others, and they soon found that Jane had no intelligence to give. The sanguine hope of good, however, which the benevolence of her heart suggested, had not yet deserted her. She still expected that it would all end well, and that every morning would bring some letter, either from Lydia or her father, to explain their proceedings, and, perhaps, announce their marriage. Mrs. Bennet, to whose apartment they all repaired, after a few minutes' conversation together, received them exactly as might be expected, with tears and lamentations of regret, invectives against the villainous conduct of Wickham, and complaints of her own sufferings and ill usage, blaming everybody but the person to whose ill-judging indulgence the errors of her daughter must principally be owing. "'If I had been able,' said she, "'to carry my point in going to Brighton with all my family, "'this would not have happened. "'But poor dear Lydia had nobody to take care of her. "'Why did the Forsters ever let her go out of their sight? "'I am sure there was some great neglect or other on their side, "'for she is not the kind of girl to do such a thing "'if she had been well looked after. "'I always thought they were very unfit to have the charge of her. "'But I was overruled, as I always am.' "'Poor dear child! "'And now here's Mr. Bennet gone away, "'and I know he will fight Wickham, "'wherever he meets him, "'and then he will be killed, "'and what is to become of us all? "'The Collinses will turn us out "'before he is cold in his grave, "'and if you are not kind to us, brother, "'I do not know what we shall do.' "'They all exclaimed against such terrific ideas, "'and Mr. Gardiner, "'after general assurances "'of his affection for her "'and all her family,' told her that he meant to be in London the very next day, and would assist Mr. Bennet in every endeavour for recovering Lydia. "'Do not give way to useless alarm,' added he. "'Though it is right to be prepared for the worst, there is no occasion to look on it as certain. It is not quite a week since they left Brighton. In a few days more we may gain some news of them. And till we know that they are not married, and have no design of marrying, "'Do not let us give the matter over as lost. "'As soon as I get to town I shall go to my brother "'and make him come home with me to Grace Church Street, "'and then we may consult together as to what is to be done.' "'Oh, my dear brother,' replied Mrs. Bennet, "'that is exactly what I could most wish for. "'And now do, when you get to town, "'find them out wherever they may be, "'and if they are not married already, make them marry.' "'And as for wedding clothes, do not let them wait for that, "'but tell Lydia she shall have as much money as she chooses to buy them, "'after they are married. "'And above all, keep Mr. Bennet from fighting. "'Tell him what a dreadful state I am in, "'that I am frighted out of my wits, "'and have such tremblings, such flutterings all over me, "'such spasms in my side and pains in my head, "'and such beatings at heart, "'that I can get no rest by night nor by day.' "'And tell my dear Lydia not to give any directions about her clothes till she has seen me, "'for she does not know which are the best warehouses. "'Oh, brother, how kind you are! I know you will contrive it all.' "'But Mr. Gardiner, though he assured her again of his earnest endeavours in the cause, "'could not avoid recommending moderation to her, as well in her hopes as her fear, "'and after talking with her in this manner till dinner was on the table, "'they all left her to vent all her feelings on the housekeeper.' who attended in the absence of her daughters. Though her brother and sister were persuaded that there was no real occasion for such a seclusion from the family, they did not attempt to oppose it, for they knew that she had not prudence enough to hold her tongue before the servants while they waited at table, and judged it better that one only of the household, and the one whom they could most trust, should comprehend all her fears and solicitude on the subject." In the dining-room they were soon joined by Mary and Kitty, 
who had been too busily engaged in their separate apartments to make their appearance before. One came from her books, and the other from her toilette. The faces of both, however, were tolerably calm, and no change was visible in either, except that the loss of her favorite sister, or the anger which she had herself incurred in this business, had given more of fretfulness than usual to the accents of Kitty. As for Mary, she was mistress enough of herself to whisper to Elizabeth, with a countenance of grave reflection, soon after they were seated at the table, "'This is a most unfortunate affair, and will probably be much talked of. But we must stem the tide of malice, and pour into the wounded bosoms of each other the balm of sisterly consolation.' Then, perceiving in Elizabeth no inclination of replying, she added, "'Unhappy as the event must be for Lydia, we may draw from it this useful lesson, that loss of virtue in a female is irretrievable, that one false step involves her in endless ruin, that her reputation is no less brittle than it is beautiful, and that she cannot be too much guarded in her behavior towards the undeserving of the other sex.' Elizabeth lifted up her eyes in amazement, but was too much oppressed to make any reply. Mary, however, continued to console herself with such kind of moral extractions from the evil before them. In the afternoon the two elder Miss Bennets were able to be for half an hour by themselves, and Elizabeth instantly availed herself of the opportunity of making any inquiries, which Jane was equally eager to satisfy. After joining in general lamentations over the dreadful sequel of this event, which Elizabeth considered as all but certain, and Miss Bennet could not assert to be wholly impossible, the former continued the subject by saying, "'But tell me all and everything about it which I have not already heard. Give me further particulars. What did Colonel Forster say? Had they no apprehension of anything before the elopement took place? They must have seen them together for ever.' Colonel Forster did own that he had often suspected some partiality, especially on Lydia's side, but nothing to give him any alarm. I am so grieved for him. His behavior was attentive and kind to the utmost. He was coming to us in order to assure us of his concern, before he had any idea of their not being gone to Scotland. When that apprehension first got abroad, it hastened his journey." "'And was Denny convinced that Wickham would not marry? "'Did he know of their intending to go off? "'Had Colonel Forster seen Denny himself?' "'Yes, but when questioned by him, "'Denny denied knowing anything of their plans, "'and would not give his real opinion about it. "'He did not repeat his persuasion of their not marrying, "'and from that I am inclined to hope "'he might have been misunderstood before. "'And till Colonel Forster came himself,' Not one of you entertained a doubt, I suppose, of their being really married. How was it possible that such an idea could enter our brains? I felt a little uneasy, a little fearful of my sister's happiness with him in marriage, because I knew that his conduct had not been always quite right. My father and mother knew nothing of that. They only felt how imprudent a match it must be. Kitty then owned, with a very natural triumph, on knowing more than the rest of us, that in Lydia's last letter she had prepared her for such a step. She had known, it seems, of their being in love with each other many weeks. But not before they went to Brighton? No, I believe not. And did Colonel Forster appear to think well of Wickham himself? Does he know his real character? I must confess that he did not speak so well of Wickham as he formerly did. He believed him to be imprudent and extravagant. "'and since this sad affair has taken place, "'it is said that he left Meryton greatly in debt. "'But I hope this may be false. "'Oh, Jane, had we been less secret, "'had we told what we knew of him, "'this could not have happened.' "'Perhaps it would have been better,' replied her sister. "'But to expose the former faults of any person "'without knowing what their present feelings were "'seemed unjustifiable. "'We acted with the best intentions.' Could Colonel Forster repeat the particulars of Lydia's note to his wife? He brought it with him for us to see. Jane then took it from her pocket-book, and gave it to Elizabeth. 
These were the contents. My dear Harriet, you will laugh when you know where I am gone, and I cannot help laughing myself at your surprise tomorrow morning, as soon as I am missed. I am going to Gretna Green, and if you cannot guess with who, I shall think you a simpleton, for there is but one man in the world I love, and he is an angel. I should never be happy without him, so think it no harm to be off. You need not send them word at Longbourn of my going, if you do not like it, for it will make the surprise the greater when I write to them and sign my name, Lydia Wickham. What a good joke it will be! I can hardly write for laughing. Pray make my excuses to Pratt for not keeping my engagement and dancing with him to-night. Tell him I hope he will excuse me when he knows all, and tell him I will dance with him at the next ball we meet, with great pleasure. I shall send for my clothes when I get to Longbourn, but I wish you would tell Sally to mend a great slit in my worked muslin gown before they are packed up. Good-bye. Give my love to Colonel Forster. I hope you will drink to our good journey. Your affectionate friend, Lydia Bennet. Oh, thoughtless, thoughtless Lydia! cried Elizabeth, when she had finished it. What a letter is this to be written at such a moment! But at least it shows that she was serious on the subject of their journey. Whatever he might afterwards persuade her to, it was not on her side a scheme of infamy. My poor father! How he must have felt it! I never saw any one so shocked. He could not speak a word for full ten minutes. My mother was taken ill immediately, and the whole house in such confusion. Oh, Jane, cried Elizabeth, was there a servant belonging to it who did not know the whole story before the end of the day? I do not know. I hope there was. But to be guarded at such a time is very difficult. My mother was in hysterics, and though I endeavored to give her every assistance in my power, I am afraid I did not do so much as I might have done. "'but the horror of what might possibly happen "'almost took me from my faculties. "'Your attendance upon her has been too much for you. "'You do not look well. "'Oh, that I had been with you! "'You have had every care and anxiety upon yourself alone. "'Mary and Kitty have been very kind, "'and would have shared in every fatigue, I am sure, "'but I did not think it right for either of them. "'Kitty is slight and delicate, "'and Mary studies so much that her hours of repose should not be broken in on. My Aunt Phillips came to Longbourn on Tuesday after my father went away, and was so good as to stay till Thursday with me. She was of great use and comfort to us all, and Lady Lucas has been very kind. She walked here on Wednesday morning to condole with us, and offered her services, or any of her daughters, if they should be of use to us. "'She had better have stayed at home,' cried Elizabeth. "'Perhaps she meant well,' "'But, under such a misfortune as this, "'one cannot see too little of one's neighbours. "'Assistance is impossible, condolence insufferable. "'Let them triumph over us at a distance and be satisfied.' "'She then proceeded to inquire into the measures "'which her father had intended to pursue, "'while in town, for the recovery of his daughter. "'He meant, I believe,' replied Jane, "'to go to Epsom, the place where they last changed horses.' see the postilions, and try if anything could be made out from them. His principal object must be to discover the number of the hackney coach, which took them from Clapham. It had come with a fare from London, and as he thought that the circumstance of a gentleman and a lady's removing from one carriage into another might be remarked, he meant to make inquiries at Clapham. If he could anyhow discover at what house the coachman had before set down his fare, he determined to make inquiries there, and hoped it might not be impossible to find out the stand and number of the coach. I do not know of any other designs that he had formed, but he was in such a hurry to be gone, and his spirits so greatly discomposed, that I had difficulty in finding out even so much as this. End of chapter 47 Chapter 48 the whole party were in hopes of a letter from Mr. Bennet the next morning, but the post came in without bringing a single line from him. His family knew him to be, on all common occasions, a most negligent and dilatory correspondent, but at such a time they had hoped for exertion. They were forced to conclude that he had no pleasing intelligence to send. 
but even of that they would have been glad to be certain. Mr. Gardiner had only waited for the letters before he set off. When he was gone, they were certain at least of receiving constant information of what was going on, and their uncle promised, at parting, to prevail on Mr. Bennet to return to Longbourn as soon as he could, to the great consolation of his sister, who considered it as the only security for her husband's not being killed in a duel. Mrs. Gardiner and the children were to remain in Hertfordshire a few days longer, as the former thought her presence might be serviceable to her nieces. She shared in their attendance on Mrs. Bennet, and was a great comfort to them in their hours of freedom. Their other aunt, who visited them frequently, and always, as she said, with the design of cheering and heartening them up, though, as she never came without reporting some fresh instant of Wickham's extravagance or irregularity, she seldom went away without leaving them more dispirited than she found them. All Meryton seemed striving to blacken the man who, but three months before, had been almost an angel of light. He was declared to be in debt to every tradesman in the place, and his intrigues, all honoured with the title of seduction, had been extended into every tradesman's family. Everybody declared that he was the wickedest young man in the world, and everybody began to find out that they had always distrusted the appearance of his goodness. Elizabeth, though she did not credit above half of what was said, believed enough to make her former assurance of her sister's ruin more certain, and even Jane, who believed still less of it, became almost hopeless, more especially as the time was now come when, if they had gone to Scotland, which she had never before entirely despaired of, they must in all probability have gained some news of them. Mr. Gardiner left Longbourn on Sunday. On Tuesday his wife received a letter from him. It told them that, on his arrival, he had immediately found out his brother, and persuaded him to come to Grace Church Street, that Mr. Bennet had been to Epsom and Clapham before his arrival, but without gaining any satisfactory information, and that he was now determined to inquire at all the principal hotels in town, as Mr. Bennet thought it possible they might have gone to one of them, on their first coming to London, before they procured lodgings. Mr. Gardiner himself did not expect any success from this measure, but as his brother was eager in it, he meant to assist him in pursuing it. He added that Mr. Bennet seemed wholly disinclined at present to leave London, and promised to write again very soon. There was also a postscript to this effect. I have written to Colonel Forster, to desire him to find out, if possible, from some of the young man's intimates in the regiment, whether Wickham has any relations or connections, who will be likely to know in what part of town he has now concealed himself. If there were any one that one could apply to with a probability of gaining such a clue as that, it might be of essential consequence. At present we have nothing to guide us. Colonel Forster will, I dare say, do everything in his power to satisfy us on this head. But, on second thoughts, perhaps Lizzie could tell us what relations he has now living, better than any other person. Elizabeth was at no loss to understand from where this deference to her authority proceeded, but it was not in her power to give any information of so satisfactory a nature as the compliment deserved. She had never heard of his having had any relations, except a father and mother, both of whom had been dead many years. It was possible, however, that some of his companions, in the blank sheer, might be able to give more information— and though she was not very sanguine in expecting it, the application was a something to look forward to. Every day at Longbourn was now a day of anxiety, but the most anxious part of each was when the post was expected. The arrival of letters was the grand object of every morning's impatience. Through letters, whatever of good or bad was to be told would be communicated, and every succeeding day was expected to bring some news of importance. But before they heard again from Mr. Gardiner, a letter arrived for their father from a different quarter, from Mr. Collins, which, as Jane had received directions to open all that came for him in his absence, she accordingly read, and Elizabeth, who knew what curiosities his letters always were, looked over her and read it likewise. It was as follows. 
My dear sir, I feel myself called upon by our relationship and my situation in life to condole with you on the grievous affliction you are now suffering under, of which we were yesterday informed by a letter from Hertfordshire. Be assured, my dear sir, that Mrs. Collins and myself sincerely sympathize with you and all your respectable family in your present distress, which must be of the bitterest kind, because proceeding from a cause which no time can remove. No arguments shall be wanting on my part that can alleviate so severe a misfortune, or that may comfort you under a circumstance that must be of all others the most afflicting to a parent's mind. The death of your daughter would have been a blessing in comparison to this, and it is the more to be lamented because there is reason to suppose, as my dear Charlotte informs me, that this licentiousness of behavior in your daughter has proceeded from a faulty degree of indulgence, though, at the same time, for the consolation of yourself and Mrs. Bennet, I am inclined to think that her own disposition must be naturally bad, or she could not be guilty of such an enormity at so early an age. Howsoever that may be, you are grievously to be pitied, in which opinion I am not only joined by Mrs. Collins, but likewise by Lady Catherine and her daughter, to whom I have related the affair. They agree with me in apprehending that this false step in one daughter will be injurious to the fortunes of all the others, for who, as Lady Catherine herself condescendingly says, will connect themselves with such a family? And this consideration leads me moreover to reflect, with augmented satisfaction, on a certain event of last November, for had it been otherwise, I must have been involved in all your sorrow and disgrace. Let me then advise you, dear sir, to console yourself as much as possible, to throw off your unworthy child from your affection for ever, and leave her to reap the fruits of her own heinous offense. I am, dear sir, etc., etc., Mr. Gardiner did not write again till he had received an answer from Colonel Forster, and then he had nothing of a pleasant nature to send. It was not known that Wickham had a single relationship with whom he kept up any connection, and it was certain that he had no near one living. His former acquaintances had been numerous, but since he had been in the militia, it did not appear that he was on terms of particular friendship with any of them. There was no one, therefore, who could be pointed out as likely to give any news of him, and in the wretched state of his own finances there was a very powerful motive for secrecy, in addition to his fear of discovery by Lydia's relations, for it had just transpired that he had left gaming debts behind him to a very considerable amount. Colonel Forster believed that more than a thousand pounds would be necessary to clear his expenses at Brighton. He owed a good deal in town, but his debts of honor were still more formidable. Mr. Gardiner did not attempt to conceal these particulars from the Longbourn family. Jane heard them with horror. "'A gamester!' she cried. "'This is wholly unexpected. I had not an idea of it.' Mr. Gardiner added in his letter that they might expect to see their father at home on the following day, which was Saturday." Rendered spiritless by the ill success of all their endeavors, he had yielded to his brother-in-law's entreaty that he would return to his family, and leave it to him to do whatever occasion might suggest to be advisable for continuing their pursuit. When Mrs. Bennet was told of this, she did not express so much satisfaction as her children expected, considering what her anxiety for his life had been before. "'What, is he coming home and without poor Lydia?' she cried. "'Sure he will not leave London before he has found them. "'Who is to fight Wickham and make him marry her if he comes away?' "'As Mrs. Gardiner began to wish to be at home, "'it was settled that she and the children should go to London "'at the same time that Mr. Bennet came from it. "'The coach, therefore, took them the first stage of their journey "'and brought its master back to Longbourn. "'Mrs. Gardiner went away in all the perplexity "'about Elizabeth and her Derbyshire friend,' that had attended her from that part of the world. His name had never been voluntarily mentioned before them by her niece, 
and the kind of half-expectation which Mrs. Gardiner had formed, of their being followed by a letter from him, had ended in nothing. Elizabeth had received none since her return that could come from Pemberley. The present unhappy state of the family rendered any other excuse for the lowness of her spirits unnecessary. Nothing, therefore, could be fairly conjectured from that, though Elizabeth, who was by this time tolerably well acquainted with her own feelings, was perfectly aware that, had she known nothing of Darcy, she could have borne the dread of Lydia's infamy somewhat better. It would have spared her, she thought, one sleepless night out of two. When Mr. Bennet arrived, he had all the appearance of his usual philosophic composure. He said as little as he had ever been in the habit of saying, made no mention of the business that had taken him away, and it was some time before his daughters had courage to speak of it. It was not till the afternoon, when he had joined them at tea, that Elizabeth ventured to introduce the subject, and then, on her briefly expressing her sorrow for what he must have endured, he replied, "'Say nothing of that. Who should suffer but myself? It has been my own doing, and I ought to feel it.' "'You must not be too severe upon yourself,' replied Elizabeth. "'You may well warn me against such an evil. Human nature is so prone to fall into it.' "'No, Lizzie, let me once in my life feel how much I have been to blame. I am not afraid of being overpowered by the impression. It will pass away soon enough.' "'Do you suppose them to be in London?' "'Yes. Where else can they be so well concealed?' "'And Lydia used to want to go to London,' added Kitty. "'She is happy, then,' said her father dryly, "'and her residence there will probably be of some duration.' Then, after a short silence, he continued, "'Lizzie, I bear you no ill-will for being justified in your advice to me last May, which, considering the event, shows some greatness of mind.' They were interrupted by Miss Bennet, who came to fetch her mother's tea. "'This is a parade,' he cried, "'which does one good. It gives such an elegance to misfortune. Another day I will do the same.' I will sit in my library in my nightcap and powdering gown and give as much trouble as I can. Or perhaps I may defer it till Kitty runs away. I am not going to run away, Papa, said Kitty fretfully. If I should ever go to Brighton, I would behave better than Lydia. You go to Brighton. I would not trust you so near it as Eastbourne for fifty pounds. No, Kitty, I have at least learnt to be cautious, and you will feel the effects of it. "'No officer is ever to enter into my house again, nor even to pass through the village. "'Balls will be absolutely prohibited, unless you stand up with one of your sisters. "'And you are never to stir out of doors till you can prove "'that you have spent ten minutes of every day in a rational manner.' "'Kitty, who took all these threats in a serious light, began to cry. "'Well, well,' said he, "'do not make yourself unhappy.' "'If you are a good girl for the next ten years, "'I will take you to a review at the end of them.'" End of chapter 48 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit... LibriVox.org Recorded by Gesine Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapter 49 Two days after Mr. Bennet's return, as Jane and Elizabeth were walking together in the shrubbery behind the house, they saw the housekeeper coming towards them, and concluding that she came to call them to their mother, went forward to meet her. But instead of the expected summons, when they approached her, she said to Miss Bennet, "'I beg your pardon, madam, for interrupting you, but I was in the hopes you might have got some good news from town, so I took the liberty of coming to ask.' "'What do you mean, Hill? We have heard nothing from town.' "'Dear madam,' cried Mrs. Hill, in great astonishment, "'Don't you know there is an express come for Master, from Mr. Gardiner? "'He has been here this half-hour, and Master has had a letter.' "'Away ran the girls, too eager to get in to have time for speech. 
They ran through the vestibule into the breakfast room, from thence to the library. Their father was in neither, and they were on the point of seeking him upstairs with their mother, when they were met by the butler, who said, "'If you are looking for my master, ma'am, he is walking towards the little copse.' Upon this information they instantly passed through the hall once more, and ran across the lawn after their father, who was deliberately pursuing his way towards a small wood on one side of the paddock. Jane, who was not so light nor so much in the habit of running as Elizabeth, soon lagged behind, while her sister, panting for breath, came up with him, and eagerly cried out, "'Oh, Papa! What news? What news? Have you heard from my uncle?' "'Yes, I have had a letter from him by express. "'Well, and what news does it bring, good or bad?' "'What is there of good to be expected?' said he, "'taking the letter from his pocket. "'But perhaps you would like to read it.' "'Elizabeth impatiently caught it from his hand. "'Jame now came up. "'Read it aloud,' said the father, "'for I hardly know myself what it is about.' Gracechurch Street, Monday, August 2nd. My dear brother, at last I am able to send you some tidings of my niece, and such as, upon the whole, I hope it will give you satisfaction. Soon after you left me on Saturday, I was fortunate enough to find out in what part of London they were. The particulars I reserve till we meet. It is enough to know they are discovered. I have seen them both... "'Then it is as I always hoped,' cried Jane. "'They are married.' "'I have seen them both. "'They are not married, "'nor can I find there was any intention of being so. "'But if you are willing to perform the engagements "'which I have ventured to make on your side, "'I hope it will not be long before they are. "'All that is required of you is to assure to your daughter by settlement her equal share of the five thousand pounds secured among your children after the decease of yourself and my sister, and moreover to enter into an engagement of allowing her, during your life, one hundred pounds per annum. These are conditions which, considering everything, I had no hesitation in complying with, as far as I thought myself privileged, for you. I shall send this by express, that no time may be lost in bringing me your answer. You will easily comprehend from these particulars that Mr. Wickham's circumstances are not so hopeless as they are generally believed to be. The world has been deceived in that respect, and I am happy to say there will be some little money, even when all his debts are discharged, to settle on my niece, in addition to her own fortune. If, as I conclude will be the case, you send me full powers to act in your name throughout the whole of this business, I will immediately give directions to Haggerston for preparing a proper settlement. There will not be the smallest occasion for your coming to town again, therefore stay quiet at Longbourn and depend on my diligence and care. Send back your answer as fast as you can, and be careful to write explicitly. We have judged it best that my niece should be married from this house, of which I hope you will approve. She comes to us today. I shall write again as soon as anything more is determined on. Yours, etc., Edward Gardiner. Is it possible? cried Elizabeth when she had finished. Can it be possible that he will marry her? Wickham is not so undeserving then as we thought him, said her sister. My dear father, I congratulate you. And have you answered the letter? cried Elizabeth. No, but it must be done soon. Most earnestly did she then entreat to him to lose no more time before he wrote. "'Oh, my dear father,' she cried, "'come back and write immediately. "'Consider how important every moment is in such a case.' "'Let me write for you,' said Jane, "'if you dislike the trouble yourself.' "'I dislike it very much,' he replied, "'but it must be done.' And, so saying, he turned back with them and walked towards the house. "'And may I ask,' said Elizabeth, "'but the terms, I suppose, must be complied with.' 
complied with. I am only ashamed of his asking so little. And they must marry. Yet he is such a man. Yes, yes, they must marry. There is nothing else to be done. But there are two things that I want very much to know. One is how much money your uncle has laid down to bring it about, and the other, how am I ever to pay him? Money! My uncle! cried Jane. What do you mean, sir? I mean that no man in his senses would marry Lydia on so slight a temptation as one hundred a year during my life and fifty after I am gone. That is very true, said Elizabeth, though it had not occurred to me before. His debts to be discharged and something still to remain. Oh, it must be my uncle's doings. Generous good man, I am afraid he has distressed himself. A small sum could not do all this. No, said her father, Wickham's a fool if he takes her with a farthing less than ten thousand pounds. I should be sorry to think so ill of him in the very beginning of our relationship. Ten thousand pounds! Heaven forbid! How is half such a sum to be repaid? Mr. Bennet made no answer, and each of them, deep in thought, continued silent till they reached the house. Their father then went on to the library to write, and the girls walked into the breakfast room. "'And they are really to be married,' cried Elizabeth, as soon as they were by themselves. "'How strange this is! And for this we are to be thankful.' that they should marry, small as is their chance of happiness, and wretched as is his character, we are forced to rejoice. O oh, Lydia! I comfort myself with thinking, replied Jane, that he certainly would not marry Lydia if he had not a real regard for her. Though our kind uncle has done something towards clearing him, I cannot believe that ten thousand pounds or anything like it has been advanced. He has children of his own, and may have more. How could he spare half ten thousand pounds? If we were ever able to learn what Wickham's debts have been, said Elizabeth, and how much is settled on his side on our sister, we shall exactly know what Mr. Gardiner has done for them, because Wickham has not sixpence of his own. The kindness of my uncle and aunt can never be requited. Their taking her home and affording her their personal protection and countenance is such a sacrifice to her advantage as years of gratitude cannot enough acknowledge. By this time she is actually with them. If such goodness does not make her miserable now, she will never deserve to be happy. What a meeting for her when she first sees my aunt! We must endeavour to forget all that has passed on either side, said Jane. I hope and trust they will yet be happy. His consenting to marry her is a proof, I will believe, that he has come to a right way of thinking. Their mutual affection will steady them, and I flatter myself they will settle so quietly and live in so rational a manner as may in time make their past imprudence forgotten. Their conduct has been such, replied Elizabeth, as neither you nor I nor anybody can ever forget. It is useless to talk of it. It now occurred to the girls that their mother was in all likelihood perfectly ignorant of what had happened. They went to the library, therefore, and asked their father whether he would not wish them to make it known to her. He was writing, and, without raising his head, coolly replied, Just as you please. May we take my uncle's letter to read to her? Take whatever you like, and get away. Elizabeth took the letter from his writing-table, and they went upstairs together. Mary and Kitty were both with Mrs. Bennet. One communication would, therefore, do for all. After a slight preparation for good news, the letter was read aloud. Mrs. Bennet could hardly contain herself. As soon as Jane had read Mr. Gardiner's hope of Lydia's being soon married, her joy burst forth, and every following sentence added to its exuberance. 
She was now in an irritation as violent from delight as she had ever been fidgety from alarm and vexation. To know that her daughter would be married was enough. She was disturbed by no fear for her felicity, nor humbled by any remembrance of her misconduct. "'My dear, dear Lydia,' she cried, "'this is delightful indeed. She will be married. I shall see her again. She will be married at sixteen. My good, kind brother, I knew how it would be. I knew he would manage everything. How I long to see her, and to see dear Wickham, too. But the clothes, the wedding clothes. I will write to my sister Gardiner about them directly. Lizzie, my dear, run down to your father and ask him how much you will give her. Stay, stay, I will go myself. Ring the bell, Kitty, for Hill. I will put on my things in a moment. My dear, dear Lydia, how merry we shall be together when we meet. Her eldest daughter endeavoured to give some relief to the violence of these transports, by leading her thoughts to the obligations which Mr. Gardiner's behaviour laid them all under. For we must attribute this happy conclusion, she added, in a great measure to his kindness. We are persuaded that he has pledged himself to assist Mr. Wickham with money. Well, cried her mother, it is all very right. Who should do it but her own uncle? If he had not had a family of his own, I and my children must have had all his money, you know, and it is the first time we have ever had anything from him, except a few presents. Well, I am so happy. In a short time I shall have a daughter married. Mrs. Wickham, how well it sounds. And she was only sixteen last June. My dear Jane, I am in such a flutter that I am sure I can't write. So I will dictate, and you will write for me. We will settle with your father about the money afterwards, but the things should be ordered immediately. She was then proceeding to all the particulars of calico, muslin, and cambric, and would shortly have dictated some very plentiful orders, had not Jane, though with some difficulty, persuaded her to wait till her father was at leisure to be consulted. One day's delay, she observed, would be of small importance, and her mother was too happy to be quite so obstinate as usual. Other schemes, too, came into her head. "'I will go to Meryton,' said she, "'as soon as I am dressed and tell the good, good news to my sister Phillips. "'And as I come back, I can call on Lady Lucas and Mrs. Long. "'Kitty, run down and order the carriage. "'An airing would do me a great deal of good, I am sure. "'Girls, can I do anything for you in Meryton? "'Oh, here comes Hill, my dear Hill. "'Have you heard the good news? "'Miss Lydia is going to be married.' and you shall all have a bowl of punch to make merry at her wedding. Mrs. Hill began instantly to express her joy. Elizabeth received her congratulations amongst the rest, and then, sick of this folly, took refuge in her own room, that she might think with freedom. Poor Lydia's situation must at best be bad enough, but that it was no worse she had need to be thankful. She felt it so, and though, in looking forward, neither rational happiness nor worldly prosperity could be justly expected for her sister, in looking back to what they had feared only two hours ago, she felt all the advantages of what they had gained. End of chapter 49 Recorded by Gesine in Valletta December 2005Chapters 50 and 51 Mr. Bennet had very often wished before this period of his life that, instead of spending his whole income, he had laid by an annual sum for the better provision of his children and of his wife if she survived him. He now wished it more than ever. Had he done his duty in that respect, 
Lydia need not have been indebted to her uncle, for whatever of honour or credit could now be purchased for her. The satisfaction of prevailing on one of the most worthless young men in Great Britain to be her husband might then have rested in its proper place. He was seriously concerned that a cause of so little advantage to any one should be forwarded at the sole expense of his brother-in-law, and he was determined, if possible, to find out the extent of his assistance, and to discharge the obligation as soon as he could. When first Mr. Bennet had married, economy was held to be perfectly useless, for, of course, they were to have a son. The son was to join in cutting off the entail, as soon as he should be of age, and the widow and younger children would by that means be provided for. Five daughters successively entered the world, and yet the son was to come, and Mrs. Bennet, for many years after Lydia's birth, had been certain that he would. This event had at last been despaired of, but it was then too late to be saving. Mrs. Bennet had no turn for economy, and her husband's love of independence had alone prevented their exceeding their income. Five thousand pounds was settled by marriage articles on Mrs. Bennet and the children, but in what proportions it should be divided amongst the latter depended on the will of the parents. This was one point, with regard to Lydia at least, which was now to be settled, and Mr. Bennet could have no hesitation in acceding to the proposal before him. In terms of grateful acknowledgment for the kindness of his brother, though expressed most concisely, he then delivered on paper his perfect approbation of all that was done and his willingness to fulfil the engagements that had been made for him. He had never before supposed that, could Wickham be prevailed on to marry his daughter, it would be done with so little inconvenience to himself as by the present arrangement. He would scarcely be ten pounds a year the loser by the hundred that was to be paid for them. For, what with her board and pocket allowance, and the continual presence in money which passed to her through her mother's hands, Lydia's expenses had been very little within that sum." That it would be done with such trifling exertion on his side, too, was another very welcome surprise, for his wish at present was to have as little trouble in the business as possible. When the first transports of rage which had produced his activity in seeking her were over, he naturally returned to all its former indolence. His letter was soon dispatched, for, though dilatory in undertaking King business, he was quick in its execution. He begged to know further particulars of what he was indebted to his brother but was too angry with Lydia to send any message to her. The good news spread quickly through the house, and with proportionate speed through the neighbourhood. It was borne in the latter with decent philosophy. To be sure it would have been far more for the advantage of conversation had Miss Lydia Bennet come upon the town, or, as the happiest alternative, been secluded from the world in some distant farmhouse. But there was much to be talked of in marrying her and the good-natured wishes for her well-doing which had proceeded before from all the spiteful ladies in Meryton, lost but a little of their spirit in this change of circumstances, because with such a husband her misery was considered certain. It was a fortnight since Mrs. Bennet had been downstairs, but on this happy day she again took her seat at the head of her table, and in spirits oppressively high. No sentiment of shame gave a damp to her triumph. The marriage of a daughter, which had been the first object of her wishes since Jane was sixteen, was now on the point of accomplishment, and her thoughts and her words ran wholly on those attendants of elegant nuptials, fine muslins, new carriages, and servants. She was busily searching through the neighbourhood for a proper situation for her daughter, and, without knowing or considering what their income might be, rejected many as deficient in size and importance. "'Hay Park might do,' said she, "'if the Goldings could quit it, or the great house at Stoke, if the drawing-room were larger, but Ashworth is too far off. I could not bear to have her ten miles from me, and as for Pulvis Lodge, the attics are dreadful. Her husband allowed her to talk on without interruption while the servants remained, but when they had withdrawn, he said to her, Mrs. Bennet, before you take any or all of these houses for your son and daughter, let us come to a right understanding. Into one house in this neighbourhood they shall never have admittance. I will not encourage the impudence of either by receiving them at Longbourn. A long dispute followed this declaration, but Mr. Bennet was firm. It soon led to another, and Mrs. Bennet found, with amazement and horror, that her husband would not advance a guinea to buy clothes for his daughter. He protested that she should receive from him no mark of affection whatever on the occasion. Mrs. Bennet could hardly comprehend it. 
that his anger could be carried to such a point of inconceivable resentment as to refuse his daughter a privilege without which her marriage would scarcely seem valid, exceeded all she could believe possible. She was more alive to the disgrace which her want of new clothes must reflect on her daughter's nuptials than to any sense of shame at her eloping and living with Wickham a fortnight before they took place. Elizabeth was now heartily sorry that she had, from the distress of the moment, been led to make Mr. Darcy acquainted with their fears for her sister, for since her marriage would so shortly give the proper termination to the elopement, they might hope to conceal its unfavourable beginning from all those who were not immediately on the spot. She had no fear of its spreading farther through his means. There were few people on whose secrecy she would have more confidently depended. But at the same time, there was no one whose knowledge of a sister's frailty would have mortified her so much. Not, however, from any fear of disadvantage from it individually to herself, for, at any rate, there seemed a gulf impassable between them. Had Lydia's marriage been concluded on the most honourable terms, it was not to be supposed that Mr. Darcy would connect himself with a family where, to every other objection, would now be added an alliance and a relationship of the nearest kind with the man whom he so justly scorned. From such a connection she could not wonder that he would shrink. The wish of procuring her regard, which she had assured herself of his feeling in Derbyshire, could not in rational expectation survive such a blow as this. She was humbled, she was grieved, she repented, though she hardly knew of what. She became jealous of his esteem, when she could no longer hope to be benefited by it. She wanted to hear of him, when there seemed the least chance of gaining intelligence. She was convinced that she could have been happy with him, when it was no longer likely they should meet. What a triumph for him, as she often thought, could he know that the proposals which she had proudly spurned only four months ago would now have been most gladly and gratefully received. He was as generous, she doubted not, as the most generous of his sex, but while he was mortal there must be a triumph. She began now to comprehend that he was exactly the man who, in disposition and talents, would most suit her. His understanding and temper, though unlike her own, would have answered all her wishes. It was a union that must have been to the advantage of both. By her ease and liveliness his mind might have been softened, his manners improved, and from his judgment, information, and knowledge of the world she must have received benefit of greater importance. But no such happy marriage could now teach the admiring multitude what connubial felicity really was. A union of a different tendency, and precluding the possibility of the other, was soon to be formed in their family. How Wickham and Lydia were to be supported in tolerable independence she could not imagine, but how little of permanent happiness could belong to a couple who were only brought together because their passions were stronger than their virtue she could easily conjecture. Mr. Gardiner soon wrote again to his brother. To Mr. Bennet's acknowledgments he briefly replied, with assurance of his eagerness to promote the welfare of any of his family, and concluded with entreaties that the subject might never be mentioned to him again. The principal purport of his letter was to inform them that Mr. Wickham had resolved on quitting the militia. It was greatly my wish that he should do so, he added, as soon as his marriage was fixed on. And I think you will agree with me, in considering the removal of that corps as highly advisable, both on his account and my niece's. It is Mr. Wickham's intention to go into the regulars, and among his former friends there are still some who are able and willing to assist him in the army. He has a promise of an ensigncy in general regiment, now quartered in the north. It is an advantage to have it so far from this part of the kingdom. He promises fairly, and I hope among different people where they may each have a character to preserve, they will both be more prudent. I have written to Colonel Forrester to inform him of our present arrangements, and to request that he will satisfy the various creditors of Mr. Wickham in and near Brighton, with assurance of speedy payment, for which I have pledged myself. And will you give yourself the trouble of carrying similar assurances to his creditors in Meryton, of whom I shall subjoin a list according to his information? He has given in all his debts, I hope at least he has not deceived us. Hackerson has our directions, and all will be completed in a week. They will then join his regiment, unless they are first invited to Longbourn, and I understand from Mrs. Gardiner that my niece is very desirous of seeing you all before she leaves the South. She is well, and begs to be dutifully remembered to you and your mother. Yours, etc. E. Gardiner Mr. Bennett and his daughters saw all the advantages of Wickham's removal from the 
sure, as clearly as Mr. Gardiner could do. But Mrs. Bennet was not so well pleased with it. Lydia's being settled in the north, just when she had expected most pleasure and pride in her company, for she had by no means given up her plan for their residing in Hertfordshire, was a severe disappointment. And besides, it was such a pity that Lydia should be taken from a regiment where she was acquainted with every one, and had so many favourites. "'She is so fond of Mrs. Forster,' said she. "'It will be quite shocking to send her away, and there are several of the young men, too, that she likes very much. The officers may not be so pleasant in general regiment.' His daughter's request, for such it might be considered, of being admitted into her family again before she set off for the North, received at first an absolute negative. But Jane and Elizabeth, who agreed in wishing, for the sake of their sister's feelings and consequence, that she should be noticed on her marriage by her parents, urged him so earnestly, yet so rationally and so mildly, to receive her and her husband at Longbourn, as soon as they were married, that he was prevailed on to think as they thought, and act as they wished. And their mother had the satisfaction of knowing that she would be able to show her married daughter in the neighbourhood before she was banished to the north. When Mr. Bennet wrote again to his brother, therefore, he sent his permission for them to come, and it was settled, that as soon as the ceremony was over, they should proceed to Longbourn. Elizabeth was surprised, however, that Wickham should consent to such a scheme, and had she consulted only her own inclination, any meeting with him would have been the last object of her wishes. CHAPTER 51 The sister's wedding day arrived, and Jane and Elizabeth felt for her probably more than she felt for herself. The carriage was sent to meet them at and they were to return in it by dinner-time. Their arrival was dreaded by the elder Miss Bennets, and Jane more especially, who gave Lydia the feelings which would have attended herself had she been the culprit, and was wretched in the thought of what her sister must endure. They came. The family were assembled in the breakfast-room to receive them. Smiles decked the face of Mrs. Bennet as the carriage drove up to the door. Her husband looked impenetrably grave. Her daughters, alarmed, anxious, uneasy. Lydia's voice was heard in the vestibule. The door was thrown open, and she ran into the room. Her mother stepped forwards, embraced her, and welcomed her with rapture, gave her hand with an affectionate smile to Wickham, who followed his lady, and wished them both joy with an alacrity which showed no doubt of their happiness. Their reception from Mr. Bennet, to whom they then turned, was not quite so cordial. His countenance rather gained in austerity, and he scarcely opened his lips. The easy assurance of the young couple, indeed, was enough to provoke him. Elizabeth was disgusted, and even Miss Bennet was shocked. Lydia was Lydia's still, untamed, unabashed, wild, noisy, and fearless. She turned from sister to sister, demanding their congratulations, and when at length they all sat down, looked eagerly around the room, took notice of some little alteration in it, and observed, with a laugh, that it was a great while since she had been there. Wickham was not at all more distressed than herself, but his manners were always so pleasing, that had his character and his marriage been exactly what they ought, his smiles and his easy address, while he claimed their relationship, would have delighted them all. Elizabeth had not before believed him quite equal to such assurance, but she sat down, resolving within herself to draw no limits in future to the impudence of an impudent man. She blushed, and Jane blushed but the cheeks of the two caused their confusion, suffered no variation of colour. There was no want of discourse. The bride and her mother could neither of them talk fast enough, and Wickham, who happened to sit near Elizabeth, began inquiring after his acquaintance in that neighbourhood, with a good-humoured ease which she felt very unable to equal in her replies. They seemed each of them to have the happiest memories in the world, nothing of the past was recollected with pain, and Lydia led voluntarily to subjects which her sisters would not have alluded to for the world. "'Only think of its being three months,' she cried. "'Since I went away, it seems but a fortnight, I declare, "'and yet there have been things enough happened in the time. "'Good gracious! "'When I went away I am sure I had no more idea of being married "'till I had come back again, "'though I thought it would be very good fun if I was.' "'Her father lifted up his eyes. "'Jane was distressed. "'Elizabeth looked expressly at Lydia, "'but she, who never heard nor saw anything "'of which she chose to be insensible, gaily continued.' "'Oh, Mamma, do the people hereabouts know I am married to-day? "'I was afraid they might not, and we overtook William Golding in his curricle. "'So I was determined he should know it, and so I let down the side-glass next to him, "'and took off my glove, and let my hand just rest upon the window-frame, "'so that he might see the ring, and then I bowed and smiled like anything.' 
Elizabeth could bear it no longer. She got up and ran out of the room, and returned no more till she heard them passing through the hall to the dining parlour. She then joined them, soon enough to see Lydia, with anxious parade, walk up to her mother's right hand, and hear her say to her eldest sister, "'Ah, Jane, I take your place now, and you must go lower, because I'm a married woman.' It was not to be supposed that time would give Lydia that embarrassment from which she had been so wholly free at first. Her ease and good spirits increased. She longed to see Mrs. Phillips, Lucas's, and all their other neighbours, and to hear herself called Mrs. Wickham by each of them, and in the meantime she went after dinner to show her ring and boast of being married to Mrs. Hill and the two housemaids. "'Well, Mama," said she, when they were all returned to the breakfast-room, and what do you think of my husband? Is not he a charming man? I am sure my sisters must all envy me. I only hope they have half my good luck. They must all go to Brighton. That is a place to get husbands. What a pity it is, Mamma, we did not all go. Very true, and if I had my will, we should. But, my dear Lydia, I don't at all like your going such a way off. Must it be so? Oh, Lord, yes, there, there's nothing in that. I shall like it of all things. You and Papa and my sisters must come down to see us. We shall be at Newcastle all the winter, and I dare say there will be some balls, and I will take care to get good partners for them all. I should like it beyond anything, said her mother. And then when you go away, you may leave one or two of my sisters behind you, and I dare say I shall get husbands for them before the winter is over. I thank you for my share of the favour, said Elizabeth. But I do not particularly like your way of getting husbands. Their visitors were not to remain above ten days with them. Mr. Wickham had received his commission before he left London, and he was to join his regiment at the end of a fortnight. No one but Mrs. Bennet regretted that their stay would be so short, and she made the most of the time by visiting about with her daughter, and having very frequent parties at home. These parties were acceptable to all. To avoid a family circle was even more desirable to such as did think than such as did not. Wickham's affection for Lydia was just what Elizabeth had expected to find, not equal to Lydia's for him. She had scarcely needed her present observation to be satisfied, from the reason of things, that their elopement had been brought on by the strength of her love rather than by his, and she would have wondered why, without violently caring for her, he chose to elope with her at all, and she not felt certain that his flight was rendered necessary by distress of circumstances, and if that were the case, he was not the young man to resist an opportunity of having a companion." Lydia was excessively fond of him. He was her dear Wickham on every occasion. No one was to be put in competition with him. He did everything best in the world, and she was sure he would kill more birds on the 1st of September than anybody else in the country. One morning, soon after their arrival, as she was sitting with her two elder sisters, she said to Elizabeth, "'Nizzy, I never gave you an account of my wedding, I believe. You were not by when I told Mamma and the others all about it. Are not you curious to hear how it was managed?' "'No, really,' replied Elizabeth. "'I think there cannot be too little said on the subject.' "'La! You are so strange. "'But I must tell you how it went off. "'We were married, you know, at St. Clement's, "'because Wickham's lodgings were in that parish, "'and it was settled that we should all be there by eleven o'clock. "'My uncle and aunt and I were to go together, "'and the others were to meet us at the church. "'Well, Monday morning came, and I was in such a fuss. "'I was so afraid, you know, that something would happen to put it off, "'and that I should have gone quite distracted.' And there was my aunt, all the time I was dressing, preaching and talking away, just as if she was reading a sermon. However, I did not hear above one word in ten, and I was thinking, you may suppose, of my dear Wickham. I longed to know whether he would be married in his blue coat. Well, and so we breakfasted at ten as usual. I thought it would never be over, for by the by you are to understand that my uncle and aunt were horrid and pleasant all the time I was with them. And you'll believe me, I did not once put my foot out of doors, though I was there a fortnight. "'Not one party, or scheme, or anything. "'To be sure, London was rather thin, but, however, the little theatre was open. "'Well, and so, just as the carriage came to the door, "'my uncle was called away upon business to that horrid man, Mr. Stone, "'and then, you know, when once they got together, there was no end of it. "'Well, I was so frightened, I did not know what to do, "'for my uncle was to give me away, and if we were beyond the hour, "'we could not be married all day. "'But, luckily, he came back again in ten minutes' time, "'and then we all set out. However, I recollected afterwards that if he had prevented going, the wedding need not be put off, for Mr. Darcy might have done as well. Mr. Darcy? 
repeated Elizabeth, in utter amazement. "'Oh, yes, he was to come there with Wickham, you know. "'But gracious me, I quite forgot. "'I ought not to have said a word about it. "'I promised them so faithfully. "'What would Wickham say? "'It was to be such a secret.' "'If it was to be secret,' said Jane, "'say not another word on the subject. "'You may depend upon my seeking no further.' "'Oh, certainly,' said Elizabeth, "'though burning with curiosity. "'We will ask you no questions.' "'Thank you,' said Lydia, "'for if you did, I should certainly tell you all, "'and then Wickham would be angry.' "'On such encouragement to ask, "'Elizabeth was forced to put it out of her power "'by running away. "'But to live in ignorance on such a point was impossible, "'or at least it was impossible not to try for information. "'Mr. Darcy had been at her sister's wedding. "'It was exactly a scene, and exactly among people, "'where he had apparently least to do, "'and least temptation to go.' Conjectures as to the meaning of it, rapid and wild, hurried into her brain, but she was satisfied with none. Those at best pleased her, as placing his conduct in the noblest light, seemed most improbable. She could not bear such suspense, and hastily seizing a sheet of paper, wrote a short letter to her aunt, to request an explanation of what Lydia had dropped, if it were compatible with the secrecy which had been intended. "'You may readily comprehend,' she added." but my curiosity must be to know how a person unconnected with any of us, and, comparatively speaking, a stranger to our family, should have been amongst you at such a time. Pray write instantly, and let me understand it, unless it is, for very cogent reasons, to remain in the secrecy which Lydia seems to think necessary, and then I must endeavour to be satisfied with ignorance. Not that I shall, though, she added to herself, as she finished the letter, and, my dear aunt, if you do not tell me in an honourable manner, I shall certainly be reduced to tricks and stratagems to find it out. Jane's delicate sense of honour would not allow her to speak to Elizabeth privately of what Lydia had let fall. Elizabeth was glad of it. Till it appeared whether her inquiries would receive any satisfaction, she had rather be without a confidant. End of chapter 51